please. Please postpone this thing. Why? Give us a chance. No. I've got to warn the other adults. Your day is past. Give us a year. Give us six months. We take over the world within a week. If you don't like it, you can get off. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. Listen, everybody. Listen to me. Theater 5 presents Rebellion Next Week. You're going to find it very hard to believe what I have to tell you. But you've got to listen carefully. It's about little Mary Newhall, a high school student in the town of Tewkesbury. My name is Ethan Miller, and I teach English there. Mary is just a little girl with a C-plus to C-minus average. To give you an idea of what she's like. Gosh, Mr. Miller, you mean in only three weeks we've got to read a whole book and then think about it and then write a book report? Two whole pages. That Golly. is Mary Newhall. You'd never think that every adult in the civilized world is in danger from the activities of that little girl, now would you? Well, listen. That day when she stopped after class to ask me about the book report. Well, how short can the book be, Mr. Miller? I mean, can I report on The Man Without a Country? Oh, well, uh, that's a short story, Mary. You will report on a, a full-length book. Oh. Well, all right then, Mr. Miller, but golly... All the teachers give us so much work. Uh, oh, Mary. Mary, did you leave this notebook here? Mary! Oh, oh well. I wasn't sure the notebook I discovered belonged to Mary, so I looked in it. It was filled with names and addresses. Addresses in our country and Canada and Europe, Asia, and Africa. And that puzzled me, but it was Mary's notebook, all right. There on the front was a sticker saying, I love Paul. And in a teenage scrawl that I recognized, her name, Mary Newhall. I happened to live near the Newhall, so on the way home, I took the notebook to her house. Her father told me that she was in her study over the garage out back, so I went out there, climbed the stairs, and... When I got no answer, I tried the door. And then I realized that Mary hadn't heard me because she was in a room beyond the one that I was in. A room with a padlock on the door, but unlocked right now. And as I went toward it, well, I heard course, her Frank, talking. The logistics of the situation will necessitate further delay. Oh, no, Frank. The consensus amongst our enlistees here in America is that the revolution need be postponed only two or three days maximum. The hypothesis on which we intend to proceed. Oh. Hello, Mary. Frank, hold on a moment. There's an adult here. Stay at the phone. I'll call you back. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt your phone conversation, Mary. Oh, golly, Mr. Miller. You made me jump. You left your notebook at school. Gee, where's my notebook? Oh, gosh, thanks a million, Mr. Miller. There certainly are a lot of addresses in that notebook from all over the world, too. Oh, yes, they're, they're pen pals in the Beatles fan club all over the world. Mary. Yes, Mr. Miller? Mary, I heard you talking on that phone. Oh, gosh, that's embarrassing. It was very strange talk for a young girl. You mean all that stuff about revolution and everything? Oh, that was me and my friend Frank. It's a game we play over the telephone. No, Mary. I don't know what was happening when I came in here, but it wasn't a game. I heard words like logistics and hypothesis and oh, other... Oh, gosh, I don't even know what they mean. Frank and me, I mean, I, we learned all that stuff out of a book. Oh? And who is Frank? Oh, he's just a boy. You don't know him. He's younger than me. And then I... <laughs> Mary. Yes, Mr. Miller? Why has the dial on that phone got only letters on it? Why hasn't it got any numbers? Oh, well, I... Or wires, or any cord. Mr. Miller, you, you caught me. 
There isn't really any, Frank. I I just pretend over the toy telephone, that's all. Toy? Mary, I could hear Frank's voice, someone's voice, answering you on that phone. Yes, sir. Now, I want the truth. About what, Mr. Miller? About you. About Frank and about that telephone. About this revolution you were just talking about. About that notebook, too. It's not just a, a list of pen pals. Now, is it, Mary? You want to know quite a lot. I certainly do. All right. How did that door close? I closed it. But you never moved. You just sat there and it closed behind me and... Let, let me see. What? Oh, it's quite impossible to open it, Mr. Miller, until I release it. Mary Newhall, just what's the meaning of all this? Well, that's what we're going to discuss. Oh, sit down, Mr. Miller. That's better. I assume that sometime while you were being somewhat skimpily educated at the university, Mr. Miller, that you learned something about the evolution of man. Can you be the same child to whom I've been giving C's? Oh, a child to whom you gave C's, Mr. Miller, is a noxious character that I created. A role I played, shall we say, so that I could get through the days and years until the rebellion could be launched. The rebellion. You did learn something about evolution in that rather ridiculous college you went to, didn't you? Yes. Then you know, of course, that our species could not have survived had it not been that we met the needs for survival by developing ever upwards. Now, the Java man, our ancestor, could never have lasted had he stood still. I know all that, Mary. I'm surprised that you do, too, And but... we can't survive. Mankind, the way mankind is right now, can't survive unless we change. But you were talking on the phone about revolution. That's right. Suppose that you, with the brain that you possess, had been born into a society of cavemen. Do you think they would have listened to you? I'm sure I can't tell you, but that's beside the point, Mary. I want to know I'll what... get to everything you want to know. Look at that window. What? what? How did you make that happen? You want to hear some music? We have no phonograph here, have we? And yet, listen. Good heavens. Now, if you had been born into the age of the caveman, Mr. Miller, you would have been as far in advance of him as I am in advance of you. Do you want to turn the world over to me? Do you want me to govern you? I believe in self-government. Oh, well, that's the answer you would have gotten from the caveman. You would have had to revolt. So my friends and I are going to have to revolt. Your friends? Who? What are your friends? Mutants, Mr. Miller. Occasionally in heredity, there's a sudden variation in the norm... I'm a mutant, and there are several million mutants like me, all of us children, chronologically, but infinitely wiser than you grown-ups. Oh, if we leave the world to you, the world will perish, so we're taking over. Mary, open that door. I want to get out of here. No, Mr. Miller. I'm afraid you're the first victim of our revolution. What are you going to do with me? Well, you'll find out in a minute. All right, never mind me. What are you going to do to the world? You say you're going to take it over, but what are you going to do with it? You may rest assured that we shall not do with it what you grown-ups have done. We shall not dress young men in soldier suits and give them weapons with which to kill each other. We shall not dig shelters in which people may crouch and cower while bombs drop on their cities. We shall not allow some to starve while others grow fat. All the systems that you adults have invented are childish to us. Oh, here's Helen. Why was the door shut, Mary? You knew I was coming. Why did you... Oh, Mr. Miller. Get out of the doorway, Helen. I'm getting out of here. Sorry, Mr. Miller. You're not leaving. Oh, gee whiz, Mr. Miller. I I'm sure glad to see you because I was going to ask Mary about the homework. Do we have to Never do all mind, the... Helen. Well, what do you mean? 
Apparently, Helen, she means that you are a mutant, too. And you don't pretend any longer. Because I know your secret. That's quite true, Helen. In that case, we'll have to immobilize him, Mary. I know, but how? This, of course, is a test of our principled position. What principled position, for heaven's sake? Mm, I know. Have you talked to Frank about this? Not yet. I'll call him now. Frank? Mary here. No, the adult is still present. What's that? Oh, yes, immobilization, of course. The question is, which type of immobilization? Hmm. We can't let him out of this room. Oh, that was Helen, Frank. She's right, of course. If he got out of this room, we wouldn't have any power to... Uh Uh-huh. Freezing, huh? Freezing? You think freezing fits in all right with our principled position? Uh Uh-huh. It's a rather nice problem, but I think you're right. All right. Bye. We freeze him? We freeze him. And right away, Helen. I listened intently to everything that was said during Mary's phone conversation with Frank. These children, far more brilliant than I could ever be, and far more powerful, intended to freeze me. But I didn't panic. I had noted that to call Frank, Mary had simply dialed F. And I'd also noted her saying that if I got out of this room, they would have no more power over me. I determined Mary, to get out I'm not as soon sure. as possible. Our principal position commits us to nonviolence. Frank feels that freezing is nonviolent. He may be making a distinction without a difference. But pragmatically, he's right. I wouldn't worry. It may be unpleasant, but it's nonviolent. You see, Mr. Miller, the whole point of our revolution is that we're sickened by the violence you adults have unleashed in the world. So you'll freeze me, whatever that means. But just because there are no ropes or chains, you tell yourselves that you're not being violent. Well, I am your victim. And I say it is violent. You have a certain point. But we're in no position to consider it. Let's get on with the freezing. No, no. Wait, wait. Well? Well, um... Look, this, uh... This has all been a tremendous surprise to me. It's hard for me to take in. You can understand that, I'm sure. But... If you can convince me that you really have learned so much more than grown-ups, it might reconcile me to what you're going to do to me. If I were reconciled, it, it wouldn't really be violent. What do you want us to do? Well, before you came, Mary seemed to pluck music out of the atmosphere. Can you do that, too? Yes, Mr. Miller, I can. It's amazing. And somehow it helps me to understand. Can you do all of the things Mary can do? She just sat there and made that window open without touching it. I can do all of those things. See the window? Thank you! Stop! 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 It was a two-story drop and I was stunned for a moment just lying there. And then I heard those children coming after me. I scrambled to my feet, ran through the backyard, and climbed the fence as I kept going toward the center of town. I was headed toward the police station. I wanted those children, those those monsters, captured and locked up. I was pretty sure they could hurt me only in that room over the garage that I just escaped from. I wanted to maneuver them into a trap. And so I thought of an alley between the police station and the East End garage. They followed me as I ran into it and turned to face them. In here. I'm coming. Well, Mr. Miller, do you give up? I should think not. Come and get me. Take him on the right, Mary. I'll take him on the left. Wait a minute, Helen. What can you be thinking of? Put that stick down. I'm sorry. I've compromised our principles. But the alternative is unthinkable. We can't jeopardize the revolution. We can't let the grown-ups continue their folly. Well, he can't move out of this alley without coming toward us. 
And if he does, I'll show you how to defeat him. Well, I am coming towards you, and we'll see who defeats whom. Don't listen to these children. Now, what is going on here? Gosh, I don't know, Chief. Mr. Miller started chasing us and yelling things we didn't understand. Oh, now, I can't believe that of Mr. Miller. We couldn't either. We didn't even run at first, did we, Mary? No, but when he started to grab us... Chief, will you please listen to me? Oh, he scares me the way he shouts. Now, now, calm down. I'll listen to you, Ethan. Well, Chief, these children are planning to... They're planning to overthrow the government. Now, what kind of talk is that? Look, look, look at that pocketbook there. You see that notebook? Mary, give him your notebook. Well, what about it? Oh, it's my pen pal's notebook. Here, you can have it. Look at the names and addresses in that notebook, Chief. She says they're pen pals, but she doesn't write to them. She telephones. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute, Ethan. Here's one in Tibet. You want me to believe that she telephones him? Oh, look, Chief, believe it or not, these children are engaged in a conspiracy. Oh, gosh, Mr. Miller's flipped his lid. Chief, I've been a school teacher in this town for seven years. Did I ever seem crazy to you before? No. All right, then. Just what am I accused of? Maybe he was molesting us. I read once where a teacher Shut up. ran it. Shut up, you. I... I... I, I, I mean, this, this, this is a terrible misunderstanding. Now, now, Chief, I claim there's something very, very wrong with these two girls. Maybe my claims seem pretty strange to you. But if these two are innocent, they'd be willing to sit and wait for a while in the station house if you asked them to. Now, wouldn't they? Well, I should certainly hope they'd respect my back. All right, all right, then. Please, take them to the station house and let me go for half an hour. For what for? To gather evidence. To clear my name. All right, Ethan, all right. You kids willing to come to the station house with me? Oh, sure. Oh, if you go by my house, Mr. Miller, tell Mama I may be late for supper. <laughs> I hurried back to the room over the garage, and I started searching. I knew I had to produce some evidence, but I couldn't find anything. I remembered what the children had said about the way we grown-ups had made a mess of the world. I, I remembered their policy of non-violence. And then I thought of the, of the world we live in. The dread of the bomb. Poverty. Slums and crime. Suspicion and fear among nations. And suddenly, I knew what I wanted to do. I picked up the phone and I dialed F. Mary? What happened? This isn't Mary, Frank. This is the adult she told you about. Yes? I want to say to you, Frank, that I understand what you children are trying to do. Go on. And I agree that it is necessary. That makes you somewhat brighter than most of mankind. But I, I want to ask you one thing, Frank. Please. Please postpone your revolution. Why? Give us a chance. I'll warn the other adults. I'll preach to them on the street corners. No. I'll tell them that we've got to be neighbors and, and brothers to each other. Please give us a year. No. Give us six months, then. No. You adults had your chance. Your day has passed. We take over within a week. And there will be no postponement. But I... Please, now listen, listen to me. Come back, Frank. Hello? Hello? Please answer. Please. It was a toy phone again. And there was no other evidence. No other evidence. I went back to the police station, told my story, and Chief Hobbs simply laughed at me. He called the superintendent of schools, and he told me to get out of town. That was yesterday. Last night, the school board met, and they fired me. 
out of disgrace and out of my job now. But that doesn't matter. Listen to me. Listen to me, everybody. The rebellion is next week. We have less than a week to make this a decent world. Okay, come on, Ethan. Now move along. Listen to me. The rebellion is coming. Come on, Ethan. Presented Rebellion Next Week. Written by Robert Senadella and directed by Warren Somerville. Script editor, Jack Wilson. In the cast, Bryna Rayburn, Evelyn Juster, Ivor Francis, and Bob Hastings. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Elizabeth? Yes, Father. I've only begun on the binary system, but watch. Why, it's moving. It's sitting up. Yes. It's getting down off the table. And now you'll see a sight that no one else has ever seen before. Walking around the laboratory. Yes, you're witnessing the first movements of a new creation, superior to man in that it will never tire, a servant to man, for that will be its place in the future. A machine that looks like a man and will be able to think like one. The Hall of Fantasy will present the automaton in just a moment. The Automaton. I first met Dr. Eric Ziegler at the conference on scientific research. I knew of him, of course. His name was famous throughout the world as one of the foremost experts on automatic control. It was the closing session of the conference when he made his now famous speech. And in conclusion, gentlemen... May I say that mankind can expect his technological advance to continue. He can look forward to the future in the secure knowledge that his life will become easier and longer through the advances we make. That he will be free to direct his energies towards the conquering of new frontiers, bringing him closer to the day when he will stand alone over all the universe. Bravo! 
His speech so aroused me that I couldn't help making my way to the speaker's platform, pushing my way through the crowd which surrounded him in order to congratulate him. Congratulations, Dr. Ziegler. Dr. Ziegler? Dr. Yes, Ziegler? yes. My name is Drake Sheridan. I just wanted to tell you I thought your speech was the best thing I've ever heard. I take that as a compliment coming from you, Dr. Sheridan. I know about your work. Oh, nothing at all compared to yours, sir. And Dr. Sheridan, I'd like to talk to you further. Now, why don't you come to my house this evening? What time? Uh, after dinner, about 8.30. Here's my card. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, you'll be there? Of course. I'll see you then. Yes? I, uh... Came to see Dr. Ziegler. Oh, your name? Drake Sheridan. Oh, yes. He's been expecting you. Won't you come in? Thank you. Just follow me. Was the most interesting effect of all. A new paragraph. Uh, the success of the automaton of which I am speaking is uh, dependent upon the excellence of the brain I can give him. Uh, my work has become so... Dr. Sheridan is here, Father. Oh, oh, excuse me. I do hope you'll forgive me, Dr. Sheridan. Of course, sir. I was dictating my report on a project on which I am now working. Please be seated. And before I forget, this is my daughter, Elizabeth. How do you do? My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, drink, perhaps, Dr. Sheridan? Yes, I, uh, I could stand one. Yes. Any particular preference? No, no. Uh, no. would you do the honors, Elizabeth? Of course, Father. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sheridan, perhaps you're wondering why I asked you to come here. I, uh... Have been, but I consider it a privilege and an honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, but it wasn't necessary. You may be interested to know that I've followed your career quite closely. And from what I've gathered, you're a very intelligent young man. Well, thank you, Dr. Ziegler. I'm not complimenting you to make you feel comfortable, Dr. Sheridan. I mean what I say. Exactly... Why did you ask me here, Dr. Ziegler? Uh, to talk to you. To see what kind of a person you are. And here are your drinks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my dear. That's just right, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sheridan, I'm going to be completely frank with you. I am working on a private project financed with my own money... Completely divorced from my work at the Research Institute. Mm -hmm. My daughter has been helping me with this work, but unfortunately she does not have the knowledge nor the training to be of anything more than elementary assistance. I see. I am interested in finding an assistant who will devote his full time with me to the work I am doing. You mean you intend to leave the Institute? Yes, yes. My work is finished there, and besides, I want to devote more time to this particular project of which I'm speaking. What's the nature of your work? Automatic control, of course. Uh, would you be interested in working with me? Well, it's a great honor, sir. I will make it worth your while. Well, I'd like to know exactly what you're working on before I make any decision. I believe I can trust you. I, I have a building some miles outside of the city which serves as my own personal research laboratory. Uh, we might as well drive out there. That is, if you're interested. Why, well, certainly am. Uh, good, good. Uh, Elizabeth, get the car from the garage, please. We'll drive out tonight. Well, you certainly have it well equipped, Dr. Ziegler. I wanted to show you that you would be working with only the finest of equipment. Who's there? Uh, what's that? Oh, that's the watchman. It's nothing to worry about, Bart. Oh, it's you, Dr. Ziegler. I didn't hear you come in. It's all right. We'll check out with you when we leave. All right, sir. Uh, will you open the door, Elizabeth? Of course. All right, let's go in. I'll put on the lights. Now you'll see what I've been working on for the past year. That sheet-draped figure on the table over there, what is it? My newest research project in automatic control. But what you see, you see. It looks like a human body underneath that sheet. Not quite. Here, I'll pull back the sheet. No, it isn't a human body. That's correct. What do you think of it, Sheridan? What do you think of my automaton? Is it finished? Not yet, but soon, with your help. A mechanical man, 
A robot shaped exactly like a human being. What better form could I give him? After all, our own bodies evolved to what we are today. Why should I attempt to improve on nature? What do you intend doing with, with him when you finish? Tell him, Elizabeth. Well, this automaton will be able to do all of the hard and painstaking work of mankind with, without ever getting tired. It can fight his wars. It, it can be the first to explore outer space. It can free mankind to direct his energies to, to other channels. I don't know. Oh, come, come, Sheridan. You look at the automaton as if you thought he was some Frankenstein monster. Believe me, this is the farthest thing from that imaginary creature. This is a work of science. This is not a monster created from the dark recesses of someone's imagination. This is our key to the future. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of the automaton in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of the automaton. Dr. Eric Ziegler, his daughter, and I stood looking down at the metallic figure lying on the table before us. In all respects, it resembled a man, a metal and plastic man, created by the genius of Ziegler. This is our key to the future. This automaton will free man from labor. Let him develop his mind to the fullest. How much longer do you think you'll have to work before it's finished? I can't tell. That's why I need you to help me set up the automatic self-regulation of its brain. Then you haven't developed the system of feedback yet? No. As you are aware, that is the basic machine of all self-regulating systems of automatic control. A man's mind is a complex creation. The mind of the automaton must also be complex in order that it can do the work of a man, in order that it can think and regulate itself. Why don't you show him what you've accomplished so far in the feedback system? All right. Now, over here is what I call its brain. Uh, put the power on, Elizabeth. Yes, Father. I've only begun on the binary system, but watch. It's moving. It's sitting up. Yes. It's getting down off the table. And now you'll see a sight that no one else has ever seen before. It's walking around the laboratory. Yes. You're witnessing the first movements of a new creation, superior to man, and that it will never tire. Servant of man. For that will be its place in the future. A machine that looks like a man will be able to think like one. I shall return him to the table now. It's climbed back up on the table. And it's lying down again. All right. Turn off the power, Elizabeth. Well, Sheridan, what do you think now? I'm afraid I don't know what to think. Will you work with me? I... Oh, yes. Who wouldn't jump at the chance? Of course I will. Good, good. You understand, of course, that the feedback system and the binary scale are still in their elementary stages. When the brain, the, the automatic control, is finished, it will fit inside the automaton's body and head. That's correct. There will be controls on the robot's chest to set the automatic control to working, and another to stop the machine if it needs to be repaired. Of course, our largest task will be to develop a complete automatic self-regulatory system to fit inside the robot's body. As soon as you can be free... Which should be in about two weeks. Good. Then we shall begin work on the final stages that will lead to the completion of the automaton. Rather than completely sever my relations with the organization for which I worked, I took an extended leave of absence. There were living quarters in the laboratory in the country. Ziegler shut down his house in the city, and he and his daughter and I moved our belongings to the laboratory in order to devote every possible minute to our work. Not only was Ziegler intent on having the automaton think for itself, but he was also insistent that the robot be able to talk. To those ends, we went to work. If we were right in our calculations, the amplifier and receiver we have built into the mechanism will convert our words into electrical impulses, which in turn will activate a response from the automaton. 
Those responses themselves will be electrical impulses, which will be converted into words. Well, why don't we try it and see, Eric? We might as well, I suppose. After all, the automatic control is almost finished. We only have the more complex reactions to set in the binary scale. All right. Turn the control on his chest. Right. It's on. We'll see what happens. I order you to sit up. Sitting up? Yes. Uh, Jump down to the floor. I want you to answer me with your voice. Uh, What have you been created for? To kill. That's not the right reaction. What was that? Correction. To work. That's right. We must have made a mistake somewhere along the line in the reactions we set up. That to kill value is present for only one situation. For personal protection. I thought you came up and... What are you doing? Well, we're just conducting a test. Woman. That's correct. Woman. Stay back. Stay away from me. Elizabeth, be quiet. He wasn't going to hurt you. I, I, I'm sorry. When he started toward me, it frightened me. You see? He stopped now. There's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Get back. Back to the table. Lie down again. Turn off the control, Drake. Right. What's the matter, Elizabeth? You're shaking. It's just that that thing frightened me so. It those lenses that it has for eyes. There's there's something hypnotic about them. He looks so much like a man. I know he's made of plastic and metal, but... But, well, I fear him. Elizabeth, there's no sense getting emotional about this. There's nothing to be afraid of. I know you're right, Father, but... But what? But what would happen if you ever lost control of the automaton? That will never happen. But... Is it possible? Hmm? Perhaps. We didn't do any more work on the automaton that day. We went into the city in the early evening to see a play, leaving the watchman at the laboratory to take care of things. We got back about 12 and were having a late snack. More coffee, Drake? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Please. I think it did us good to get away from here this evening. We've all been working too hard. Uh, do you feel better now, Elizabeth? Oh, yes, Father, much better. Yeah. Tomorrow we can finish up with the automaton. Then we can show him, after suitable tests, of course, to the world. Uh, if we're successful, you ought to win a prize. What was that? Someone screamed. It came from upstairs. We'd better take a look. <laughs> Who could it have been? The only other person up there is Bert the Watchman. <laughs> there it is again. Hurry. Look. Huh? The door to the laboratory is... It's open. He must be in there. The lights are on. We'll see what's wrong in a second. All right. Oh, oh. no. It's Bert. What's the matter with him? His neck's been broken. Oh. He's dead. But how? I don't know, only... What's the matter? Look, we turned off the control on the robot... When we left, didn't we? Of course we did. Why? Because... Because now it's on, Eric. The control is on. You are listening to the tale of The Automaton on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story. An original tale of fantasy entitled The Automaton. On the floor of the laboratory sprawled the broken body of Bert, the night watchman. A scant few feet away, I stood looking down at the inert form of the automaton. Before we had left the laboratory, we had turned off the control, and now we found it on. But that isn't possible. Take a look for yourself. 
The control is on. But we turned it off before we left. Are you sure? Of course, I turned it off myself. How did it get on? Perhaps Bert turned it on. Why should he do that? Perhaps he was curious. But the most important thing to find out is what killed him. The robot. Don't be a fool, Elizabeth. The robot won't kill unless attacked. That's right, Elizabeth. It's the only reason for it to kill. Actually, the reaction was set in the control system for self-preservation. For no other reason than that. It's the only time the automaton is dangerous. Maybe you made a mistake when you set the automatic controls. It's possible that we might have made an error in the feedback system, Eric. And that the automatic selector chose the wrong value. When Bert turned the switch on, the robot thought he was in danger... We didn't make an error in the feedback system, Drake. We checked each value through five times before we placed it in the server mechanism. You know that as well as I do. Then... Then how did Bert die? I don't know. Master of Man. It's still on. Turn it off. Did... Did you hear... What it said, Eric? Master of men. We didn't set that reaction in the servo mechanism. Something's wrong. Do you mean the automaton can... can think for itself? What about it, Eric? We'll dismantle it tomorrow morning and check it over thoroughly, just to be sure. What about Bert? We'll merely explain to the authorities that he died in an accident here at the laboratory. We can do that in the morning, too. Now we all need a good night's sleep. Don't you think we ought to move him out of here? Well, they may want to look at his body, Elizabeth. Besides, nothing more can happen to him. Elizabeth? Who is it? Drake. What are you doing up here on the second floor outside the laboratory? I... I couldn't sleep. Oh. Well... Neither could I. Drake, do you think that that the robot can operate by itself? Why do you ask that? I was thinking, what if, what if Bert was merely making his rounds? What if he walked into the laboratory and the robot was there, waiting for him? Well, that's, that's not possible, of course. I wouldn't say that. Isn't isn't it possible that you and Dad might have made a mistake in setting up the feedback system? Isn't it possible that that there could be an error in the automatic control system that would allow it to operate without being switched on? Operate enough to at least turn the operating switch on? Well, it's uh, <clears throat> it's possible that there's something comparable to a short in the control system which would mean that the robot could operate without the control being on. Yes. I want to go in there and take a look at it. Why don't you wait until morning? No, I I want to see it tonight. All right. Let's go. Are you sure you want to go inside? Yes. Switch on the lights. <sighs> Everything seems to be all right. Let's take a look at the automaton. Every time I see it, it it frightens me. There's nothing to be afraid of, Elizabeth. I'm not so sure. The control button is still off. Wasn't he lying the opposite way? With his head at the other end of the table when we left? No, I don't think. Where's that hum coming from? I don't know. It sounds like the robot's power system. Yet the control button is off. Are you sure? Let me get a little closer to it. Well? The hum is coming from the automaton. That means I was right. I guess you... Drake! Huh? Look out! Master of men! system is on. It, it's sitting
not. Don't kill. Don't kill. We made a mistake. We must have made a mistake. It's getting down. Let's get out of here. Is it, is it following us? No, it's just standing there. But it will be after us in a few seconds. Hurry, hurry. Let's get this door closed and locked. Oh, I can see it through the glass panel. It's starting towards the door. I heard some noise up here. What's the matter? The automaton's in operation without the control being on. What? That's right. We must have made a mistake, Eric. The, 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 the only thought that thing knows is to kill. We have to destroy it. It's getting closer to the door. That door won't hold. Let's get out of here. It has to be destroyed. But how? It weighs over half a ton. I think I have it. Stop here by this window. Oh, another crash against that door and it'll be out of the lab. What are you going to do? Its reactions are slower than ours. We'll wait here for it. It'll come walking towards us. At the last minute, we'll run to the side. I don't think it'll be able to stop itself in time. It should crash through the window and to the ground below. The two-story drop should destroy it. The door is down. I hope your plan works. And if it doesn't? Then we'll have to think of something else. Here it comes. It's looking up and down the hallway for us. Over here! Over here! It sees you. Here it comes. Don't kill. Don't kill. It's getting closer. When do we move away? Not yet. Master of men. How soon? In a moment. To kill. Now. Oh. Are, are you sure it's destroyed? Yes. The fall completely destroyed the automatic control. You're looking at nothing but a pile of metal. What do you intend doing? Starting all over again. Somewhere along the line, we made a mistake. We have to find that mistake and correct it. We don't want a master of men, but a servant of men. Someday, I don't know when, but someday, we'll be successful. And then one of mankind's most useful servants will be the automaton. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Won't you sit down and join the league of the most privileged globetrotters in the universe? Our scientists have given us machines to conquer the air, to plumb the ocean depths, to scale mountains, to span the world within a day. But all their brilliant machines for travel are outstripped by the simple armchair. Seated there, listening to the radio, not only the whole universe is at your fingertips, but a free voyage through all the long corridors of time, winding to the past and stretching unending 
into the future. Come, join me in an armchair trip. This one into a time that is yet to come. So you condemned me to death, truck. I swear to you one thing. If I can save my neck, the first thing I'll do is have yours. Our mystery drama, Between These Worlds, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Is our other encounters and other worlds. How many of them are inhabited? We may never know in our lifetime, but we can speculate. Or listen to the spinners of tales speculate what they might be like. Come with me into the labyrinth of space to the planet Chromek and to the man who brings us this tale. A man named... Controller? Yes. Advance. Yes, Lord. Am I to be sentenced now? How long have you been in the black pit? Your lordship should have a better idea than I. A blind man cannot read time. And rats don't wear chronometers. You are insolent. <laughs> no. Just truthful. Are you determined to destroy yourself, Garth? I thought the die was long since cast. Obviously it hasn't. Since you're still alive. I thought that was only a technicality. Must you be incorrigible? As long as I am to die? Why not? But suppose you are not to. Not to die? Yes. Then I'd say I'm not such an old dog that perhaps I can't learn some new tricks. <laughs> From a past master, of course. No, you make it almost impossible to help you. You want to help me? Why do you think I brought you here? I'm still trying to figure that out. If you really want to do something nice for me, you might arrange for me to sit down. I'll do better than that. Guards, remove his chains. When you have loosened him, leave us. Such treatment can mean only one of two things. I am to be set free or eliminated. Mm, that is the choice. My freedom naturally will be conditional. Naturally. What are the conditions? That you return to the endeavor for which you have been trained and selected. The parameters of which you should never have overstepped. I didn't. Oh, come now. The indictment brought against you is incontrovertible. Experimenting with the building of an aircraft, powered in a new fashion, perhaps, but that my efforts in that direction constituted any threat to established power, no. Or that any treason was involved. You committed the unforgivable. What? No machine, engine, motor, or other device capable of producing energy shall be designed except to take advantage of our national nuclear stockpiles. But they are inefficient compared to my design. We have an overabundance of nuclear energy sources. Nothing is more overabundant than the sun and natural magnetic fields. My machine would cost little to run. Exactly. Which is why the High One and the Council would frown on their use. You mean there would be no chance for them to line their pockets? Why must you consider me your enemy? Because you are, and always have been since Milada chose me for her mate. The only way you could stop us from being joined was to get me out of the way. If that was my purpose, I appear to have failed. You're still here, and alive. In his wisdom, the High One has seen fit to commute your sentence and offer you life again. Why? Before your disgrace... You were captain of the Astral Fleet. You were charged with the task you had sworn a blood oath to maintain. The safety of our planet, 
Kronek, and I would have defended it to the death. My only wish was for better means to protect it. You are looking the wrong way, Garth. The danger to this planet is not from without, but from within. From starvation. Starvation? But our population is controlled. The soil of Kronek is tired, Garth. The planet is slowing down. Our weather is affected. We are facing catastrophic food shortages. I don't see where I fit into all this. Haven't you wondered at all the sweeps we have had you make in the past years through the galaxies? As to seek for any civilization patterned like ours that might be a possible enemy. Well, hmm. How many have we found? To my knowledge, only one. The planet Earth. This planet so like our own and so conveniently much larger. Conveniently? Yes. They could be the enemy, couldn't they? Earth? Two galaxies away, lapped out of our orbits by a time fold? They'll never trouble us. Are you so sure? I have circled them three times now. They have some rudimentary spacecraft, mostly unmanned. Don't forget, they're in a different time spectrum from us. Scarcely at the dawn of their civilization. Yes, but they are like us. Oh, yes. Of all that I have seen in my galactic travels, the closest... But again, I tell you, they pose no danger to us. How can you be so sure? You are to land there. Your mission is to mingle with the Earthlings, observe their planet and its resources, and report back to us. That's what my life is to be saved for. It's a waste of time. Again, I tell you, there's no chance they might try to invade us. We don't expect them to. What we are considering is invading them in order to destroy them and take over their planet. I am Victor Garth of the 770th Ring of the Tree of Garth, the last of my line. My father should have been the High One of Kronik as his grandfather and all the other ancestors. But his brother, my uncle Zyron, took the empire and we Goths became little better than elite slaves. Only my union with Melada might have saved me, but the forces against me had seen that that would never be consummated. Now I am back in my jail again. And I wonder if my interview with Truck, the controller, ever happened. Or am I still condemned to death? Give us five minutes, guard. Then come to let me out. Melada? Yes, guard. What brings you here? You. You've been a long time coming. I could not arrange it before. Then why now? When it is too late for us. I want to make sure you don't do anything foolish. Such as? Are you going to Earth? I suppose so. Why not? It's better than automatic elimination. It's better than everything we might have hoped for. If you are successful, you'll be back where you belong, with all that has been taken away from you. Not quite all. I still have lost you. No. Not if you succeed. I will be waiting. Waiting? And you belong to Truck? Only for so long as he can hold me. You've come here to tell me that I can win you back. I've come here to tell you that you must, must take this trip and this chance so you may possess me. You realize my return is a chance in a million. If you return to me, both of us will be free to accept each other again. I promise you. Then I'll go. And I promise you, I will come back. So many things circling through my mind. Irrational hopes that were no part of my training, but which were the flaws in me that had brought me such desperate times. It wasn't long before my ship had been fitted out and truck delivered it to me with my orders. 
You are satisfied with your craft. Well, it's going to take me days to check it out completely. There isn't time for that. You realize what the chances are of my accomplishing this mission I'm being sent on? If anyone can, I'm sure it will be you. I would be flattered if I could be sure this isn't a convenient way of solving all your problems and getting rid of me with honor. It's a chance you take. But the prize is worth all the danger. What prize? I should rather have said prizes. If you succeed, no one can keep you from the throne. You will be the next high one. And your throne will be shared by your queen, Melada. Melada. Because of her, I will believe. I'm ready to risk everything. Then let us tempt fate no longer, since the die is cast. The die is cast. I only wish I had made the roll. of Kronach's gravity belt. I have no choice of direction. It is too late to abort. I have a gnawing feeling that even once I reach orbit, I will still have no control. Now I am in free fall. I activate my power sources. To my relief, everything surges into life, lifting me out of orbit, flinging me across the universe towards the black hole. And the time fold I must find before I am sucked into its maw. I am all conscious of the whirling vortex of the black hole. The entrance to nothingness and the end of all being that is sucking me towards it. I must take steps to cut my motors. I cannot. I cannot turn them off. I have been betrayed. Frantically, I manipulate the transmission screen. I can raise no picture. At last, I depend on audio only. Goth Victor to control. Do you read me? Goth Victor to control. Do you read me? I read you, Goth Victor. Talk. What are you doing in control? I've been sitting here expecting your call. You sent me on this journey knowing I'd never come back. The most convenient way to dispose of me without embarrassment. Absolutely. You must realize what a danger you were to us all. You were something of a national hero to an uneasy populace. So the only way to dispose of you successfully was to allow you a hero death. I swear to you one thing. If I can save my neck, the first thing I will do is have yours. Rock, Captain Victor. But I'm afraid you have none left. I have been tricked. Flung out of orbit with my steering mechanism inoperable. I am headed for the terror of the void. The nothingness. The end of being. And I am helpless to save myself from being lost in the night of forever. We sit in our armchairs, shaken by the strange and not fully understood forces that have Garth Victor in their power. Can we even begin to imagine how horrendous the conception of a hole in the universe could be? A bottomless pit that could swallow us all. Drag us down to a hell only dimly imagined by even as great a poet as Dante. I shall return shortly with Act Two. All hope abandon, ye who enter here. Seven of the most terrible words ever written. The legend that Dante read inscribed above the gate to hell. Yet how much more terrible is the gate that Garth is about to be sucked into? 
For this is the drain of all the universes, the sinkhole to oblivion, the black hole. Locked in a spacecraft hurtling at full speed, directing him to disaster, all hope should already have been abandoned except... There must be something I can do. But what? The suction of the vortex gives me no chance of escape. If I could somehow cut my power, not altogether, but on the starboard side, then my propulsion might veer me far enough to the right for me to reach the time fold and escape to the Earth galaxy. But how? Use my disintegrator gun to blow up one half of my motors and see what happens. It's working. But the spacecraft is revolving like a top. Out of control. I'm coming up on the coordinates for the time fold, but I don't know if at this aspect I can find the window. This may be the end of it all. Denying your own daughter? You know I'd as soon deny my own name. All right, Commodore. Will you turn off that stupid radio? I'm just waiting to check the weather report. The devil with it. Wait a minute, Commodore. For what? Stack your pole and come on up here to the bridge. There's something you ought to get a gander at. I'm on my way. One favor deserves another. There goes your radio. Ah, thanks a lot. Now, what else do you have to screw up your old man's day of fishing? Here, take the glasses. Yeah. Here. Uh, See, uh, about six points off the starboard bow. You make it? Yeah. What is it? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. By me, it's a UFO. It's like nothing I ever saw. Wait a minute. It's in trouble. Yes, I, I can see. It's out of control. It's going to crash. Where? Hard to tell the way it's flip-floppy, but near enough so we can attempt to rescue... Oh, no. What is it? He's headed straight for the drink. He can't pull out. I wonder if anyone's aboard. I broke through the time fold and away from the black hole. I recall entering Earth's galaxy within the pull of that planet's gravity and my spacecraft still out of control. Vaguely, I remember the turning twisting, toppling descent, and my last desperate effort to wrench the heat shield into line by blowing out my remaining power. After that, everything was blackness. Easy. Take it uh, easy. You're all right. Uh, better let me pin him down, Pat. Uh, no telling what he may be like when he comes out of it. Oh, I don't think we'll have any trouble with him. Uh, uh how do you know? This is someone from another world. If he is, he's not much different from us. Oh, oh, oh hold it, hold it. He's coming too. Uh, where, where am I? About 60 miles southwest of the Florida Keys, aboard the Mavornine. Uh, Mavornine. My fishing cruiser, 48 footer. Oh, a sea craft. We call it a boat. We. Uh, my father and I, yeah, Americans. Citizens of the world. But the Florida Keys? Yeah, a, a part of America, the United States. A part of the world. The planet we call Earth. Ah, so I am on Earth. But... But what? Forgive me, I must... I must find myself again in meditation... I cannot say, say, anymore. I need time to find myself. I must put my mind into a controlled track, allowing my thoughts to regroup, listening for any messages from beyond. But as I lay in trance, another part of me hears the sound of the Earth people's voices. You really believe he's from another world? Where else? 
You saw that craft he was flying? He, he speaks English. He, he doesn't seem alien in any if, sense. If there's anything at all we should have learned from the past 200 years, it's that nobody is an alien. Oh, you're right. It's just... Just what, Pat? What? I wouldn't want to think of this one taking off and disappearing. Uh, what are you saying? I don't know exactly. It's it's strange. Never happened to me before. I just have a hunch. I found what I've been looking for. I could hear them talking, but the words didn't make much sense. I was still disoriented from that scrambling, twisting, spinning fall out of the sky. I must have drifted away. Because when I returned to consciousness, I was lying in a bed with clean, crisp sheets. And the woman was sitting by me. How do you feel? All right. Who? Uh, I'm, I'm Pat McGlade. My father and I fished you out of the drink after you crashed. My craft? Mm, a wipeout. Must have sunk like a stone. You hungry? Yeah, I, I brought you some food. No. A little thirsty. Here. Try this. Mmm. It's good. What is it? Orange juice. <laughs> you, you don't know it? Orange juice. <laughs> we don't have it where I come from. Well, where do you come from? I, um... Excuse me. I find it hard to... Uh, to think. I, I, I must rest. <laughs> I had to be careful. I was an enemy in a strange land. My impulse was to talk to this woman goddess more beautiful than any female I'd ever known, with her long, curling, burnished hair and the gray-green eyes such as I have never seen among my people. But I still had no way to explain my strange arrival out of the blue. It was the man who made it possible for me to continue my assignment without revealing the whole truth. Ready to talk about yourself now? Uh, no. All right. I'll talk about me. Patrick McGlade. McGlade Enterprises. Oil rigs, offshore drilling, ships, heavy goods, but most of all, aeronautics. Every phase, ground to air and every kind of air-powered vehicle. But I never did see one like the one you dumped in three-mile deep waters, so we can't recover it. What was it? Just a simple scouting craft. Interplanetary? All right, let's put it on the table. Uh, what's your name? Garth. That all of it? Yes. Oh, you mean my, uh, my designate, Victor. What does designate mean? Oh, what I do. Explorer. Uh, what I'm programmed for. Is it not that way here? No. We're free men. We program ourselves. You are permitted? It took us a couple of centuries of trying to destroy this globe to wake up. Then, instead of fighting ourselves, we got together with the world government and learned to live in peace. I ought to turn you over to the authorities, you know. You are technically an invader of our planet. Please, don't do that. Why not? Just give me one good reason. At least, tell me how you got here and from where. I am from another universe. A planet beyond your galaxy called Kronik. I, uh, I came here by accident. Coming through a time fold, I lost control of my craft. Only because it had been sabotaged. You a flying machine capable of intergalactic flight? I was. I have been flying them all my life. Oh, that's too bad it was lost. Hmm, I can let go of that. Now I can't get back to my own planet. Oh, well, there might be a way. How? Suppose I were to give you the facilities. Could you give me blueprints of that machine? Well, I'm not an engineer or a draftsman, but I can do just as well. Give me the materials and I'll build you an even better machine. Would it use nuclear energy? What's the power source? It would run on the power from your sun. Or from any hot star. In combination with magnetic fields. Son, you have yourself a deal. 
You build me a prototype and I'll keep your arrival here a secret. I've checked it out. There's no record of your crash. How soon do we start? <laughs> like I do everything. Yesterday. We're already on our way. He was as good as his word. We flew in one of Earth's primitive jet planes to a place called Texas. And I went to work constructing the prototype of the spacecraft that Patrick McGlade hoped to convince his world government would eventually provide his weak planet with an umbrella to protect them. He didn't suspect that in using me, I was using him. Earth would never get the craft. I was building it to take me home. Home? Yes. Even after what Trock had done to me. And Milada. I was conditioned to belong to Kronik. And I knew I could go back a hero to lead my planet to the conquest of Earth. And the destruction of its soft people. So that my countrymen, the super race, could continue to rule the universe. Here we have a curious triangle. Patrick McGlade, a millionaire world mover, obsessed with the greatest deal of his life, a deal to leave the world safe for his daughter. Patricia McGlade, the daughter, the poor little rich girl who at last has found the mate of her choice, and Victor Garth, the man who could be human except for his carefully trained, conditioned reflexes. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Twelve months have passed, bringing us into the year 2,280. In this time, the three members of our special triangle have achieved an easy surface familiarity with each other, but the only deep ties that are reciprocal are between father and daughter. Till the birth of a new factor in their relationship, another lady, the spacecraft SPENFA-1, solar-powered electromagnetic field aircraft, the first of her kind. It has all seemed endless building it, but the last rivets are being driven home, and at last my escape from prison is about ready, except that it will not be easy. This year has forged other shackles which are as hard to escape from as the ones fashioned of steel. So what do you think of her, Pat? Oh, she's a winner, Commodore. What'd you say? A winner? That too, I'm sure, but I said a winner. One of a kind. Like the man who built her. She's only one of a fleet your father plans to convince the world government to build. My father? Don't you, uh, plan to be here to help him? Now, come on, Pat. That's up to Garth. He might want to go home. How? Number one off the assembly line is his to do what he wants with. You got a girl waiting for you in chronic, Garth? Mm -hmm. You know space pilots. A girl in every planet. Really? Does that qualify me for right here on Earth? Mm -hmm. I wish I could feel I could even begin to measure up. Why, Garth, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Any um, chance we could get out of this kettle factory and pursue that thought over a drink? Well, your father, I have some things to... No, Garth. Everything's done here, but that special radio equipment you wanted to install. Why don't you take the rest of the day off? No, I, I don't think so. But I might pick up those components. They're there at the airport. We've got a car outside? Oh, I'll drop you off on the way home if you like. Mm. If I like. How could I refuse? I hadn't seen very much of Patricia in the year I'd spent on Earth. I'd been too preoccupied with getting the aircraft built. And she was a free-swinging girl who followed the sun and her own social set. I was just as glad. She disturbed me. He interfered with the simple beauty of my master plan. I couldn't define my thoughts as I examined her. Hair streaming in the wind as we drove in the clumsy, rudimentary machine Earth people called an automobile. You realize this is the first time I've seen you in three months? Is it? Obviously. Oh, why would I mention it? Mm, I was wondering that myself. Do you know, you're a... Well, the politest word I can think of is a heel. Why? But what, what do the girls in Cronach do? Let you trample them? Just come whenever you whistle? 
I don't understand. Well, maybe I'll just test that out. Now, let's get right down to cases. I may not have been around much, but I've kept tabs on you. You're either a workaholic or an automaton. Hey, don't, don't you like girls? Like? Yes. Or maybe even love. That's what man and woman is about, isn't it? Not on chronic. Come on. Don't you reproduce? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Well, the workforce must be replenished. Why should I... <sighs> what are you doing? I'm conducting an experiment. This is known as a... <clears throat> kiss. Hmm. How did that grab you? I don't know what you're saying. Uh, but I'd like to try that again. Come here, Pat. I thought you'd never ask me. In retrospect, what happened between Pat and me was something I now realized I'd been trying to avoid ever since I met her. But pleasurable as my contact with her was, it only served to strengthen my determination to do what I had to do. Victor Garth. What? Impossible. Victor Garth is dead. If you could have had your way, I would be, Truck. But I assure you, I'm not. I'm very much alive. Where? Where are you? On the planet Earth. How did you get there? That's a long story which we'll keep. What's important at the moment is that I'm planning to return to Kronik. With all the information we need for the invasion of Earth. Can we invade Earth? Not only can, but must. Before they wake up and arm themselves. Then you must lead us there. You're the only one who knows the way. I shall start off for Chronic tonight. When I pass through the time fold twelve hours later, I will be a thousand years older and back in your time frame. And still I will reach you within twenty-four hours. I want Milada to be waiting for me. I'll do better than that. Cross the time frame and I shall be waiting for you with our fleet. We will return immediately and make Earth ours. Then you can return as a conquering hero. Very well. I will leave this minute before they can discover me. I'm on my way. Leave for where, Garth? Pat. Were you really planning to run out on us? You should be careful of that gun. It's lethal. I should have been careful of you. You are, too. Give it to me. You wouldn't use it on me. I think I might. Then turn it on myself. Why? Because I can't reach you to tell you how much I love you. We call it a communications gap. <laughs> Isn't that a laugh? That there is no communication between lovers. I don't know what you mean. That's the whole problem, Garth. You walk like a man. You look like a man. You talk like a man. But you are not human. You have no feelings. You might as well be a robot. I am what I was shaped. I might want to change. But I can't. That's the tragedy of it all. And why I have to kill you. Before you kill us all. Forgive me, Garth. It all might have been so beautiful. Look out. What? Oh, you... You tricked me, you... Pat! It's all right. My own fault. If I couldn't have you, I'm just as well off... Bed. No. No. I never wanted it like this. Now I have to get up. Garth! What in the Sam Hill's going on there? Stay out of here, Commodore. You can't stop me. Where do you think you're going? Back where I belong. No, not on this ship, boy. Over my dead body. If that's the way you want it, that's the way it'll be. What have you done with Pat? Where is she? Oh! No. I didn't mean it. It just... 
you want to go the same way, this is your last chance to get off. Only one of us will ever leave this ship alive. And it won't be you. You've had your choice. Sit down and don't move till I get her in orbit. Under the crushing pressure of the takeoff, both McLean and I were frozen in our seats. On the floor, huddled in a corner, Pat's limp body lay like a tossed aside rag. Looking at it, some wave surged up in me, and then before I could understand what it was, the instruments demanded my attention. I forgot everything until we were beyond the gravity belt, and I could cut in the engines. Why did you kill her? I didn't mean to. The time won't excuse. She loved you beyond anything, even me. What a waste. Don't come near me. I wouldn't want to. I can find my own death. With honor. Just give me leave to take my daughter with me. How? In my arms. Through the compression lock. And out forever into space. It solved a problem for me without demanding further action. I let him lift her tenderly and carry her through the inside door. I closed it behind him in relief and then activated the outside door. His body fell away into space, drifting, still dragged by the last vestiges of Earth's gravity. But by some accident, it was not the same with Pat. Some freak of fate allowed her clothing to become entangled in a forward vein... And suddenly, she was floating beside the cockpit window, her wide gray-green eyes staring at me accusingly. Phantom witness to my treachery. With a wrench, I tore my eyes from her and concentrated on bursting through the window of the time fold, back to my own world. This is Truck, the controller of Tugar Victor. We have you in view. Repeat, you have broken out of the time fold to starboard of the black hole. This is Truck. We have you in view. I hear Truck's voice. I see the battle fleet in formation waiting for me to lead it to Earth's destruction. But they are as far away as a dream. What is close to me is the wide gray eyes that hold my gaze beyond the cockpit window. And a voice that is reaching for me from beyond the spheres. You walk like a man. You're not human, I am what I was shaped. I might want to change, but I can't. Why? It might have been so beautiful. If you could only have accepted love. Why? I don't know what it is. Then you will never know peace. There are two kinds of people in the universe, God. The killers and the victims. held her to the ship let go and I see her snatched away, twisting and turning and swallowed up in the whirlwinds that reach hungrily from the black hole. And at the same moment, I hear Trock again. This is Trock to God, Victor. Are you ready to lead us through the time forward so we may destroy Earth? And suddenly it is blindingly clear. I know what I have to do. I am no longer a cipher. Pat has given me the strength to become a man. This is God to control a truck and the chronic fleet. I am ready to lead you, but we do not take the time fold. Why not? The most direct route is through the black hole. The black hole? You must be mad. No, truck. Believe me, I was never more sane in my life. It's the high road to the last best destiny for all of us. Follow me. I bang and head for the threatening vortex. Only now it seems to me like a welcoming gate. In 
in no time, the winds themselves are stronger than my engines, and my ship is caught up in a mad, helical swirl that spirals me down, down forever into the blankness of nothing. Behind me, the fleet comes, caught one by one, and doomed to final destruction as I am. Except that far below, through the buffeting winds, I can see my beloved's face. Pat, the woman and the partner I know at last, can make me whole. And I know that with the planet Earth's peace, I have bought my own. And whatever fate waits for me, I am coming home. At last. A strange and disturbing story. And a far journey for all of us, beyond familiar stars and back again to the depths of the void. Isn't it nice our thrills were only vicarious? And at the end, we can wake up in our own armchairs to a warm, familiar world. I'll be back shortly. Sometimes I take the notion to oil my door, but then I wonder, if it were not for that strange, eldritch screech as it opens, would all of you come knocking on it? Without the promise of the bizarre, the sometimes terrifying that its challenging voice offers you. Besides, I have oiled it, but it murmurs just the same. Or cries, if that's how it sounds to you. So, who am I to tamper with the unaccountable? Our cast included Tony Roberts, Carol Titel, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. A preview of our next tale. He died a few years back, but he claimed to have established direct communication with the spiritual world. How did he do that? Through the opening of his spiritual senses. And you? Well, can you? Has that happened to you? (laughs) Of course not. It didn't happen to Swedenborg until he was 57 years of age. But it might happen, or or something very like it might happen to me, if only... What, Gottfried? If only what? If only I could escape. Escape whom? Escape what? An evil influence, Carl. It hangs over me night and day. Oh, how can you say such things? Because I know them to be true. There's an evil genius, a vile spirit whose sole intent is to ensnare me and to ensure my damnation. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. day routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing outside a room, horror gripping you. Well, before your eyes, seen through the transom window, the most beautiful girl in the world is about to die. Because of you. Today we escape from reality with a fascinating story of a girl who lived a weird second life. As John Jessel told it in his gripping story, The Adaptive Ultimate. No, Daniel, I can't do it. 
You have a very interesting theory, It's but... more than a theory, Dr. Bach. I've proved it. It works. I tried my serum on tubercular guinea pigs and it cured them. They adapted themselves to the tubercular bacillus and live. <laughs> I tried my serum on a dog with rabies. He adapted himself, too. I tried it on a cat with a broken spine. The cat instantly adapted itself to its injury so that the spine had time to knit and heal. Don't you see what a tremendous discovery this is? Yes, perhaps. Well, think what that would mean in accident cases. There'd be no further need for emergency surgery. Don't you see that? No matter what the condition, the injury to the body, a mere injection of my serum would permit the patient instantly to adapt himself to his condition and live. No matter what his injury. Exactly. A serum made from insects. From a common fruit fly, the most adaptable of living organisms. Tear off a wing and it grows a new one. Tear off its head even. Stick on a new head and that too will adhere in time. Think of imparting that same adaptability to human beings. <laughs> to grow new heads, it has merit. Oh, now please, Dr. Bob. <laughs> all right, all right. No, seriously. I know this may be a great thing, but to permit you to experiment on a human being, no, The most I hopeless cannot. case you can find, Dr. Bach. Someone already doomed. Well, if someday I discover in the hospital a hopeless case, understand it will be hopeless. I understand. And if the patient shall consent, then you will have your human guinea pig. Well, Dr. Scott, you requisitioned for yourself a hopeless case. Permit me. Here is your guinea pig. What is it, Dr. Bach? TB? Yeah, final stage. A matter of hours at most. Mm -hmm. She might have been attractive once, but now... Hair like string, skinny like a skeleton, and flesh like wax. Dr. Bach, you call this a fair test? I said hopeless, but I didn't say a corpse. The lady is returning to life, mm -hmm. such as it is. Well, Dr. Scott, I regret I have not a more palatable subject for your experiment, but this is what I promised, a hopeless case. It's all right, I'll try it. Oh, what's her name? Let me see, it's on the chart here. Uh, Zelas. What was that? Her name is Kira Zelas. Oh. Young lady. Mm -hmm. Permit me, I am Dr. Hermann Bach, chief of the staff, and I would like to introduce one of our promising young doctors. He wants a date, I suppose. Miss Zelas. Hello, brown eyes. What? Your eyes are brown, aren't they? Miss Zelas, you see, I've perfected the serum. I like brown eyes. This, um, this serum might help you, but it has never been tried on a human being before. Uh, well, I thought if you have no objection... What are the odds? Odds? Well, actually, you've everything to gain. And nothing to lose. Well. How right you are. Okay. I'm, I'm all yours, brown eyes. Go ahead. Experiment away. Dr. Bach, prepare her arm. Twenty-four hours and she is yet alive. I would have said yesterday it would be impossible she should survive the night. So it is now forty-eight hours and she actually seems better. But miracles such as this have happened before and without serums. A week and she still lives. Each day she becomes better. It is miraculous. The spots on her lungs are disappearing. Her coughing is stopped. There is no sign of bacillus in the culture. But even more amazing, a reaction to abrasions, skin punctures. Yesterday, I took a blood specimen. Before I had one cc, the puncture in her skin had closed. Yes, in 30 seconds. The ordinary person, it takes a day, two days for it to heal. With Miss Kira Zelas, 30 seconds. It is amazing. Then I will not dispute it. Your serum has worked a miracle. She is cured. And now, 
I must just discharge her from the hospital. Well, oh, Dr. Bach, you know, I... You had forgotten that time must come sometime, hmm? But you see, I must. She is cured, and we need the room. Well, yes. Yes, I know, but... Well, well, she should be under observation. We don't know what effects will show up I with I think, the... Daniel, you have an extraordinary interest in Miss Zelas. So, I have asked her to come here. She is outside. Shall we invite her in? Why, yes, of course. Send in Miss Zelas, please. Now... Observe well your miracle. Uh, Miss Zelas, come in, come in, sit down. Thanks. Oh, hello, Brown Eyes. Hello, Kira. I have sent for you, Miss Zelas, because I have good news. Today I am discharging you from the hospital. Oh? Yeah? Today you are free to go. That pleases you? Madly. Kira, you have people, perhaps? A family? Aren't we all brothers and sisters? Under the skin. Miss Zelas, I will come to the point. I wish to make you a proposition. I mean purely a scientific... Pro- yes, I know. An experiment. Yeah, precisely. We are interested, Dr. Scott and I, to observe the further effects of the serum he gave you. Yes. I will pay you board and room and $30 a week. You will live at my house. I have a housekeeper, Mrs. Getz. She will look after you. Is that satisfactory? Wouldn't I be a fool to say no? Excellent, excellent. Does, uh... Brown eyes live there, too. No, but Dr. Scott will continue to have a clinical interest in the experiment. Miss Zelas, have no fear. Good. Yes. Well, it is now almost time for dinner. I will take you, Miss Zelas. You will join us, Dr. Scott? Why, oh, yes, fine, Dr. Bach. Very well. We shall meet outside in, what, ten minutes? That'll do me nicely. Miss Zelas, you wish to wait here or maybe outside? A little I... fresh air? I think I could use a little air. Good. There is a little park across the street. You will find benches there to rest. We will meet at the front entrance in ten minutes. Dr. Buck. Dr. Buck, what is it? What, what's the matter? Some sort of commotion across the street in the park. Uh-huh. Where is Kira? Well, I, I thought she'd be here with you. Perhaps she is still over there in the park. What do you suppose? Come on! Dr. Buck, it is Kira. Kira, let, let me through, please. Let, Kira, let us through, please. Officer, what's happened? What is this? Why are you holding this lady? You know this woman? Yes, of course. What is it? What's the matter here? Plenty. Your lady friend here merely walks up to an old gent about 60 or so, picks up a nice hefty rock and beats his brains out. Officer, there must be some awful mistake. Yeah, her mistake. Cold-blooded murder. Come on, sister, there's the wagon. But, Officer, uh, listen... You'd better come along, too, mister. Mona Lisa here don't seem to be much in the mood for talking. We'll need someone to tell the desk sergeant her name. Kira, this is terrible, seeing you here like this. I, I've got to get you out of here. I've got to help you. She is not so bad when you're here. Well, listen, this, this is all a terrible mistake. If you'll tell me what... Mistake? Why, why, yes, of course, you... Kira, you, you, you didn't kill that man. If I said yes, what would you do? Why, why, I, I'd tell him you weren't responsible. I, I'd tell him about the serum. I, I'd tell him it was my fault that, that somehow the serum I gave you caused your mind to, to snap something. That, well, that would be the only explanation. You'd do this. Ruin your career, no doubt. Just to save me. Oh, yes, of course I would. And what would they do to me? I I don't know exactly. Put you away under observation. Something. Kira, we... Then my answer's no. I did not kill the man. Oh, don't worry. I won't be convicted. I'll take care of myself very well. I'll, as you say, adapt myself to the situation. All right, now, Mr. Salvatore, continue. Tell the court, in your own words, precisely what happened. Uh, this old man, you see, is buy circus peanuts from me every day. <coughs> for months, every day. <coughs> and this one day, he pulled out his pocketbook, his billfold, and I'm a look, it's stuff with the bills. The big money. He says, Salvatore, can I make a change for $20? And I'm a laugh. I'm say, Mister, I'm a peanut man. You take the peanuts and you pay me tomorrow. He said, thank you very much. He turned around, and then here's this damn she pick up, oh, oh, it's a great the big stone, and it conks him. It's a murder. I object, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Continue, Mr. Salvatore. Oh, she, she's nothing more to say. 
This is them. She bend over and she reach in his pocket to take the money. I'm a grabber. People are come. Police are come. And Mr. Salvatore, can you describe this young lady to us? Oh, she. I remember her very well. She's uh, she's a skinny. She's ain't no beauty, you know. You got the black suit, the brown hair, uh, eyes. Uh, don't know, dark. You know, maybe brown or blue. Thank you, Mr. Salvatore. Your witness. Oh, I Mr. Salvatore, <laughs> you <laughs> say that the young lady, the assailant, had brown hair and dark eyes. She, si. brown hair, dark blue eyes. And do you see the young lady in the courtroom? Oh, see, si. she's a sit right to. What's the matter, Mr. Salvatore? Uh, Are you pointing at Mrs. Ailis? See, si. may I ask the defendant to rise, please, Miss Zalis? Will you kindly remove your hat, please? Dr. Bach, look. Her hair, it's, it's become the color of aluminum. Your Honor, I submit that this defendant does not possess dark hair, nor, if you will observe, dark eyes. I am prepared, therefore, to submit a lock of her hair to be tested by any chemist the court may appoint to prove that the pigmentation is entirely natural. Now, Mr. Salvatore, do you still say that this is the young lady you saw in the park? I, I think she's... Uh, I, is she? Uh, Mamma mia, she, no! Good Lord, Dr. Bach, that hair of hers. Did you see it? It was the color of aluminum. She was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And so she has been acquitted. They call her innocent. Daniel, I am a convert to your great principle of adaptability. But where will it end? You start with an ideal, and you wake up to discover you have created a monster. But she was acquitted. It was all a mistake. You really believe that? Dr. Bach. Yes, Mrs. Chris? She is here, Doctor. She? That woman in the newspaper. Ah. Kira is here? You said she was so poor, such a church mouse. Ah, oh, you should see her. What do you mean, Mrs. Gates? So fine, so great a lady. I'll, uh, I'll go and talk to her, Dr. Bach. Hello, brown eyes. Hello, Kira. Aren't you glad to see me? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Oh, congratulations on your acquittal today. We were there. I know. I sensed it. I was hurt that you didn't come up and congratulate me. Well, there were photographers and I... Well, Kira, your hair, it's black again. Isn't it always? Don't you like it? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. It's beautiful. And I beautiful. Brown eyes. Very, very beautiful. And are you happy to have me back? Hmm. I always did like brown eyes. Kira. Tell me, how do you like my new clothes? My gown? Why, it's very nice. Nice? It's exquisite. I have a whole new wardrobe, hat, shoes, well, suits. How, Kira? Where did you get the money? Money? You only had three dollars when you left the hospital. Oh, <laughs> so I did. Kira. Kira, you did take that wallet from the old man. Uh, naturally. You, you... You did murder him. Certainly. Oh, calm. Don't look so shocked. Oh, I'm tired, brown eyes. You'll excuse me if I appropriate Dr. Bach's room. Good night. Dr. Bach, we've got to do something. Yes, Daniel, we do. I haven't slept a wink all night trying to think of what we can do. I've been here in the laboratory all night. I think I know. What? This serum of yours, it has accomplished a miracle, yeah. It is the adaptive ultimate. Changes that take the ordinary person days or months, she accomplishes instantly. She walks into the sunlight, she is tan. She walks out, she is pale again. When she is in danger, she adapts. She could survive the electric chair, the hangman's noose. She was in danger in the courtroom. She adapted. She changed her whole appearance at will 
so she could not be identified. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, you must not blame yourself. You could not know what you were creating. Now, this morning, I operated on one of your guinea pigs. I found this. The pineal gland hypertrophied. That is what causes it. Well, then then we could operate and, and maybe change her back. Yeah, but she can adapt to anything, anesthesia included. How can we operate? Unless we get her consent? Well, perhaps... Oh, you are dreaming, Daniel. Do you really think she will consent now? Now that she has power? Perhaps more power than any human being ever possessed before. Power for evil. And she has already killed one man, remember? But if we watched her, Doctor, kept her under guard... Yeah, yeah, again, Pygmalion falls in love with his Galatea. No, Daniel, no. She must be destroyed. We must perform surgery at once... Well, she'll die. She will go back to what she was, with but a few hours to live. It is best, then. Yes, I suppose so. Yes? Yes, Mrs. Getz? Hmm? Oh. Danke. Well, what is it, Dr. Bach? And so perhaps she is also telepathic. She sensed what we were about to do, and now it is too late. What do you mean? Miss Zelos is gone. Disappeared. <laughs> Dr. Buck, did you call for me? Yeah, Daniel. Have you seen the evening paper yet? No, not yet. Then here. After two months, there is news of our Miss Kira Zelas. What? Let me see that. Where? Oh. The surprise of the evening was the appearance of John Callan, ambassador at large, diplomat extraordinary, the man slated to head the forthcoming World Atomic Energy Control Commission. Mr. Callan, one of Washington's confirmed bachelors, squired the the gorgeous Kira Zalus. You see? She has become gorgeous, our drab little urchin. Miss Zalus, the dazzling beauty who affects a dark wig by day and a white one at night. A great power of adaptability, courtesy of Dr. Daniel Scott. Dark by day, white by night. Well, what are we going to do, Doctor? Do? The world atomic energy control, the one real hope of world peace. Kira isn't interested in peace. What can we do? Surgery, I know. But politics? We must wait and see. We must wait and see how far your mad woman will go. Washington is agog with rumors about the romance between glamorous Key Rosales and John Callan, the newly appointed head of the World Atomic Energy Control, one of the most powerful political figures on the globe. John Callan leaves tomorrow for the crucial atomic energy conferences at Geneva, Switzerland. And sailing on the same boat as the exotic Miss Kira Zalis, with whom his name has been frequently linked. Rumor has it Miss Zalis acts as a sort of unofficial assistant to Mr. Callan, thus making her one of the most important women in the world. Glamorous, exotic. Of such fragile stuff is world peace fashioned these days, Daniel. I wonder what she intends to... Some of the calling at dinner time. Oh, sit still, Dr. Buck. I'll see who it is. Yes? Uh, Kira. Hello, Brown Eyes. May I come in? Why, yes, of course. Oh, ho. Our exotic guinea pig. Hmm? Good evening, Dr. Buck. I'm not intruding. Of course not. You're very kind. John and I, you've read about Mr. Callan. Oh, yes, yes. We're leaving for Europe tomorrow for the conferences in Switzerland. Yes. He had a series of meetings to attend tonight, so I told him I would stay here. You're staying here? I took the liberty of saying you were my uncle, Dr. Buck. Oh. John will call for me in the morning on his way to the airport. We're leaving at eight. I do hope I'm not too late for dinner. Not at all. In fact, we're very happy to have you here, aren't we, Dr. Scott? Kira. Hello, Brown Eyes. What are you doing out here in the garden? Waiting for you. You knew I'd follow you? Of course. Have you missed me? You know I have. Oh, Kira, listen to me. Do you love this John Callum? When I want love, I'll come to you, Brown Eyes. Well, then why? What is it, money? Money? I don't need money anymore. What does an empress need with money? Empress? That's what you've made me. The most powerful woman the world's ever known. 
John Callan. He's supposed to be important. But in my hands, he's clay to be molded as I wish. Do you see what that means? Yes, I see. You hold the fate of the world in your hands. Exactly. To do with as I want. And I shall. Would you like to rule the world with me, brown eyes? Kira, you're evil. What is good? What's evil? Come here, brown eyes. Look at me. And forget such things. Are you asleep, Dr. Bach? Sleep? Who can sleep? Kira's insane, Doctor. Do you know what she's planning to do? I heard. Oh. Maybe, maybe we could get to this Callum. We... Yeah, and then what? Well, if, if we could talk to him, tell him... Tell him, tell him what? Didn't I talk to you? Would you listen? Where is she? Oh, she's gone to sleep. I tell you, there's only one remedy, surgery. It is the only hope. But she'll never consent to surgery, Dr. Bach, and she's probably immune to anesthesia. Maybe not. Maybe not all anesthesia. What? Downstairs in my laboratory, I have a tank of ethyl chloride. You mean operate here tonight? Yeah, tonight. Right here, where she sleeps. Stop staring down at her. Pour the anesthesia onto the cone. Hurry. That ought to be enough to anesthetize an elephant. Onto the face, quickly. All right. Stand <laughs> tightly. Hold it I'm close. I'm trying. I'm trying. She's forcing my hands. I, I can't hold her. She's too strong. I... Fools. Did you think you could make me unconscious? You were going to operate on me. Is that what you were planning? Or were you going to slit my throat with that scalpel? Look. Kira, don't! There. You see? I plunge your knife into my heart. I withdraw it. And the wound is healed. Now, go away, both of you. I want to sleep. John will be calling for me at eight. <laughs> in the morning. Two and a half hours more and she will leave and the world will be one step nearer chaos. We are scientists, Dan. We have a responsibility to civilization. We must find a way to destroy this... Carbon dioxide. Creature. Carbon dioxide, It's a of fundamental course. biological law. No human can survive in its own waste product. Carbon dioxide is a human waste. <sighs> Dr. Bach, if we could fill the room where she's sleeping with carbon dioxide, she'd become unconscious. You could operate then. Who are you calling? The hospital. I will have them send over two tanks of carbon dioxide. Do you think it should work then? We must try anything. Hello, this is Dr. Bach. Let me talk to surgery. Now hurry, it is an emergency. <laughs> is ready. You sealed the crack under the door? Yes. You closed the window? Yes. All right. Let us start the gas. Shh. Well, then, through the transom above the bedroom door, you will be able to observe her reactions. You placed the lighted candle inside the room? Yes, Doctor. I left the candle on the table. Ah. Oh. Observe it carefully. All right. When it goes out, your Miss Kira Zelas should be unconscious. Dan, can you see inside the room from up there? Yes, Doctor. Candle is flickering, Doctor. Wait. No, it's still flickering. It, it's just gone out, Doctor. Excellent. It means there is now a concentration of 8 or 10 percent carbon dioxide. The average person would long since be dead. Doctor. Yeah, then, what? Oh, just a minute. Yes, yes. She's breathing much more quickly now, convulsively. Ah, uh -huh. chain stroke breathing. She. She's opening her eyes now. What? She's. She's getting up. Getting up? She's staggering. Holding her throat, Doctor. 
She's gasping. She's yes. moving toward the door. She's trying to unlock the... So, so. She's seen me. She... She's trying to... Well, well, trying... well. What is it? She's collapsed. It's over. Yes? How do you do, Dr. Bach? I'm John Callan. John Callan? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come in. I haven't taken you away from anything. Oh, no, no. We were performing some surgery, my associate and I. I, I have a miniature surgery here for emergencies, and we have just finished. Is that the patient on the table? Uh, the... Yeah, yes. Is she... Yes, she is dead. Too bad. Seedy-looking creature, wasn't she? She was a charity case. Well, I, I won't keep you. Is uh, Kira here? No, she she changed her plans. She said there were some things she wished to do and she would meet you at the airport. Well, that's a woman's prerogative, isn't it? Changing plans? <laughs> yes. I'd better get a move on, then. Nice to see you, Doctor. I, I hope we'll meet again when I return from Europe. Yes, that will be nice, Mr. Callan. And good luck on your mission. Uh, thank you, sir. Goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Well, Daniel, maybe we will get some sleep now. Then... Huh? Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Doctor. I, I was daydreaming. She's lovely, isn't she? Lovely. Yeah, then lovely. May she always be in your memory. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have presented transcribed The Adaptive Ultimate by John Jessel, adapted for radio by Chet Spurgeon and Herb Futran, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel, starring Edgar Barrier as Dr. Bach and Stacey Harris as Dan Scott. Featured in the cast were Elsie Holmes, Frank Gerstle, Larry Dobkin, Tom Charlesworth, and Ann Morrison. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are trapped in a dark, empty house. A girl lying dead at your feet. And surrounding you, closing in on you, are the band of killers, deadly enemies of your country and yourself. And they are intent on murdering you. Next week, we escape with the famous story, Confidential Agent by Graham Greene. Be sure to tune in at this same time next week, when once again we offer you... Escape! This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Jack Benny in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite, following a popular trend, anticipates the strange disappearance of experimental rocket ship Y-272B. The time, the year 2053. The place, the planet Mars. The star, Mr. Jack Benny. Say, Hap, that was quite a speech you made last night. You were as dynamic as an Autolite stay-full battery. Oh, that's flattery, Harlow. And what a battery it is, Hap. The Autolite stay-full is the power-packed Pepster that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I really don't deserve such praise, Harlow. Why not? That's the battery with the fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give the Autolite stay-full longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. I was really good, eh, Harlow? Oh, no one could do any better than to visit his nearest Autolite battery dealer, whose services all makes of batteries. To quickly locate him, just call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. 
I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer where you can get an Autolite staple. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Plan X, starring Mr. Jack Benny, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. The card. Do you have the card yet? Uh, one more run through the machine. Torig, when do you think the Earth rocket is arriving? Tomorrow. But if the Grand Council wanted the card before now, they should have asked me before now. Is that it? Let me see it. Mm, here. One, three, seven, five, six. Zeno. Assembly line worker. Atomic escalator factory. Mm. Torrid, this is the man for the job? He has the specifications called for. An assembly line worker. Why, it's incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Yes? Yes? Right away. You may go in now, Zeno. The Grand Council is ready for you. One, three, seven, five, six, called Zeno. Come forward. Yes, sir. They know the Grand Council of Mars has a mission for you to perform. Me? A mission? You have been selected because of the qualities shown on your work and identity card, Form 42-A. Set habit patterns, attention to detail, no strong emotional or biological drives, and complete suppression of imagination. Well, I always pride myself that I... Do not speak I... unless questioned, Zeno. The Grand Council has other important matters of state. Of course, of course. You have heard the telephone broadcast that an armed rocket from the planet Earth is approaching Mars. Hmm? Oh, oh, I did hear something about it, yes. Their course has been plotted as bringing them to a landing on the plane outside the city at 10.14 tomorrow morning. 10.14. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing that. You will see it, Citizen Zeno. Me? You. Well, I'd certainly like to, but I'm due in the atomic escalator factory at 8. I'm on stair treads, you know. And uh... we've arranged a leave from your job. Leave? Well, I'm not arguing with the Grand Council, but I've got a pretty important job there, and uh... one three seven five six. You've been selected to meet and deal with the Earth rocket. Me? You will put Plan X into operation. Plan X? Citizen Zeno, every Martian for the last fifty years has been thoroughly grounded in Plan X. If and when a rocket should come from the Earth. Oh. oh. Oh, Plan X. Oh, you see, I thought you said Plan X. Of course. Then you understand and accept the responsibility. Oh, anything to help out. Those assisting you on the mission will be in contact with you. Good, good. Have the other council members any questions? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. 13756 called Zeno. You are now officially operating under the provisions of... Plan X. Well, thank you. I took the aerial transmission belt directly home. Let them get along without me at the escalator factory if they could. Besides, it was almost quitting time. I went to bed early that night. Uh, tomorrow was going to be a big day. Plan X. Out of the whole population of Mars, I was picked to carry out Plan X. Oh, I'll admit I had my criticisms of the Grand Council in the past, but this restored my confidence in them. Yes, sir. They couldn't have picked a better Martian. I think I'll have a second cup of ostrich, Mother. Zeno, you haven't time. 
You'll be late for the factory as it is. As I told you, Mother, I'm on leave. Orders of the Grand Council. Oh, yes, of course. Plan X. But will the Grand Council care if you don't get your job back? There won't be any trouble. They couldn't replace me in stair treads, and they know it. Pass the Gorot, will you, Mother? Here. But it's fattening, Zeno. And I got a hard task coming up, Mother. I owe it to myself. And you will be careful, Zeno. Oh, Mother, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. It's just an invasion rocket from that stupid planet Earth. So will you stop worrying? Ah, oh, you're just like your father was, Zeno. Too brave for your own good. I am? Well, it's nothing, really. I took my time going over to the field where the Earth rocket was to land. I got there at ten, with not another soul around. Another few minutes, and I had my pocket radar screen working. Yep, the rocket was coming in, right on time. Then I could hear it out in space, and soon after that I could see it. Bearing our first visitors from Earth. Gee, I was thinking they must be a brave crew. I almost felt sorry for them. It wasn't a bad landing. Not the greatest, but not bad. After another ten minutes, a port in the side of the rocket started to swing open, and I walked over. If I do say it myself, I made quite an impression. Commander. Commander, look. Great Scott, what is it? Commander, I... I think we've met our first Martian. All right, keep back, everybody. Dr. Fielding and I will deal with it. Him, whatever it is, hand me the Martian kit, Parker. All ready, sir. Come on, Fielding. We'll be ready for anything. Right, Commander. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. I'll try to talk to him. We, Earth people, we, friends, friends, we come from out there. Uh, Blast that feeling. I feel like a fool. Uh, uh, Let me try, Commander. We bring you presents here. We bring you beads, cloths of many colors. Take them. You wouldn't have something a little more conservative? Fielding, he speaks Esperanto. Incredible, incredible. Gentlemen, welcome to Mars. It's, it's almost as if he was expecting us. Oh, yes, for some days now. Ever since you left Earth, as a matter of fact. You hear that, Fielding? Commander, we may very well be in the presence of a superior race. Well, thank you. You, you say you expected us? Everyone expected us? Oh, certainly. But you're here alone. Yes. Well, unfortunately, all other adult Martians are, shall we say, unavailable. For how long? Not wishing to pry, but how long are you staying? Well, they've taken to the hills, have they? (laughs) No need to be afraid of us. No need at all. There's uh, no one in your city over there? Mainly unavailable. But I'll be glad to show you around. Martian hospitality, you know. (laughs) Amazing. Can we go right away, Commander? I'll get Connie. You can call her, Fielding. But we don't want to blunder into a trap. All right, men. All in. Parker, take three men and stay here for rocket guard. Yes, sir. Ready, Fielding? All set, Commander. Uh, Connie, I want you to meet our first Martian. Dr. Fielding, I don't believe it. Miss Morrison, this is, uh, uh... Uh, 13756. Call Zeno. Uh, Miss Morrison, this is Zeno. Uh, how do you do? Well, how do you do? Uh, incredible. But he's almost handsome in a strange way. And he speaks our language. Maybe a trick of some kind. Expedition force, on to... to... It's a little difficult to pronounce. On to... the city! <laughs> We marched into the city, which, of course, appeared quite deserted. Plan X. 
I showed them a few of the sites, the canals, the og factory, and the hall of the Grand Council. I was walking alongside of Connie, Miss Morrison, who was most unlike the women of Mars. I caught myself showing off, riding the aerial transmission belt with one hand. Finally, I took them all to the art museum. Oh, Commander, this place, this civilization, it's fantastic, fantastic. Look at this sculpture, Dr. Fielding. The line, the detail. I've never seen anything so beautiful. <laughs> it's nothing, really. Zeno, you don't mean that you... Well, no, no, no. You see, I work at an atomic escalator factory. I'm in stair treads. Everybody, over here. Look at this. Huh? Oh, what is it? What, what, isn't that what... Why, Zeno, is, is this what I think it is? Hmm? I'll have to read the nameplate. Oh, yes, yes, a flying saucer. From 1952, your calendar. 100 years old. 1952, the year of the flying saucers. Then they did come from Mars. Oh, yes. But none of them ever landed on Earth. Why? Mm, it just didn't seem worthwhile. Nothing personal, of course. I just can't get over this planet. It's so different from anything we imagined. Now, here's something you might be interested in. Uh, right over here. Looks like a weapon of some kind. Oh, yes. Yeah, you see, it's a uh, paralyzer ray. 300 years old. But why do you have it in a museum? You don't mean that weapons like this are 300 years obsolete? Well, you might say that, yes. You see, no adult Martian has carried a weapon for hundreds of years. Well, why not? Why should we? But to defend yourself. Well, we just have no aggressive impulses, that's all. Well, if someone struck you, wouldn't you strike back? I couldn't. But it doesn't matter. No one could strike me. No Martian, that is. Yeah. We've never had any trouble. Uh, Zeno, you're in the diplomatic service? The escalator game. Yet you were delegated to meet us. Yes, by the Grand Council. You see, we stopped having diplomats handle our important missions years ago. Again, nothing personal, of course. <laughs> I see. But you are empowered to deal with us. Deal with you? I certainly am. Uh, good. Now, it seems logical to me that we should work out a mutual defense pact. Uh, not right now, of course. Mr. Zeno! B Mr. Zeno! Who's that? Oh, it looks like children. We have to see you, Mr. Zeno. Uh, just some little friends of mine. Oh, they're darling. What's the problem, Ormy? We're building something, and we're all out of uranium. We need some right away, and... Zeno, does he mean real uranium? Oh, of course, Dr. Fielding. Oh, it won't hurt them a bit. We have to have it right away, Mr. Zeno. We just have to have it. This, this city was deserted. Where did these children come from? Oh, you know how it is with kids when they get to playing. You'll get the uranium for us, won't you, Mr. Zeno? Will you? Fascinating. Uh, what are they playing, Zeno? Yes. Uh, what's the game? I don't think you've heard of it, Commander. It's called Plan X. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Mr. Jack Benny in Plan X, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, do you like to make speeches? Sure, Hap, especially about the Autolite Stay Full battery. Friends, Romans, motorists. Lend me your ears while I praise the greatest of the great, the incomparable Autolite Stay Full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. The battery that gives longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. The famous Autolite Stay Full has over three times the liquid reserve of ordinary batteries. And because every positive plate is protected by fiberglass retaining mats to reduce shedding and flaking... The Autolite Stay Full just naturally gives longer life than ordinary batteries. And where can one get this glorious battery? From your nearest Autolite battery dealer who services all makes of batteries. To quickly locate him, just phone Western Union and ask for operator 25. And I'll tell you where you can get an Autolite Stay Full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. 
And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Jack Benny in Elliot Lewis's production of Plan X, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. For the next week, I showed the Earth expedition around the city, signed a few treaties, and had several long conversations with Miss Morrison. Well, not too long, but I felt we were building a solid friendship. It was too bad it was coming to an end. You're not going out again this evening, Zeno? Mother, so I've been out two evenings in a row. Doesn't have to be fatal, you know. This is the time of year you always get that chest cold. Oh, chest cold, chest cold. Anyway, Mother, I have to go over to the rocket. Don't they plan to go back to Earth tomorrow? They plan to, yes. Miss Morrison promised to take a little farewell walk with me this evening. Hmm. Don't let her keep you out in the moonlight too long, Zeno. Mother, why, that's the most ridiculous thing I... You just don't know how attractive you are. Now, Mother, Miss Morrison and I are merely friends. And to think of anything beyond that is just... Mr. Zeno! Mr. Zeno! We're almost finished the game, Mr. Zeno. Good, good. All finished, Army? Just about. It's tomorrow morning at 8.45, isn't it? 8.45. Anything else you need, Army? I mean, any more uranium? No, I just wanted to make sure it was 8.45. Well, see you in the morning, Mr. Zeno. Goodbye, Mr. Zeno. See you in the morning, Army. (laughs) Such a cute little fellow, Zeno. And smart. Is he? Mother, you have no idea. The Earth expedition was camped beside their rocket, getting ready for takeoff the next day. Connie, uh, uh, Miss Morrison, waved when she saw me coming. I waved back, and then she smiled at me, and I smiled back. It was a beautiful evening. We walked out over the plain, Connie and I, and then we sat down quite close. Connie lit a cigarette, and I opened up a package of Gurkhog. Zeno? Yes, Connie. Miss Morrison. Uh, Connie. How is it you're not married, Zeno? Don't Martians believe in it? Oh, definitely. But there's mother and... And what? Connie, you don't find me a little bit strange? You mean because you're a Martian? Not exactly. You see, even to Martian girls, I'm a little bit strange. I find you very attractive, Zeno. Really? You're from a superior race? Well... The commander may not see it, but Dr. Fielding does, and I do. Your civilization, your culture, and you? Actually, I'm... What are the other Martians like? You know, I seem to feel there are people all around watching, waiting, and yet we've seen only you. And the children, of course. Yes, and the children. They've been playing around the rocket all day. Yes, yes. Zeno, what'll happen to this planet, this beautiful planet, when the next Earth rocket comes? And the next one? Connie. I'd almost like to stay here. Or I wish we'd never come. None of us. Connie, there's something I... I... What, Zeno? What is it? It's just that... It's getting cold. Maybe we'd better go back. I walked with Connie back to the rocket, and then I went home. There was a message on the autophone pad. The Grand Council wanted to see me at once. You sent for me, gentlemen? 13756 called Zeno. You are nearing the completion of Plan X. I hope my work has been satisfactory. You were selected for certain qualifications, Zeno. Set habit patterns, attention to detail, no strong emotional drives. I remember, yes. You have assumed a responsibility based on those qualifications. I suppose you might put it that way. Are you still prepared to discharge that responsibility? Well, I... I think you might as well know that it's been my criticism in the past, as well as that of a lot of other taxpayers, that the Grand Council interferes entirely too much in the private lives of, well, well, what I mean to say... Are you prepared to discharge your responsibility? But about Connie, I mean Miss Morrison, isn't there some way You that... know that there is not. Well, I... I suppose not, no. Plan X will then be completed. I assure the Grand Council, at 8.45 tomorrow morning, 
Plan X will be completed. I didn't sleep well that night. Mother was worried when I hadn't any appetite in the morning. She thought it was the start of one of my chest colds. Purposely, I didn't go out to the rocket until almost 8.40. They were blasting the motors, getting ready to take off. Zeno, I thought you weren't coming. I I overslept, Connie. That is, I I didn't really oversleep, but... The uh... children have been here for an hour. We're just about finished playing, Mr. Zeno. Oh, good, Army. Did you win the game? Plan X? I think so. We'll know in a minute, Mr. Zeno. They're so intense. Are the children on Mars always that way, Zeno? Well, not always, no. Ah, come to see us off, did you, Zeno? Good boy. We counted on you. Well, thank you. Come over here, Fielding. Uh, Yes, Commander. Connie, Fielding, Zeno here has been so helpful to us that I've come to a decision. That's very nice of you, but I'm pretty well stocked up on beads right now. Uh, A different kind of a present. Zeno, I've decided to invite you to come with us to Earth. To Earth? How about it, Zeno? We're taking off in... uh, Sixteen minutes at nine o'clock. How about it? Well, it's not that I don't appreciate your thinking of me, but Mother would worry and... You uh... see, we need you, Zeno. That's not true. Well, I'm afraid it is. You see, I think Zeno is a much more important man than a worker in an elevator factory. Escalator. I'm in stair trains. And if we have Zeno along the next time we come back to Mars, we'd be much less likely to run into, well, an ambush. I'm afraid he's right, Connie. He's not right. How about it, Zeno? Thanks, but no. Commander, those kids, they've got some sort of a ray gun set up. Fielding. Is it real, Fielding? Why, it, it looks like it, Commander. Get Zeno over in front of us, quick. Now they can't shoot without hitting him. Get your gun out, Parker. You mean the kids, Commander? If we have to, yes. Tell them not to fire on us, Zeno. I'm sorry, Connie. Really sorry. Oh, it's all right, Zeno. Do what you have to do. Shall we shoot, Mr. Zeno? Have your gun ready, Parker. It wouldn't do any good, Commander. All right, Army. Plan X. Did you... Did you fire, Parker? Me, sir? Fire a gun? Why, I... I couldn't. I couldn't do a thing like that. No, no, of course you couldn't. I I don't know what made me ask. Uh, The rocket, its motors have stopped. Its motors have stopped, Commander. Well, we aren't going anywhere, are we? Someone said something about going back to Earth. Back Back to to Earth? Earth? Oh, no. Of course not, of course not. Everybody all right? What happened, Commander? What happened? Nothing, really. It's just that Army and his little friends built a maturity ray. It takes people who are, shall we say, less advanced and increases their IQ by several thousand years. That's amazing. Child's play. Zeno, do you mean to say... Commander, Dr. Fielding, Parker, Connie, permit me to congratulate you as fellow Martians. (laughs) Utterly amazing. Connie... Look... Here come the Martians. Our fellow Martians, thousands of them. They're coming to welcome us. Connie. Oh, look at them. Uh, Oh, they look so handsome, so intelligent, so... Connie. Yeah, excuse me, Zeno. I'll be back, Commander. I have to go to them. I'll be back. Well, she did like me for a while. Before Plan X. But she did like me. Even just for a while. That's something, isn't it? Suspense, presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Jack Benny. This is Harlow Wilcox again, speaking for Autolite. 
world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why, during the early months of 1953, as we did last year, the Autolite family will join in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family is a worldwide family, and numbers among its members some 30,000 men and women in Autolite plants in the United States, Canada, and many foreign countries, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as thousands of Autolite distributors and dealers, and the many leading manufacturers who use Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family will salute the Dodge Division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense program on television. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense so that you'll be sure to see this program. Next week, the dramatic report of a man's desperate race for freedom. A true story with names and places changed in order to protect the lives of the principals. The story is called The Man Who Cried Wolf. Our star, Mr. Jeff Chandler. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Plan X was written for Suspense by Richard Powell. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Norma Varden, John McIntyre, Truda Marson, Howard McNear, William Conrad, Jack Crucian, Joseph Kearns, and Stuffy Singer. The Jack Benny Show may be heard every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. And remember next week, Mr. Jeff Chandler in The Man Who Cried Wolf. Adventures in Time and Space. Told in future tense. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, bring you... Dimension X. It happened during a routine skirmish in the Great War. Patrols advanced from the defense perimeter under jet cover and preceded by napalm throwers. The enemy defended in depth and mopped up with guided 98s fired from 40 miles to the rear. The blast area was 10 miles in circumference and the medics didn't find much to pick up over 500 yards in. Take it in here. Where? Look out, it's lousy with mud. Okay, man, guide me. More, more. Wait, wait. Head left. Okay. More. Okay. Hold it. Okay. Stretches. Come on, Travis, get those men out. Yes, sir. Get a move on, line them up. Come on. Easy, easy. You want to kill them? Okay, take it away. They might have left these Joes where they was. Half of them won't last till the plane comes. As long as they're alive, they'll be treated. Get off the tags, Travis. Start talking names. Yes, sir. Uh, this one must have been a thousand yards in. Get his dog tag out. What a mess. Here. Hartley Allen, Captain G5, Chem Research, AN73D, number SO2386943J. Alan Hartley? Alan Hartley. I wonder if that could be the hunter that wrote Children of the Mist and Conqueror's Road. Never heard of him. Major, I think maybe he's part conscious. Maybe I should give him another shot. Go ahead, Sergeant. There isn't much else we can do for him. It's a rotten shame. Ain't it always? Okay, Captain, give me your arm. There. Get 
up, Alan. Can't stay in bed all day. I remember that. Clear as if it were real. Up and at him. Hit the deck. Remarkably vivid. Strange. Alan, you all right? I'm all right. What's wrong with my voice? It's too high. Ah. Hey, what are you doing? Practicing singing? My voice has changed. <laughs> Is that all? You're growing up. Happy birthday, son. Happy birthday? Hey, wake up, son. Wake up. I am awake. Come on, out of bed. I don't understand. Breakfast waiting. How to better, I'll turn it over. All right, all right. It's a dream. Maybe, but you're wide awake now. I am awake now. Well, half awake anyway. That's the Bell of St. Boniface, isn't it? What day is it? Are you kidding? You forget today's your birthday? No. No, I didn't forget. Neither did I. Here, son. Happy 13th birthday. You won't guess what's in here. A rifle. A light 22 rifle. How'd you know that? I remembered. Did I spill the beans sometime? I could have sworn it'd be a surprise. Well, well, go on, open it. Like it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's perfect, Dad. Now, I'll be shaving, Alan. Come down to breakfast when you're ready. Yeah, it's a big day today. You're almost a man. Almost. You're still groggy. Snap out of it, Alan. I will. There's a dream in it somewhere. But I'm not sure which. What? Mm, never mind, Dad. I'll be right down for breakfast. <laughs> Now for coffee. Mrs. Stauber makes the best in town. A black for uh, me. A what? Oh, I mean... Uh, you may be 13, Alan, but they're still a little young for coffee, especially black. Oh, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> what are you going to do today, son? I want to do some reading this morning, I guess. Uh, that's always a good thing to do. Uh, after breakfast, suppose you take a walk down to the station and get me a Times. Didn't it come? What, the Times? They don't deliver. Be a good idea, though. Maybe I'll talk to Sam Ashman about it. Here's a half dollar, Alan. Get anything you want for yourself out of the change. Thanks, Dad. Uh, finish your milk before you go. Oh, sure, Dad. And uh, hurry back. I like to finish the crossword puzzle before lunch. Here you are, Alan. One time's... Tell your father the puzzle's a stinker. Thanks, Mr. Ashburn. Look out for the trucks when you cross the highway. Oh, I'll go across Elton's lot shortcut. Elton's? You'll have a hard time crossing there, son. There's four buildings on that block. I thought they burned down. Seen them this morning, big as life. Oh, I guess that didn't happen yet. What'd you say? Oh, nothing, Mr. Ashburn. I was just muttering. In my days, youngsters talked up. Yes, sir. Oh, bye, Mr. Ashburn. Monday, August 6, 1945. Okinawa 1, bombing Japan. Hey! Hey, Alan, wait up! Larry Morton. Oh, hey, Larry. Hi, Al. Hey, you want to have a catch or something? No, I have some things I want to do at home. <laughs> wow, get him. Fancy pants talk. Things I want to do at home. Oh, go chase yourself around the block. Go jump in a garbage can, will you? Go take a flying jet to the moon. Hey, that's a new one. A flying jet to the moon. Hey, you thought up a new one, Al. Yeah. Hey, how about us going swimming at the canoe clubs after? Gee, I wish I could. I gotta stay home. Zafter. You see the football movie at the Grand? Boy, what a team. Notre Dame. I thought you liked Cornell. Cornell? Ha, they couldn't even beat Vassar. You're going to Cornell, aren't you? Me? Cornell? Fat chance. I'll bet you do. I wouldn't take your money. I know you wouldn't. 
You'll go to Cornell, all right. <laughs> Cornell. Far above Cayuga's waters, there's an awful smell. Just the same. You'll go to Cornell. I've got to hurry, Larry. Well, so long, Al. See ya. So long, Larry. See ya. <laughs> Stuck in this corner. A seven-letter word to mix in proportion. Nitrate. Huh? T I. It fits. How'd you know that, Alan? What? Oh, I read it somewhere, I guess. Oh. What are you reading now? Tarzan again? No, not Tarzan. It's refreshing to see you with a book. Sometimes I think I ought to forbid comic books in the house. Yeah, they must be raising the devil with those bombing raids in Japan. How long do you think the war in Japan will last, Dad? Oh, i will say the middle of 1946. We'll have to invade those islands foot by foot. I wouldn't be surprised if the war was over very suddenly. <laughs> How, by magic? There isn't a thing on earth will make those Japanese surrender. You expect somebody to make a pass and it'll be all over by this afternoon? It's just about Mr. it. Mr. Hartley, excuse me. Can I see you for a minute? Oh, hello, Mr. Gutschall. Sure. That's Frank Gutschall, Dad? That's right. Excuse me. Didn't mean to disturb you, Mr. Hartley. That's quite all right. It's a lovely day, isn't it, Mr. Gutschall? The Lord's world is always beautiful. Oh, of course, Mr. Gutschall. Uh, Mr. Hartley, I wonder if you could lend me a gun and some bullets. Huh? My little dog's been hurt and it's been suffering something terrible. Oh, that's too bad. I I want a gun to put the poor thing out of its pain. Oh, of course. How would a 20-gauge shotgun do? You wouldn't want anything heavy. I was hoping you'd let me have a little gun. Maybe so big. A pistol? Uh, so I could put it in my pocket. Wouldn't look right for a godly man to carry a hunting gun through town. I don't hold with killing innocent creatures. People wouldn't understand that it was for a work of mercy. Of course, I understand. You're a very religious man. The whole world is evil, Mr. Hartley. Well, sometimes it certainly looks like it. Well, I have a Colt 38 special from the auxiliary police outfit. That's fine, fine. Uh, you'll have to bring it right back, Mr. Gutchall. I might be called out. Uh, Dad, hmm? Dad, wait a minute. I just remembered. Remembered what, son? Uh, aren't there some cartridges left for the Luger? Then you wouldn't be without the coat. Hey, that's right. I've got a German automatic, Mr. Gottschall, I could let you have. That way I wouldn't get stuck. Wait, Dad, I'll get it. I know where the cartridges are. Well, be careful, son. Well, Mr. Gottschall, it sure turned out nice after all that rain. Police headquarters. Um, this is Blake Hartley. Uh, Frank Gutschall, who lives on Campbell Street, has just borrowed a gun from me ostensibly to shoot a dog. What? No, he has no dog. He intends shooting his wife. Yes, I'll take out the firing pin. He'll walk home. If you hurry, you can get him in there on time. Right. Oh, there you are. What kept you, Alan? Uh, I couldn't find the cartridges at first. I'll show Mr. Gutcho how it works. It's all loaded, ready to shoot. Uh, this is the safe, Dean. Just push it forward and up. Uh, there are eight shots in it. Did you load the chamber, Alan? Oh, sure. It's unsafe now. You understand how it works, Mr. Gottschall? Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hartley. Thank you, Sonny. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Gottschall. Return the gun when you're done. Yes, I'll be done with it soon. Goodbye. Alan, you shouldn't have loaded that gun. <sighs> I guess it's all over now. I had to keep you from fooling with it. Didn't want you to see I took out the firing pin. You what? Gutcho didn't want that gun to shoot a dog. He's a fanatic. He sees visions, hears voices. 
The voice has probably put him up to this. I'll submit that any man who holds intimate conversations with disembodied spirits isn't to be trusted with a gun. He wants to shoot his wife. What are you talking about? While I was upstairs, I called the police. I put a handkerchief over my mouth and told them I was you. You... Why'd you have to do that? I couldn't have told them. This is little Alan Hartley, 13 years old. And suppose he really wants to shoot a dog. What kind of a mess will I be in then? No mess, because I'm right. But you'll have to front for me. They give me a lot of cheap boy hero publicity, which I don't want. This is crazy, Alan. This is absolutely crazy. We'll have the complete returns in 20 minutes. <laughs> Mr. Hartley, Mr. Blake Hartley. Uh, that's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Kaborski from Homicide. Here's your Luger. Uh, thank you. I don't know how you spotted that guy, but when we busted in, he was pointing that gun at his wife, swearing a blue streak because it wouldn't go off. Well, I'm uh, glad I was able to help. They may have some kind of citation, Mr. Hartley. Oh, I, I don't think that's necessary. Well, in the department, we figure a little publicity never hurt nobody. Even a lawyer, huh? I, uh... Really, he'd prefer to have it kept quiet. Well, whatever you say, we we'll want you to drop around in the morning for a statement. I'll be glad to. Well, thanks, Mr. Hartley. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sonny. Goodbye, Sergeant. Why don't you take the citation, Dad? Well, you were right. You saved that woman's life. Let's, uh... See you put back the firing pin. Sure. There. Suppose we have a little talk. But I explained everything. You did not. Yesterday, you wouldn't even have known how to take this pistol apart. Today, you've been using language and expressing ideas that are outside of everything you've ever known before. Now, I want to know. Well, I hope you're not toying with a medieval... Notion of obsession. What? You see, I'm changed. When did you first notice this? Last night you were still my little boy. This morning, I don't know. You, you've been strange all day. Alan, what's happened to you? I wish I could be sure myself, Dad. You see, when I woke up this morning, all I could remember was lying on a stretcher injured by a bomb explosion... I was 43 years old, and the year was 1975. 1975? That's right. You'll be 43 in 1975. But, but a bomb? Yes, during the siege of Buffalo in the Third World War. I was a captain in G5 Scientific Warfare General Staff. Buffalo? You mean Buffalo, New York? Yes, there had been a transpolar invasion of Canada. I was sent to the front to check on service failures of a new lubricating oil. I got hit by a bomb blast. I remember being picked up and getting a narcotic injection. The next thing I knew, I was in bed upstairs, and it was 1945 again. And I was back in my own 13-year-old body. <laughs> Alan, you just had a nightmare to end all nightmares, that's all. I thought it might be that at first but I rejected it. It wouldn't fit the facts. But it's ridiculous. All this battle of Buffalo stuff. You picked it up listening to the radio. All the commentators have been going on about another war after this one. You've just got an undigested chunk of H.V. Calton born in your subconscious. But that isn't everything. I remember four years of high school, four years at Cornell, seven years as a reporter on the Philadelphia Record, three novels, Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, and Conqueror's Road. I wrote detective stories under a phony name. I worked in chemistry. You think a 13-year-old can dream up all that stuff? But it's the only possible explanation. Maybe. But I can speak five languages today that I couldn't yesterday. French, German, Chinese, Russian, and Spanish. Although I've got a Mexican accent you could cut with a knife. But, but how did it happen? I, I can't believe it. All I know is here I am. I've been reading up on time theories. Nobody seems to know much about them. Evidently, time exists parallel as another dimension. 
And I've got kicked backwards, and somehow... But how? It may have been the radiation from the bomb. Or the narcotic injection. Or both together. But the fact remains I'm here with full knowledge of, of my future identity. This... This is quite a shock, Alan. But you do believe me, don't you? Yes, I suppose I must. You seem so strange as... As if you weren't my son. I'm your son, all right. The same body as yesterday. I've just had an educational shortcut. <clears throat> uh, wait a minute. If you can remember the next 30 years, suppose you tell me when the war is going to end. This one against the Japs, I mean. Sure. The Japanese surrender will be announced at exactly 7.01 p.m. on August 14th, the week from Tuesday. Better make sure we have plenty of grub in the house by then. Everything will be closed up tight till Thursday morning. Even the restaurants. I remember we had nothing to eat in the house but some scraps. Tuesday week? That's pretty sudden, isn't it? Not after today. What do you mean, what happened today? Plenty. Oh, what time is it, Dad? Uh, 11.16. Is your watch right? To the second, why? It'll come at exactly 11.17.40. What'll come? The radio announcement. What are you getting at? Something important on the radio? We'll see. Don't bother, Dad. It won't work. I remember we had a tube burned out. Yeah, there is something wrong. What is this announcement of yours? I memorized it in journalism school at Columbia in 1954. What time is it? Uh, 11.18. They're breaking into the programs now. President Truman has just announced that an atomic bomb has been dropped on the Japanese industrial city of Hiroshima. The bomb was dropped 16 hours ago, and the announcement was delayed to ascertain the results of the explosion. A man named John Howard Peterson read the announcement from the Washington newsroom of NBC. I... I don't believe it. No? Listen. That's the Burt Plate factory whistle and the bells at St. Boniface. Next, the whistle at the volunteer firehouse. And it's true. It is true. Sure. Then Larry Morton came by on his bicycle. Hey, hey, Alan, did you hear? Did you hear about the bomb? An atomic bomb. Yeah, we heard. Boy, atomic bomb. Oh, boy. I gotta go find my pop. He's on the golf course. Bye, Al. Bye, Mr. Hartman. You knew. You knew about it. The next bomb hits Nakasaki. I thought that stuff about atomic energy was so much fantasy. What? Was that the kind of bomb that got you? That was a firecracker compared to the one that got me. It was a guy in 98, exploded 10 miles away. And that's going to happen in 30 years? I remember it. How about, well, how about me? Oh, wait, never mind. I don't think I better know when I'm going to die. I couldn't tell you anyway. I had a letter from you just before I left for the front. You were 78 then, and you were still hunting and fishing and flying your own plane. But another war and fought on American soil. Alan, I wish this hadn't happened to you. It happened. I remember it. But if I can help it, I'm not going to get killed in any battle of Buffalo. But if you remember it, if time exists as a parallel dimension, then every kick we're getting closer to that Third World War. Dad... You know what I remember when Gutcho came to borrow that gun? Well, I suppose that you suspected him and warned me. No, no, that wasn't it. The other time, the first time when I was really 13. I wasn't home. I'd been swimming at the canoe club with Larry Morton. When I got home about half an hour from now, I found the house full of cops. What if the gun didn't fire? What makes you think it didn't? Gutcho talked the 38 out of you, went home... Shot his wife four times in the body, once behind the ear, and used a six shot to blow his own brains out. That's what you remember? Yes, but now it hasn't happened because I warned you. Dad, I found out the future can be changed. One man can't change the whole future. I stopped the murder and the suicide. I know, son, but... With 30 years to work, I can stop a world war. I'll have the means. The means? Unlimited wealth and influence. I've got a good memory, Dad. Wrote a list out this afternoon. Look at this. Assault, jet pilot, citation, ponder, middle ground, counter... What is this, code? Horses! That's a list of Kentucky Derby winners from 1946 to 1970. 
You sure? I learned that list on a bet at the officers' club in Cincinnati in 1971. Assault paid eight to one. You figure out what we can take in. Oh, but gambling, This son. isn't it. Gambling, it's a sure thing. When we get rolling, we'll make the Rockefellers look like pikers. Hmm. It's all at eight to one. I suppose I could scrape up $5,000. In ten years, that'll make uh, a lot of money. Any uh, other little thing you have in mind, Alan? By 1952, we start building a political organization here in Pennsylvania. In 1960, I think we can elect you president. Oh, of course, I... President? Is, isn't that going a little too far? Why not? Who wouldn't vote for a politician who was always right? Besides, that's one thing we've got to change. In 1960, we had a man in the White House who was good to his wife and sang a nice tenor. And that's about all. He fouled up so completely, we ended up at war. I think President Hartwell might be a little more trusted to take a strong line. But I don't know anything about international decisions. I do. I know all the wrong ones. If we can stop a murder, with time we can stop a war. How do I start? Well, as I remember, just after that bomb announcement, you got a phone call from the City Fusion Party about the next election. Well, there is a lot of talk about a reform ticket. That call is going to be important, Dad. It's the turning point. You've got... There it is. What, what do I do? Answer it. Go ahead. But, Alan, I... Don't worry. I'll tell you what to say. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, this is Blake Hartley. Judge Crimmins? Well, uh, uh, just, just a moment... Alan, he's asking me to run. Oh, oh, my head. Alan, Alan, what's the matter? Alan. Oh. He passed out. Alan, what do I do now? Alan, listen to me. Alan. Alan, what's the matter? Alan. Captain Hartley. Captain Hartley. Captain Hartley. It was all right, Doctor. I gave him a shot and he was all right. He's dead. All right, Sergeant, make up the tag. Yes, sir. Hartley, Allen, Captain. Dead August 8, 1975. Alan. Alan, what happened? Alan. Alan. Huh? Alan, are you all right? Hi, Dad. I've got Judge Crimmins on the phone. What do I tell him? What? Alan, are you all right? You passed out. Sure, I'm all right. Hey, today's my birthday, isn't it? What did you get me, Dad? Huh? What did you get me? Alan, are you all right? Sure, I'm okay. But what did you get for my birthday, huh? Don't you remember the, the Third World War? What Third World War? Gee, Dad, what's the matter? You're looking at me funny. Uh, Judge Crimmins, I'll, uh, I'll have to call you back. Goodbye. You don't remember. You're back again, aren't you? Back to 13 years old. Sure, I'm 13 today. For corn's sake, Dad. You must have died up there. It was only a mind transfer. That means now I'm on my own. I have to do it myself without your help. Help for what? Oh, if it's the grass, I, I said I'd cut it tomorrow. No, no, it isn't the grass. I've got to save your life, Alan. I can't let you die that way in 1975. What are you talking about, Dad? You sound goofy. I've got to change it all by myself. Change what? Uh, never mind, Alan. You don't know yet. Come on, let's have lunch. Sure, Dad. Hey, how about my present now? What did you get me for my birthday? Hey, in a minute, son. Uh, go on in. Hurry up, Dad. All right. Hmm. Now, where'd I put that list of horses? (laughs) 
You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. <laughs> Homecoming is a joyous word. But when the home you're returning to is a burned-out radioactive planet, and when you cannot even imagine what terrible changes you will find there, the word then takes on a very different meaning. Next week, Dimension X brings you a strange story called Dwellers in Silence. Dimension X is brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of the magazine Astounding Science Fiction. Today, Dimension X has presented Time and Time Again, written for radio by Ernest Canoy, and the story by H. Beam Piper. Featured in the cast were David Anderson as Alan and Joseph Curtin as his dad. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Dimension X is produced by William Welsh and directed by Fred Way. Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Buck Rogers is on the air, brought to you by the makers of Popsicle, Fudgicle, and Creamsicle, those delicious frozen confections on a stick. And now, a message from the famous fellow who won the contest for the typical American boy, Popsicle Pete. Say, kids, seems like everybody's saving bags from Popsicle, Creamsicle, and Fudgicle and getting the dandiest free gifts. Get a free gift list in your ice cream store. It's full of colored pictures of the presents. Everybody loves Popsicle, Creamsicle, and Fudgicle on the handy stick. Mmm, are they good. So pure, so delicious, so downright refreshing. Gee, you're making my mouth water. Now they're full of energy, too. And a great big one costs only five cents. The biggest nickel's worth I ever saw. And remember, everything that goes into these great big luscious confections is the freshest and the finest. The kind of ingredients Mother uses in her own kitchen. Eat popsicle, fudgicle, and creamsicle as often as you like. They help make you strong, but be sure you get the genuine. Look for the name Popsicle, Creamsicle, or Fudgicle printed on every bag. Save bags for free gifts every day. Save your gift list, too. It's got a coupon on it worth ten bags. Well, now with Kane and Ardella established in the headquarters at the ruins of ancient Philadelphia, with Black Barney under the influence of the psychic restriction ray, things promise to be pretty exciting. But let's first pick up Buck and Wilma aboard their rocket plane as it roars along on its way to Dr. Hewer's laboratory in Niagara. Here we go. Five hundred years into the future. Oh, gun it, Wilma. I certainly wish I knew why Dr. Hewer insisted we turn around and fly back to his laboratory this way. I know it, Buck. Just when we were beginning to get somewhere in our hunt for Black Barney. Right. That was a good, strong rocket trail we were following, too. And there was no question about it being his. Unless Killer Kane took that ship away from him. Wilma, that's a greater possibility than I care to admit. Yes, sir, you'll never convince me that Barney had run off with an experimental ship that way unless somebody forced him into it. And who could it be but Killer Kane? Right. And that's why I hated to leave the hot rocket trail we were following. Dr. Hewer knew we were on that trail, didn't he? Sure. I had Central Radio Bureau tell him we were. Then he must have something mighty important up his sleeve to make us turn back this way. Yeah, well, we'll be at his laboratory in a couple of minutes now and find out what it's all about. Buck. Yeah? Send out radio to him. Plenty of time to do it before we land. Uh, sure. Here, you take over the controls while I do it, will you please? Surely. Only you'd better keep cutting down on the power or we'll fly on by Niagara before we know it. Hey, I should say so. Do you know how fast we're traveling? How fast? A little over 1,200 miles an hour. Phew. That is stepping along, isn't it? You bet it is. Out in space with no air friction to heat up the hull or slow us down... It would be like crawling along. Down here, within the atmosphere, it's going some. Yeah. Well, you take care of navigation while I make this call. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do is cut down the power. 
there. Calling V-121. Buck Rogers calling V-121. Of course, he may not have got back to his laboratory yet, Buck. Central Radio Bureau said he had just started when we talked to them. Well, calling V-121. Hello, Buck. Did you get my message through Central Radio? Why, yes, Doctor. And we're on our way into you now. Good. Well, then why are you calling? Oh, just to find out what this is all about. We were hot on Barney's rocket trail yes, and... Yes, uh, yes, I know, Buck. Well, yes, sir, and that trail was so fresh, the gas analyzer pointers were fairly popping off the dial. Uh, Buck, I have an idea that finding Barney is going to be far more difficult than simply following up his rocket trail. Sure, Doctor, but it's the first thing for us to do in any case. No. So the first thing for you to do is come back here to my laboratory. But why, sir? Tell you when you get back here. Now, come along. Okay. We'll be there in a minute. Signing off. Signing off. In a minute is right. Want to take over the controls? Yeah, thanks. We can start coasting to a landing in about two shakes. Well, take it easy. This ship isn't equipped with the gyrocosmic relativator, you know. I wish it was. Poor old Barney and Willie thought they were doing us a favor when they took off on the ship that was equipped with one. And right now, it'd be mighty handy to have it aboard here. Well, here we are. Yep. Hang on for landing. Now, let's go. Right with you. Oh, hello, Doctor. Here we are. Oh, come right in here, you two. Right, sir. Your radio call held me up a bit, but I'm finished with this thing in a minute. Oh, doctor, it's the gyrocosmic relativator. Don't tell me Black Barney and Willie came back here. Yes, doctor, when did they bring it back? They didn't. This is a brand new one. Oh, I thought it'd take weeks to put one of these things together, and that you'd need impenetrate from Pluto. Well, I used a few scraps so I was able to salvage in the main power room of the Central Radio Bureau. Yeah. I've been spending every minute working on this. Well, I'm beginning to see the light. You had us come back here so so we could install this on our ship before continuing the search for Barney and Willie. Exactly. As long as his ship is so equipped, yours must be too. And Buck... Yeah? I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm of the opinion that Kane and Ardela must have something to do with the disappearance of Barney and Willie. We certainly agree with you on that. Yes. There, now. But great day. You must have done some fast work on this thing. Yes. And under a real handicap in the limited amount of impenetrate at my disposal. What about the reports of impenetrate ore out near the city of Omaha? Yeah, I've heard about that too, Doctor. Yes, but the ore is so poor that an entirely new means of reduction must be developed to really make it worthwhile. Worth investigating, though. Well, I'm going to look into it at the very first opportunity. Meanwhile, our only sure source is the far-off planet Pluto. Hmm. We can't very well afford to lose this elevator, then, can we? No, sir. But uh, is there anything I can do to help you there? I'll fit the photoelectric cell unit into place, will you please? Yeah, sure. Uh, goes right in front of this gear system unit, doesn't it? That's right. You'll have to use the power vice to fit them together. Okay. But uh, how about fastening them? Well, molecular tension will take care of that because of the extreme care with which they've been machined. Go right ahead and put them into the vice. Yes, sir. Help you carry, Buck? No, thanks. I can make it. Be sure the sections are accurately lined up before you try to fit them. Yeah, they're in perfect alignment. And here goes the vice that'll make the gyrocosmic relativator that'll help run down Kane and Ardella. Well, Barney, how do you feel now? The psychic restriction ray isn't so bad, is it? It's marvelous, Chief. Uh, just leave it on for a couple of hours or two more, will you? <laughs> Sounds to me as though we've had plenty, Kay. Right, Adela. You can hand it off. All right. All right. Get up now, Barney. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> I certainly appreciate your letting me get exposed to it. Yeah. Then perhaps you can be of some help to us now, eh? Well, I'll try awful hard, Chief. That's the stuff. What we ought to do, Adela is get hold of Rogers and put him under the psychic restriction ray. Not a bad idea. Dumb as he is, I think he might really be of some use to us. Well, uh... Well? From now on, we've got to take it easy and carefully plan everything we're going to do. Uh, now, Bonnie. Huh? Uh, yeah, Chief? Go out to where we buried the rocket ship that has the gyrocosmic relativator on it. Okay. Uh, take along a non-recoil energy projector so you can push the dirt and rocks away from the door of it and get aboard. And then what? Then take out the radio and bring it in here. But be sure you leave the path to the door of that rocket ship clear. How come? I want that ship to be ready for immediate takeoff, just as soon as it gets dark. Okay, Chief, I'll do it right away. Uh, only, uh, 
How about uh, bringing the ship up out of its hole onto the level ground? Not much. That would leave it in plain sight of anybody who might be flying around looking for us. Oh, yes. Hmm, having that natural waterfall out there to cover up the entrance to this headquarters is a real help. Yes. And right here in this old laboratory of Professor, Professor Smith's, we have all the scientific apparatus we could possibly want, Adela. Our setup is perfect. Well, what are we going to do with it? Before anything else, Adela, we must send Barney out after supplies and equipment. Whoa there, Kane. Wouldn't it be much safer for you to go? Not by a long shot. The minute anyone in this country saw me on the loose, every radio in America would start buzzing. But Barney's all right. People are used to seeing him around, and no matter what he might be doing, nobody would try to interfere with him. Yeah, I guess you're right. Of course I am. The only thing he'll have to do is stay clear of Niagara where they know he's missing. Yeah, so far as that's concerned, though, they probably know he's disappeared in every city of the country. Ah, oh, Dale, uh, you seem to forget that our friend Barney is Prime Minister of Mars in his spare time. They wouldn't dare broadcast news of his disappearance in this day and age. Okay. What are you going to have him do? Go into a bunch of small towns and pick up all the weapons he can find. And bring us a good, fast space cruiser. What would he do with the ship we have now? Bring it along, too. It's equipped with magnetic grapples, isn't it? Yeah. Then all he needs to do is pick out a likely-looking battle cruiser, clamp onto it with the grapples, and bring it back here. How about the chances of his rocket trail being picked up? No chance. That ship carries a rocket dampener, which I hooked in. It leaves such a faint trail that the wind will blow it away within a few minutes. Isn't as though he were flying out in space, you know, where there's no wind and a rocket trail stays put. Okay, but don't you think this business of taking a lot of weapons from small towns is dangerous? Suppose somebody sees him taking them and gets suspicious. Then all he needs to do is doff his flying helmet, look official, and pass some remark about being hot on the trail of Killer Kane and Ardella. And what about the chances of Barney's trying to double-cross us? Don't worry. The psychic restriction ray has taken care of that. Well, here he is now. And <laughs> look at him. What happened to you, Barney? Uh, I'm all right, Miss Ardella. Only I got kind of wet coming through the falls. Oh, why didn't you use a force ray to push the water aside? On account of I had to use both hands to carry this radio. Uh, here you are. You get that wet, too? Yeah, Chief. I guess maybe it did a little. And we'll have to wait for it to dry out. Uh, maybe it'll work anyway. I'll plug it in and see. All right. Now, Barney. Yeah? Just as soon as it gets dark, I want you to go out and get us a lot of equipment from the small towns that lie to the west of us. Sure, Chief. Only, what, wouldn't it be a good idea if I was to take along some atomic bombs with me? Atomic bombs? Sure. To blow up the municipal storehouse where I, I'm going to get the stuff. No, no, Barney. This is one time you'll have to go about it very quietly and unobtrusively. Yeah, very unobtrusively. Huh? Now, listen carefully, and I'll tell you what you're to get. For transportation, of course, you can use the rocket plane. That's equipped with these guys. Oh, Barney, what are you are, Doctor. The photoelectric cell unit is in. Fine, Doc. Bring it over here, and we'll complete assembly of this gyrocosmic run of the Veda. All right, sir. There you are. Will this be as good as the one on the ship Barney took away? It's exactly the same, Wilma. With it, you'll be able to take off and immediately be going at tremendous speed without any loss of time for pickup. And tell I can, but where? Fasten the power terminal line, Buck, and it'll be all finished. Okay. There you are. Good. Now, it's all ready to be put aboard your space cruiser. Well, then, let's go. I want to get back on Barney's rocket trail before the wind blows it away. Right. Coming with us, Doctor? No, well, I'm afraid not. I'm, I'm very anxious to investigate the possible supply of impenetrite ore near Omaha just as quickly as I can. Which will mean more of these relativators. I hope so. You want to open the door for me, please, Wilma, so I can carry this one out to the ship? Surely, Buck. Uh, perhaps I'd better go out there with you to make sure you get it installed properly. I wish you would, Doctor. There you are, Buck. Thanks. Oh, look. What? Well, yes. It's coming right down here. But, but... so fast. Who's at the controls? Whoever it is, he's going to crack up. Then look out, look out. Get back, Wilma. Here he comes. Here he comes. Well, I wonder who and what under the sun that was. But I certainly hope none of our friends got hurt. Fellas and girls, if you'd like a real treat, a wonderful treat, get yourself a creamsicle on a handy stick. Does that hit the spot? A great big chunk of delicious ice cream covered with chocolate fudge or pure fruit flavors. What a nickel's worth. Nourishing, cooling, and made fresh every day in only the best, sunny, inviting ice cream plants. Remember... 
Whether you buy creamsicle, popsicle, or fudgicle, be sure they're genuine. Look for the U.S. registered trademark name printed right on the bag. Kids, save those bags. Get swell free gifts. Skets, skates, table tennis, a sleeping doll, a wristwatch. Gee, everything you always wanted. But start right away. Because the more bags you save, the better presents you get. of visitors to the World's Fair have watched a giant computer register the increase in the Earth's population minute by minute. Somehow it scares you a little, doesn't it? Why? Listen to The Last Land Rush on Theater 5. Presents the Last Land Run. Attention, all citizens. Attention, all citizens. To do its part in alleviating the ever expanding population explosion, the Department of Public Resources is pleased to announce that all grass divider strips on all public highways, parkways, and flyways will be thrown open to private ownership. In keeping with the traditions and spirit that made this country great, the means of acquisition will follow the rules and regulations laid down over 100 years ago during the great Oklahoma land rush. On the 31st day of this month, all interested citizens will line the edge of the highways and wait for the starting gun. Any citizen can own any area he can stake and hold from noon of that day to noon of the following day. Further details will be announced over the system as they develop. This is a progress report in keeping with our policy of building a better world through communication and understanding. Yes. Sue. Sue, did you hear the news? No, what is it? They're going to throw the parkway dividers open to private ownership. Oh, that, yes, I heard. Don't you see what this means to us? We can have a place of our own. I don't see how we could... All we have to do is stake out a piece of ground and hold it for 24 hours. Then it's our land to build on or to do what we want. But we don't have any money to build. You know that. We don't have to have any money. All we need is the land. One of the big real estate development agencies will lease the land from us and incorporate it into a development called Inner Highway Apartments or something like that. They can build as high as they like and, and tunnel under the highways. With the price of land as high as it is these days, well, the money they pay will keep us the rest of our lives. We can retire. Oh, Ross, I don't want to retire. All I want is a place we can call our own. A place where we can live together in privacy and raise a family. Once we have the land, we can do that, too. We can make a deal that we have an apartment for ourselves as, as a part of the payment. We can still live on what's left over. But I thought we might take the money and move someplace else. Where? Oh, I don't know. They're building new developments in the Arctic Circle. Oh, but that's so far from everything. It would be cleaner and less crowded up there. In those cities under glass, there aren't half so many people per square foot as here. But it would be so expensive to shuttle back and forth to see the folks. And everything we want is right here. The, the museum, the, the opera. They have and... museums and opera up there. But it isn't the same. It isn't New York. We're only an hour away from everything on the express tubes. New York, Washington, Detroit. That's why land in this area is going to go so high. I understand people are coming in from as far away as South America. Oh, please, Ross, can't we stay here? Uh, we'll decide that later, but uh, first we have to get the land. Uh, where are you going? I've got to see a man about some equipment. Oh, wait, wait. But aren't we going to have lunch? There isn't time. The big land grab will be at the end of the month. We've got to be ready now. Where are you going? I'll see you back at the office. But I fixed lunch. I, I even got this place for us to sit down. <laughs> What for? Shh. 
I'll explain it to you when we get there. Just get dressed quietly. We're going to lock this so nobody will disturb us. Ross, what have you got under that blanket? Check to see if anybody's up here. Okay. Move along. There's a family sleeping over there. Well, I'm afraid this is as private as it is it's going to get. Let's move over to the other side of the room. Oh, Ross, they have nothing over them or anything. What is it, Wayne? They're probably just here for the land grab. They don't intend to stay. Oh, and did you see that family on the second landing of the stairs? That baby looked half starved to death. Sue, you can't think about that. There's too many people. This should be good enough. What are you doing? Tying a rope to this nail. But what for? We're going to make a lot of noise up here, and I want to get rid of the evidence as quickly as possible. The end of this rope just reaches down to our bedroom window. Now, what do you have in this blanket? Open it and see. All right. I still don't understand. What are these? Submachine guns. What? Submachine guns. They used to use them years ago during the early 1900s. I still don't understand. Getting across the superhighway will only be half the problem. Staking out the land and holding it will be the other half. According to the rules and regulations, you can't use any modern-day weapons. But you can use anything made before the Second World War to protect your claim. Oh. I got these from an antique shop owner I know. But what are we going to do with them? They're a very effective weapon against a large number of people at close range. But they're difficult to hold on target. We'll have to practice firing them so they won't fly out of our hands the first time we fire. You mean me? Why? I'm sorry, Sue. The day they give that parkway land away is not going to be pretty. You're going to have to get used to that. Oh, Ross, I... I don't think I could... I could kill anybody. Sue, listen to me. Once we get across that parkway to the grass divider, I'll have to stake out the ground. Now, I could be rushed from behind, and you'll have to be ready to defend me. All right, Ross, I'll try. Now, how do you hold it? Ow. Ooh. First of all, you've got to remember to bear down on it as you fire. Okay. It bucks up and Ooh. it'll spray bullets in the air if you don't bear down. Like this? No. It's so heavy. Now, hold the butt of the gun close into your waist like this. Okay. Now, aim at the skylight on the next building. I'll try. We'll fire one of us together and then throw the guns over yeah. the side. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes. Now, don't forget to pull down hard on the forward grip. Okay. Okay, let's go. Quick, over the side. Hey. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Huh? Quick, over the side. What's the time? I don't know, I... Uh... I never heard anything like it before. It sounded to me like it came from the other building. Well, what was it, Charlie? Oh, somebody set up a commotion next yeah. door. Hi, children. Now, it's all right. I wonder what it was. I never heard anything like it before. Well, neither have I. It sounded like an explosion of some kind. Well, I guess everything's all right. Good night. You think people will have a little more consideration? Hey, you think they would, wouldn't you? Good girl, Susie. You hit your target. <laughs> Before. Hold my hand so we don't get separated. All right. Where do you think they all came from? All over. Canada, Bolivia, Houston. Look, look, look. There's a man from our building. Yeah, most of them are from right around here. Oh. There are enough people right in this area to populate the grass divider strips a hundred hey, times over. Watch where you're going, will you? Oh, sorry. Oh, don't you see when people are at work? What is that, a tunnel? Oh, it just looks like a spaceship. Well, the rules and regulations say you're not allowed to tunnel under the highway. You're supposed to cross over the surface. We'll worry about the rules and regulations once we get across the parkway to that dividing strip there in the Senate. When you get your piece of land, nobody's going to ask you how you got it. Uh, how much would you charge to let us use it? Ah, uh, forget it. Me and my buddies built this, and we're the only ones going to use it. Now move out of here, will you? You're kicking sand in a hole. This way, sir. Uh, aren't we going to try and get closer to the edge of the highway? No, we want to we stand back on this rise. But Ross, why? You'll see, you'll see. The machine gun is heavy. Keep it covered. We don't want anybody trying to take it away from us before we need it. I'm sorry. All citizens, attention, all citizens. 
it has been decided by the Committee on Rules and Regulations that traffic will not be stopped in the supersonic lane. Oh, wow. Drivers will proceed at their own risk. I, thought I so. repeat, traffic will not be stopped in the supersonic lane. Do they realize what they're doing? Of course they do. All over the country. People are going to try and cross the highways at the same time. Why, more people will be killed today than in all the wars that ever were. That's the point of the whole thing. Open up what little land is left, a little, and relieve the population pressure at the same time. Attention. Attention, all citizens wishing to synchronize their watches with the atomic clock at Greenwich. The time is now 11.52 and three seconds. The countdown will start at 11.59 and 45 seconds. The signal gun will be fired at 12 noon. No citizen will attempt to cross the highways before that time. Any contestant attempting to do so will be destroyed by the highway controls. Thank you. Okay, come on, let's, uh, let's move back this way. Away from the highway? We'll be the last ones across. Well, the first ones will be hit by cars. Well, we'll wait until enough of them are out there to stop traffic. Then we won't have, have to worry about that. Uh, this should be good now. You are going to cross to the big land grab, lady? What? Oh, yes. So let's move on. I thought so with all that fancy equipment you got on. And boots and knapsacks. And all. Oh, are, are you going across? If we can. Originally, my husband and me was going, but we got separated in the crowd. Now it's just me and the kids. Sue, I think we ought to move over here further. I guess we'll try and get across and maybe hold on to something. Maybe if we get a piece of land, he'll find us. It's going to be tough. The two kids and a baby. Sue, come on. Well, uh, I, I wish you luck. Same to you, lady. Ross, why did you pull me away like that for? Because you can't afford to get involved with any of these people. And why not? Because once we get to the highway island, it will be everyone for himself. Stay right on the edge of the highway. All contestants must stay off the highway until the starting gun is sounded. Violators will be destroyed. It is now 45 seconds before the hour. We will start the countdown in exactly 30 seconds. Remember, you must stake your claim in the prescribed manner with ropes and stakes and hold it against all comers until noontime tomorrow. Please stay back of the curb until you hear the gun. Stay back until you hear the gun fire. 15 seconds. 14, 13, 12, stay back of the line, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Nobody's moving. They're all afraid. Oh, it feels like the calm before the storm. Something's got to be done to start them off. All right, everybody. There's the land. Let's go. Stay back, Sue. Let's go! Look, they started. Come on, Sue. The cars are starting to pile up. Hold oh, my hands. What are we doing to each other? The bridge of wrecks this way. Come on, we'll head for the high ground. Hold on and keep running. Where, where are we going? That patch of ground up ahead. Oh, listen, we'll never get there in time. If I can stake it, we oh, can hold it. No. Get your machine gun out. Oh, I can't. I don't want to get. You have to. You have no. to keep them off me while I stake the ground. Ross, I can't. You have to, Sue. You have to. Get your gun out and hold them off. I can't protect myself and stake at the same time. Look, they're coming up the hill. Fire into them. Scare them back. Sue, you have to. I can't. I can't. I've only got two more stakes to go. Fire, Sue, fire! Ross? How many people do you think we killed today? I don't know. One hundred? Two? Sue, don't think. 
think about it. <laughs> Try and get some sleep. I'll keep the fire going. All right. You'll need to be fresh for tomorrow. Hello there. Who's there? Hello. You there by the fire. Ross, it's the woman we saw on the other side of the highway. Stay on the other side of the road. I seen your fire and I wondered if I might come over a minute and need some water on it. My baby's sick. And I thought something warm might comfort him. No, go away. We've got nothing here for you. Oh, Ross, we can let her come in just to warm up something for the baby. No, if we do that, she'll stay until tomorrow. Oh, if she's here when the gun goes off tomorrow at noon, she'll own as much of this property as we do. Oh, please, let me near the fire. This baby's awful sick. Stay back on the road or I'll shoot. Oh, please let her in, Ross, for the baby. Well, suppose she doesn't leave when you want her to. I'll handle it. Well, all right, but I don't like it. If we let you come near the fire, will you leave when we ask you to? Oh, yes, lady, yes. All I want is to get this baby warmed up. Hey, didn't I talk to you on the other side? Yes. Yes, you did. You two did pretty good for yourselves. What happened to the other children? Didn't you have two more? I lost them in the crossing. I told them to hang on to me, but they couldn't. Huh? Couldn't be helped. Maybe they'll turn up. Guess I could count myself lucky to be alive. Here, do you want me to take the baby? Oh, no, he's sleeping now. I guess he'll be all right now. Maybe if I could just lay down for a minute. I'm so tired. Sue. Oh, that's all right, mister. I know the rules as well as you do. I, I don't intend to stay past the time when the gun goes off. If you just let me lay down for a little while here... Of course it would be all right, huh? You just get some sleep and we'll wake you when it's time to go. Uh, sure was good of you people to fix me breakfast and all. I, I never really meant to stay this long. Oh, that's all right. Oh, I really appreciate it. I just want you to know that. All land oh. claimants. Attention, all land claimants. It is now 11.58. The noon bell will sound in exactly two minutes. The new land will legally become the property of those who have successfully homesteaded the highway dividing island. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea it was so late. I better be going or we'll wind up sharing ownership of this piece of ground. Here, let, let me help you. Oh, all right. Mister, if you'd just hold the baby a minute while I tie my show. <laughs> You look out if you don't want to see your boyfriend cut in two with his machine. Stand back, you two. I know how to use this thing. I watched you all day yesterday, and I'm not afraid to use it either. Mister, put that baby down. You have no right to do that. Nobody has a right to anything for what they take. You've been very kind to me, so I'm not going to kill you, but get off my property before noon comes. Shoot her, Sue. She can't do that. Shoot the mother of a child? Never. She's much too uncivilized for that. She's a throwback to a different time, a different way of life. She won't shoot me, but I will shoot the two of you if you don't get off my property. The time is now 11.59 and 15 seconds. The countdown will start in exactly 15 seconds. Sue, so you've got to shoot her. We'll lose everything we've worked for, everything we've dreamed of. You think you're the only one who worked and planned and dreamed? You think I want to go back to that grasping, struggling, screaming mob any more than you do? Get to the countdown. 30, 29, 28, Get off 27. my property. Well, don't just stand there. Shoot it. You heard me. I said move. 21, 20, 19, 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, I don't want to kill the two of you. 16, but, but I will if you don't move. Sue, don't be a coward. Move. Shoot. I can't. I can't. If you're not on the other side of our rope by the time he reaches five, I'll kill the both of you. Sue, for heaven's sake. I, I, I... Congratulations, new land owners. A government surveyor will visit your area to register your claim. Please be patient until he reaches. Well, Sue, we won. Yes. We're landowners now, aren't we? Yes. How does it feel? Lonely. Well, very lonely.
has presented The Last Land Rush, written by George Bamber and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Dwight Weiss, Wayne Tippett, Rosemary Rice, Sam Raskin, Fran Carlin, and Cecil Roy. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Terry Ross. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, very funny, very funny. Take it over, boy. Tomorrow the old ball and chain. Yeah. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you commit matrimony. <laughs> now, come on, now, look. Oh, come on. We came down here to Scully Square to have a little fun. We might as well be at my mother's music hall in Beacon Street. <laughs> oh, the problems of the rich. <laughs> Uh, tell me, Jeff, just where does the coffin fortune come from? Pirate treasure? No, no, I guess it started in Nantucket, my... Great, great something or other used to be a whaler. A whaler, <laughs> thus she blows. A dead whale or a stove boat, watch my trusty harpoon. <laughs> oh, hey, 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 well, look out for the porn. Um, uh, and where's the money now? Oh, I don't know. We've got a lot of commercial holdings, mills, import, export outfits, rocket lines, you know. Mere trivia. <laughs> All right, now look, why don't we get out of this dump? We go up to the Copley Plaza. It may be stuffy, but at least the glasses are clean. Well, you're the condemned man. All right, you two go ahead and get in the car. I'll settle. All right, meet you out in front. Right. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you want something, bud? Yeah, the check. Okay, okay. Hey, Milton, check. He'll be right out. Right, thank you. Hello, mate. Nice night, eh? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. I've been watching you. Celebrating? Sort of. And so am I. Just got off a deep space run out to Centaurus. Oh, that's a 15-year run, isn't it? Fifteen and three blooming months. Mm -hmm. How'd you know? You a spaceman? No, no, not exactly. Uh, where's that check, barkeep? Hang on to your hat, bud. Milton's slow, but he's sure... Uh, fill it up, Charlie. <laughs> Say, why don't you join me, mighty? Here, Charlie. Oh, oh no, uh, no, no, thank you. Oh, come on, won't take off him, oh. Well... Celebrate whatever it is you're celebrating on me. Pour it, Charlie. Okay. Well, all right, thank you. I guess I might as well. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, right, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was that, Marty? <laughs> Charlie speaks with bread, <laughs> eh, Charlie? Yeah. Well, oh, say, look, Charlie, would you get that uh, waiter out here? I've got to meet him. I, uh... Hey, what's your hurry, mate? you got plenty of time. Uh, well... Sure. Sit down. Take huh? it easy. You don't look so good. No, no, I, I don't feel uh, so good. Uh, yeah, now, sit right here. You feel chipper as a blooming grasshopper in a well, sec. Uh, no, I, I've got to get outside. The car's in a hurry. I'm... Where, where, where's the check? The check? Uh, oh. On your feet, wakey, wakey, wakey. Uh, oh, all oh, right, let go of me. What's the idea? Uh, rise oh. and shine and greet the dawn. What? Where am I? What's going on here? Oh, come on now, matey, up in there. Wakey, wakey, wakey. Wait, 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 wait. No, wait a minute. So you were at that bar, Scully Square. Come on now, up on deck or you'll be in trouble. Deck? 
What are you talking about? Where am I? It's hard to say exactly. Offhand, about eight hours out of Atlantic Spaceport. Atlantic Spaceport? Now, look, what kind of a joke is this? If, if Alan and Peter think this is funny... What what uh, what ship is this? R.S. Michael M. Rafferty, coffin line. Oh, coffin line. Well, that makes it easy. Now, you've got to put back to port. Hey, forget your toothbrush, Bank. No, 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 listen, you. Run, you take me hey, to the captain hey, or I'll tell you, you hey, a Hey, I'll let go my jacket. All right, get moving. Sure, sure, my dear. I'll take you to the captain. But you're going to be sorry. Morton, what the devil are you doing on the bridge? Get below before right away, I... sir. Only this here gentleman asked to see you. Yeah, that's right, uh, Captain. There's been a mistake made. I'm afraid it was supposed to be a joke. Oh? Yes, you see, I'm going to be married today, and I suppose the boys thought it'd be funny to make me miss the ceremony. I'm sure it won't be too much trouble to have you drop me off back at the Atlantic Spaceport. What? Morton, what is this? Well, it's simple, Captain. He wants you to turn the ship around, that's all. Now, look, if there's any uh, trouble with your superior, I'm sure I can fix it up. You see, I'm Jeff Coffin. Yeah? Well, you don't understand. My father is Cyrus Coffin. He owns this ship. Oh, he does, huh? Morton, get this drunk along. Now, just a minute. I can understand you're not believing me, but I can identify him. My... Hey, where's my wallet? I've been robbed. Oh, now, look, Captain. Wait a minute. All you have to do is radio back and check. Mr. Black, remove this man from the bridge. Yes, but... Hi, sir. You heard the captain, Buster. Oh, no, wait a minute. Let go of me. This is no way to treat a passenger. Passenger? Huh. Wake up, sonny boy. You're one of the crew. Now get below. All right now, mate. Grab yourself a buffer. Get to work on those deck plates. No, they can't get away with this. This is kidnapping. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Now get this here deck nice and shiny and we might even see about some grub. I'll be back in two hours. And mind you, I want to be able to see me blooming reflection in it. You better polish that deck plate. You can't get away with this. Well, the law says once you sign on, you're under absolute orders. I looked it up. Yeah, but I didn't sign on. I was kidnapped. You won't be able to prove it. Come on, mister, please. I didn't get anything to eat yet today, so give me a break, huh? All right. What do you do, run the buffer over it? Yeah, that's right. Like this. You sign on? Yeah, I ran away from home. How old are you? Sixteen. Thirty when we get back. Yeah. What do you mean, thirty? We're headed for Mars, aren't we? Only to refuel. We're outbound to Centaurus. Oh, no, it can't be. <laughs> well, that's a fifteen-year run. Morton! I've got to get back. It's no use. I'm getting married. My bride-to-be will think I'm dead. Martin! What? A WhatsApp here. You want me to call Mr. Black again? He'll give you what listen, for. Listen, listen to me, Morton. Listen, I've got to get back to Earth. I can't disappear for 15 years. Oh, is that a fact? Look, we stop at Mars, right? Yes, and you'll be below decks under lock and cage. Listen to me. If I can make it worth your while, if, will you get me off at Marsport? <laughs> Jump and shiver. That's real naughty, mate. One thousand dollars? Why, what would I tell me poor old mother in yeah. better say? Two thousand. Five in advance. What do you mean, in advance? You're probably the one that rolled me for my wallet. I'll find a way. They don't believe your young coffin, but uh, maybe I know better. All right, it's a deal. Look, Mr. Coffin, can you take me with you? I didn't realize what it would be like. I, I can pay my share. I, I I could work it out for you, or maybe borrow money. I, I, I couldn't stand 15 years. I'd go crazy. All right, all right, sure. What about it, Morton? Oil costs you another thousand. You cheap swing. Here now, Mr. Coffin. I'm all what stands between you and a lovely pleasure cruise for 15 years. So I'll thank you to treat me with a respect and politeness what a gentleman like myself deserves. Stand by. Stand by for landing procedure. All right, now. Listen careful. This is the cable locker for the grappling anchor. Right. When she lands, this hatch will open. Cables go out. Don't get yourself caught in them. You'll be tore apart. All right, we've got that. Are you sure we can get out? Now, you just do what I say. When we drop down to the blast pit, nobody will be there. 
I lie in the pit till dark. Got that? Right. And look, Morton, I'll tell the patrol you helped us get away. That'll help you when they catch up with this gang. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. I've got to get to my station now. Luck. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Morton. Well, there's a landing horn. Now, keep clear of that cable, Joey. Here we go. Hold on tight. There goes the grappling cable. Yeah. All right, come on. Drop through the hatch. It's about six feet. All right, it's clear. Hurry up. Here I come. You all right? I twisted my ankle. It's all right. All right, that's the blast pit. Get going. All right. All right, so far, the ship hides us. Here's the pit. All right, now get down so they can't see you. Wait a minute. I hear somebody coming. Keep still. Maybe we better look. Look, if we stick our heads up over the edge, they'll see us short. Now keep down and keep still. I hear it. Shh. Well, well, well. Look what we have here. Two little babes in the wood. Now, you two move, and I'll shoot you in the belly. Morton, you got good eyes. I told you I saw him coming this way, Mr. Black. Jumping ship. My, that's a terrible thing to do. Mr. Black, inform the ship's company that these two men have been found guilty of attempted desertion. Desertion? You kidnapped me, you dirty crook. Don't you talk to Captain Howell that way. I'm sentencing them to 24 hours hull watch. Take them away. Morton, take them to the aft lock. Aye, sir. Calm down after 24 hours hull watch. What's hull watch? Very simple. We put you two in spacesuits, shove you through the airlock on the end of a line. You sit out there and watch the hull for 24 hours. No food, no water... And the eating units in those suits are just a little bit defective. Makes it interesting along about the 18th hour. Yeah, I'll bet. Here we are, gentlemen. The airlock. You get in there. Got five minutes to get into them suits before we blow the air out. See you in 24 hours. Maybe. Welcome back to our little home. Water. Water. Thirsty, eh? You should control these animals' yeah. instincts. Get water. Right, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slopping like a bloody head. Joy. Joy passed out. Help him. He'll be all right. Teach a lesson, both of you. Take my advice and behave yourself. You've got 15 years to go on this here ship. You might as well make the best of it. Hey, Martin! What do you call this mess? That's your supper, mighty food concentrates. What's the idea? Only two months out and on concentrates already? You complaining, right? Yeah, I'm complaining. If Captain Howell's chiseling on the manifest, that's his business. But when he tries to take it out in our house... You keep quiet or I'll turn you into Mr. Black. Concentrate is what you get to eat from your own head. Now shove it into your face and keep quiet. Suppose I shove it into your face and see how you like it. What's going on in here? What's going on in here? What's going on? He Morton. struck me. He struck me, Arch. What? 48 hours hull watch. Oh, all right, what are you all looking at? Get back into your places. Morton, bring that man down to the aft airlock. It's murder. That's what. Plain murder. Space code gives a 30-hour limit for punishment. They didn't even have a burial. Just shoved them out the lock. Well, it 
the owners knew about this, they'd stop it. A uh, fat lot of good that's going to do us during the next 15 years. Yeah, Wait a minute, if we could get the ship back to Mars. No, two weeks after we landed, we'd be hung. That's what space code says about mutiny. And if they catch you in the act, they shoot you down and no questions. All right, I'm willing to take that yeah. chance. We're going to let Black and Howell kick us around for 15 years? Why don't we take over and head back? Right. I'm for right. it. Let's go. You bet. Yeah. Come in. Go interrupt something, gentlemen. Discussion. Talking about the captain, maybe. Grab him. Yeah, because get get up. Up. Slug him. Slug him. Come on. Oh, have you all out of the island shifts? Or see your knife rations. That's what I'll... Yeah, show him my oil rag, Morton. Well, that's done it. He's an officer. Who cares? Yeah, we've got to move now. Joey? Yeah? You get up to the radio room and smash the set before they can get a message out. Right. Pop, you get aft. Tell the engine watch. Yes. The rest of us will go up in the bridge. How about this, Rat? Tie him up. Speed counts now. We've got to take over before they know what hit him. All right, careful. We've got to surprise him. Don't worry. We'll get him cold. Jeff, shh, quiet. The sparks were sending when I got in, but I knocked them out and smashed the set. We're okay. Good boy. All right, come on. Right past the bulkhead. Look out! The blast bulkhead. Yeah, we're cut off from the bridge. We'll never get through that. Yeah, they must have found out somehow. The intercom. Black can turn it on from the bridge. You heard the whole thing. Well, we better get out of here. What'll they do? I don't know. We got all the controls up there. We can shut down the driver, but we can't steer. Yeah. We better dog down the hatch behind us. All right, men. Captain Howell's giving you one minute to give up quiet. In a pig's eye, Black! You'll hang for a mutiny, every one of you. What do we do now? Quiet. They can hear everything on the intercom. Not if I pull the jack out. That's the boy. Yeah. Look, we've got to get through to the bridge. It's a Mexican standoff. We can't get at them. They can't get at us. Yeah. What's that? It's an air leak. The pressure's down. It's Howell. He blew the hatch on the mess hall section. Just opened her up and let the air out. Morton, do you know what Black's going to do? He's going to bleed off the air down here. Save you all right. If I had my way, I'd see you all out on the hull till you froze stiff. You're forgetting something, Morton. You're back here with us. What do you mean? If Black and Howell blow out compartments one by one or bleed the air off, you'll get it too. <laughs> They'll take care of me. Don't you worry about that. Oh, you think so, huh? Joey? Yeah. Plug that intercom back in. Right. Captain? Captain? Give me up. We've got Morton back here. Yeah? If you try anything on us, he'll get it, too. What am I supposed to do, cry? You don't care if he dies? That's his problem. We're going to drop the oxygen level 5%. Don't do that to me. Captain, Captain! It's unfortunate that you were captured, Morton, but the security of my ship comes first. You mean you don't care? You'd see me dead. Precisely. Well, you can't. It's murder, that's what. I'm not one of them. You can't kill me, you can't. Joey, pull the intercom plug. All right, there you are, Morton. They'd kill you just as soon as look at you. Now listen, we've got to get through that bulkhead. You know this ship. There must be some way. Morton, we're your only chance. Get us through the bulkhead. All right. All right, why shouldn't I? They'd kill me. Well, then there is a way to get through. An emergency release. Uh -huh. They don't tell crewmen about it to keep them from breaking through in an engine blast and leaking radiation to the bridge. Well, then let's get going. We've got to get through that bulkhead before Howell cuts the air down and gets us all. Here's the bulkhead, Morgan. Where's the release? Under the floor panel. You can pry it up. All right, hurry. I got it, I got it. She's up. Wax on a K. Ready? All right, Morton. Open it up. Here goes. Morton! He's dead. Electrocuted and the bulkhead's still closed. He didn't even get to turn that key. It killed him instantly. Harry. Yeah. Have you got your watch gloves? They're insulated. Oh, yeah, sure. Get Morton out of the oh, way. Don't touch him, Joey. He's got the current through it. I'll shove him away with the gloves. All right, now. Stand by. Here goes a key. All right, let's go. Get him. Come on, in. Stand back, 
there. Come on, get him. Stand back. All right, Flexi, are you like this? Guy? Right, grab the gun. Joey, look out. Let go of that gun, Hal. All right, hold them both. You don't have to worry about Black. I got him square with a wrench. We better tie up the captain. Yeah. Well, what do you think you're going to do now? We're going to turn around and go back home. <laughs> I don't think so. I burned the navigation tapes and none of you can recalculate them. Why, you You dirty. just wander in space till the fuel gives out. You'll die right here on this ship. Screens went on. Meteor? No, no, it's a ship. A patrol ship coming up on us. Oh, they must have got an SOS off. Yeah. Well, that's a sure that's Wait a minute. We don't have to worry. We can just tell them the truth. <laughs> You're not familiar with space code, young man. Mutiny is punishable by immediate execution. In other words, they don't ask questions. They just shoot. He's right, Jeff. We're through. Can we get away? Not from a patrol ship. Already sent us a heave to flash. If we run, they'll blow us out of space. I'm afraid your mutiny is about over with, gentlemen. They'll be aboard in an hour. And ten minutes after that, you'll all be dead. Nobody move. Sergeant, take a squad and secure the ship. Collect all weapons and post a guard in the engine room. Yes, sir. You, Brown, William, Osiski, come on. Well, I'm delighted to see you, Major. I wasn't quite sure my SOS had gotten through. Oh? You're Captain Howell? That's right. And I can swear out the affidavit of mutiny. I don't think a mutiny charge will stand up, Howell. Not with the relief of command warrant out for you. I think we'll just forget about it. But you can't do that. Space code is clear. You recorded my SOS. No, we didn't, Howell. Then how'd you get here? They sent us after you to get Jeff Coffin. Where is he? I'm Jeff Coffin. Jeff, we had a missing persons alarm for you, and then when a check you signed turned up at Marsport. A check? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. I gave one to Morton to help me get away. And he sold it to a fence for half face value. We traced it back to the ship. Coffin, I've got orders to escort you personally. We're taking you back to Earth. Uh, can I send out a message, Major? Of course. Oh, well, uh, that reminds me, Jeff. I've got one for you from your fiance. She said to tell you that she didn't object to a bachelor party in principle, but she did think six months was stretching it a bit. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. forward in time to the days when war has been outlawed, and in its place, there is a system of carefully controlled, legalized murder. Our story, The Seventh Victim, by Robert Sheckley. Yeah. Come in, Jerry. Are you anxious, Stan? Well, you know how it is when you're waiting for notification. It's been two weeks. The government's behind schedule as usual. Well, that's the way it always is. You can relax. I picked up the mail just before I came in. Here's your notification. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Look, 
from the ECB. You're not going to open it now, are you? No, 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 of course not. No one is supposed to know the victim's name except the hunter. That's right. Have a good hunt, Stan. You know, you need a kill. You've been all, all keyed up. Yeah, well, it's too bad you have to retire, Jerry. Well, I got into the tens club. Ten hunts, that's not such a bad record. Ten hunts, of course not. Ten hunts, and then, of course, the victims in between. That's 20 kills. Oh, wow. <laughs> I sure hope my victim isn't anyone like you. Now, don't worry about it. Hey, what number will this be? My seven. Oh, lucky seven. Go to it. We'll get you into the tens club yet. By the way, I got a circular in the mail. Maybe you'd like to use it. Victims, why take chances? You as an O'Donovan accredited spotter, let us locate your assigned killer. Pay after you get it. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, but I've got my own spotter. There's the phone. What's that? Yeah, sounds like a shooting down the hall. I guess somebody got his victim. Good for him, huh? Oh, it feels wonderful, Jerry. I feel alive again. <laughs> Hello, Ed. Oh, hi, Mr. Freeline. I'm going out on one, Ed. Well, good luck, Mr. Freeline. I suppose you want me to stand by. Yeah, that's right. I don't expect to be gone more than a week or two. I'll probably get my notification of victim status within three months of the kill. Well, I'll be standing by. Good hunting, Mr. Freeline. You'll be sure to save time for me now, Ed. I'd hate to be caught as a victim without a first-class spotter on my side. Now, don't you worry, Mr. Freeline. I'll be right there in your corner. I've got a couple of good ideas for an ambush I haven't tried yet. Good, good. Well, uh, I'll get back in touch with you right after the kill. So long. Uh, Mr. Freeline? What are you doing in my apartment? Uh, allow me. My card, manual gale, emotional catharsis bureau, oh, uh, ECB. What do you want from me? Oh, just a standard spot check and reorientation. I see you got your notification. Yeah, that's right. You know, I haven't opened it yet. Mind? No, no, go right ahead. <laughs> Anything wrong, Mr. Freeline? I mean, everything's there. Photographs, address, description, data. Yes. But it says Janet Marie. <laughs> Janet Marie, eh? I never killed a female. Is this in order? Well, just a moment while I check my list. Um... <laughs> Yes, that's right. The girl registered with the board under her own free will. The law says she has the same rights and privileges as a man. Could you tell me how many kills she has? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but the only information you're allowed is the victim's legal status and the descriptive data which you've received. Uh, could I draw another? Well, you can refuse the hunt, of course. That's your legal right. But you'll not be allowed another victim until you have served. Oh, women... Always trying to horn in on men's games. Why can't they stay home? It just it just doesn't seem feminine. Uh, look, Gail, do uh, you mind if I start packing? Oh, no, 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 no. Go right ahead. If you like, you can give me the historical checkout while you pack, and I'll just check it off here on my card. Well, all right. Where do you want me to start? Well, let's see. Uh, question one, I guess. <laughs> uh, when was the Emotional Catharsis Board established? The board was formed at the end of the Fourth World War, or the Sixth. It depends on if you count the new Argentina war. Well, either count will do. Go ahead. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, weapons increased in magnitude, efficiency, and exterminating power. Soldiers became accustomed to them, and it looked as if another war would be the war to end all wars. Uh, would you hand me those shirts, please? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, <laughs> of course. So, uh, uh, this time the peace had to last for all time, but the government recognized the need for violence in a large percentage of mankind. They recognized the validity of competition, love of battle in the face of overwhelming odds, and these, they felt, were admirable traits. So their problem was to arrange a lasting peace that would uh, stop the race from destroying itself without removing responsible traits. I'll just get a toothbrush in New York. Very good. Oh, very good. All right, Mr. Freeline. Now, if you could run down the basic rules. Well, um... Uh, Anyone who wants to uh, signs up with the ECB for five legal murders. Then, of course, he has to take his turn a few months later. If he survives, the emotional catharsis board picks the victim's names at random. The hunter is allowed six months to make his kill. Uh, Armament? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
He's allowed to use the standard caliber pistol, and he can wear no armor. The uh, victim is allowed to wear armor uh, and is allowed to hire spotters. Very good. Very good. Now, we don't have to go over the penalties for killing or wounding the wrong man. I'm sure you know all that. Oh, it's a beautiful system, isn't it? All the people who want to kill can. <laughs> That's about one-fourth of the population. And those who don't want to don't have to. <laughs> There aren't any big wars anymore, just hundreds of thousands of small ones. All right, Mr. Freeline, you're checked out for orientation. All the same, I... I don't exactly like the idea of killing a woman. <laughs> but she did sign up, didn't she? <laughs> yes, that's right. Janet Patton of New York. Hmm? Strange, isn't it, Mr. Gale? Each killing is a new excitement. It's something you just don't tire of. Uh, yeah. let's see. Oh, I guess that's it. Now a note to the milkman, and that's about all. Well, I'll be getting along, Mr. Gale. <laughs> Good hunting, Mr. Freeline. Where to, Chief? Now, uh, Carlton Hotel. Now, you bet. Uh, just uh, get into town. Isn't that noticeable? <laughs> I've been picking up from the airport for maybe ten years. I can spot an out-of-town killer by the way who carries his suitcase. You, uh, you wouldn't be working as a spotter, would you? Oh, no, no, no. The cab bureau don't like it. Uh, this isn't your first kill, I can tell. Yeah? Yeah. Guys on the first kill get too anxious. They want to drive right up to the victim's address, walk right into an ambush. I'd say maybe you had five, six... Seven? Seven. <laughs> you haven't got too long to go before you get into the tennis club. Ever been hunting? Uh, I, I can't afford it. Uh, look, I tell you what. If you can just drive me around the Chelsea area, uh, I'd just like to look at the streets. <laughs> so that's where your victim hangs out, huh? For sure, sure, be glad. Hey, you, you know what you want to do, Mac? Hmm? You want to drop in at the hunting show at the Coliseum. They got everything. Bulletproof vests for victims, hats for bulletproof crowns. I've seen an ad for a Melvin straight shot, ECB approved. They carry a load of 12 shots with a deviation of a thousand inch per thousand feet. Oh, well, that sounds like a fine gun. Well, yeah, they, they got all kinds of trick things, you know. Chains with four shot magazines, 45 caliber flashlights, all kinds of that. Those novelties are all right for the first time, but old fashioned ways are the best. Hey, hey, look at that. Somebody got him. Oh, I missed it. Yeah, nothing to see now. In about four minutes, the guys from the Department of Sanitation will carry me to cross. Yeah. Well, this is the neighborhood, Chief. You want to give me the address? Uh, no, no. Let's just drive around. Okay. You're paying to meet it. What is it, Chief? Yeah. That uh, sidewalk can't be. Should I stop? No. Just drive slowly. There she is. Sitting at the table. What, you mean your victim is a game? She's just sitting there. Is she crazy exposing herself in the open? Oh boy, that's sure no way to stay healthy. Not when you're a victim. Drive around the block. Yeah, okay. That's no good picture. She looks sad. I wonder if she has been notified. Why, she's got to be notified, Chief. They can't send you your notice until her signed receipt gets back to the office. It's automatic. Yeah, that's right. Isn't she even going to try to defend herself? Don't look like it. She's still there. All I have to do is ride by in a cab and pump a bullet into her. Yeah, okay, Chief. I'll, I'll go real slow. Now, you be sure to allow for a motion of the cooler. No, 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 no. Park across the street. Shoot. Well, her hands are on top of the table. An easy stationary target. All I've got to do is... Hey, 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 remember to roll down the window before you shoot that gun, huh? Ah, that's too easy. No, no, look, mister, hurry it up, will you? If a cop comes along, finds you shooting out of my cab, he'll give me a ticket for double book. No, no, it's too easy. All my other six kills have been hard. My victims have tried every dodge. One of them hired a dozen spotters. I got them all. 
<laughs> I dressed as a milkman. <laughs> hey, that's, that's pretty clever. No, this wouldn't be a trophy. Put your flag up. I'm getting up. Okay. I'm going to go over to talk to her. Yeah, she's your victim. Yeah. I know. It's too easy this way. <laughs> Hello. What? Uh, hey, uh, look, if I'm being fresh, just tell me and I'll go. I'm an out-of-towner here on a convention, and I'd just like to talk to somebody. If you'd rather I didn't, oh, I, uh, I don't care. May I sit down? My name is Stanton Freelife. I'm Janet. Janet what? Janet Patton. Nice to know you. Are you doing anything tonight, Janet? I'm probably being killed tonight. Oh, are you a victim? You guessed it. If I were you, I'd get out of the way. No sense getting hit by mistake. Well, you're awfully calm about it. Don't you care? Haven't you got any spotters? No. Mr. Feline, I'm a bad, bad girl. Hmm? Got the idea I'd like to commit a murder, so I signed for ECB. And I couldn't do it. Oh. I am. Sorry. But I'm still in, of course. Even if I didn't shoot, I, I still have to be a victim. Well, why don't you hire some spotters? I couldn't kill anyone. I, I just couldn't. I, I don't even have a gun. Well, you've got a lot of courage coming out in the open this way. What can I do? You can't hide from a hunter. Not a real one. I don't even have enough money to make a disappearance. Well, since it's your own defense, I, no, I should... No, no, I, I've made up my mind about that. This whole thing is wrong. This whole system... When I had my victim in sight, I could I could see how easily I could well I could have Let's forget it. I'm glad you talked to me. It, at least it'll pass the time. It's been a lovely dinner. Just lovely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I usually stop at this little place when I'm in New York. You come in often? Oh, on business. I'm in clothing, you know. What do you do? Oh, I'm an actress. <laughs> well, that's a laugh. I'm not really an actress. I'd like to be an actress, but none of the producers seem to see it that way. How old are you? I'm 25. I've only been in New York for a year. You know, you're really being very foolish just sitting out in the open that way. Why, well, your hunter could just come along and pump a bullet into you. I know. I know. Somehow I feel safe with you. Oh, uh, say, Janet, would you like to go to the gladiatorials with me tonight? We've got about 20 minutes. We'd only miss the opening numbers. Oh, I, I suppose so. <laughs> Might as well, huh? Eat, drink, and, and be merry. <laughs> disappointed. Why? I thought the New York gladiatorials would be something special. It's about the same as Cleveland. Isn't there any difference? Well, the duel of the dead, but otherwise it's the same in Cleveland as it is in New York. You know, that's funny. I used to think those gladiatorials were very exciting. Now they just make me a little sick. Well, you can get tired of the best of shows. You know, frankly, I think it was a mistake starting to televise the gladiatorials. Cut down on the box office, for one thing. And for another, it just isn't the same as being right there in the stadium, you know? No, 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 it isn't. Well, do uh, you want to stay for the second half? Let me see. We've got uh, uh, bull fighting, lion fighting, bow and arrow, and, and dueling on the high wire. No, I, I've had about enough. Shall I take you home? Would you please? Sit down. Uh, I'll fix your drink. Janet. What? You're crying, aren't you? Oh, no. No, not really. It's just the thought that any minute from, from anywhere, a, a bullet can come crashing into me. Makes me feel so soft and helpless. You are soft. Oh, Janet. <laughs> You're leaving New York soon? I, I suppose so. The convention is only lasting another day. I'll be sorry to see you go. Send roses to my funeral. 
Janet. What? Janet, I don't want you to be killed. There's not anything you can do about it, is there? Janet, I love you. Oh, Stan. Please, please, darling, quit oh, but your... you can't, you can't love me. I, I'm a victim. I won't live long enough. You won't be killed, Janet. Listen to me, Janet, darling. I'm your hunter. Uh, are, are you going to kill me? Don't be ridiculous. Darling, I'm going to marry you. Oh, Dan. Dan, my darling. All the waiting's been so frightening. It's all over. It's all over. <laughs> Think what a story it'll make for our kids. Oh, darling. How I came to murder you and left marrying you. Oh, Stan. <laughs> Kiss me. Oh, uh, I think I'd better get a cigarette. Let's start packing. Oh, wait. I want... Wait. You haven't asked if I love you. What? You haven't even admired my cigarette lighter. What are you talking it's about? It's a lovely lighter, isn't it? With a small hole in the bottom. Just large enough for a thirty-eight caliber bullet. No, 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 I'm no, not being funny, no. darling. Janet. Janet, I, I, I love you. I, I told you, I love you. What's the matter with you? I don't love you, Stanton. I am a good actress, aren't I? Even though the producers don't think so. You... You knew all along. Yes, of course. Don't reach for that. Janet! Janet! Yes, darling? <laughs> well, now I can join the Tens Club. WMUK Special Projects has presented The Seventh Victim. A story by Robert Sheckley, adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Our cast included Tom Small as Freeline, Peg Small as Janet, John Scott as Emmanuel Gale, Mark Spink as the cabbie, Dick Atwell as Ed, and Eric Grandstaff as Jerry. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I have a story to tell you about trickery and venality and genius and the threat of an alien presence in our midst. A story, too, that may leave you wondering about procedures behind secret doors, where, although it is your future that is being rewritten, you are not invited to participate. Listen closely. It could happen. You were going to tell me something about what this Professor Addison is up to? Yes. We have reason to believe that he is working on a method, uh... A mathematical concept, I should say. Yes. Which may very well achieve the time bypass necessary for interstellar travel. Wait, wait. I, I didn't quite get that. It's completely beyond either of us, so don't expect me to explain it to you. He's working on a way to travel between galaxies. You, you take it seriously? I mean, you believe it's possible? It's already been done, my friend. Where do you think the unidentified flying objects come from? Our mystery drama, The Eavesdroppers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington and stars Arnold Moss. an old house
house in Pennsylvania's beautiful Pocono Mountains, which has recently and at considerable expense been restored to its original condition. One wing has been made ideally suitable for use as a laboratory. This work was all arranged for and supervised by a man who calls himself Mr. Smith. More, one suspects, to promote anonymity than to establish identity. The job is finished now, and Mr. Smith is interviewing two people, Pearl and Edgar Parker, to whom he has offered a rather uh, peculiar job. Frankly, Mr. Smith, I don't like it. I'm an electronics engineer. I wouldn't enjoy working as a handyman, and my wife isn't a housemaid either. No, I'm not. And the other part of the job, the part you haven't told us much about, I think I like that even less. To begin with, I happen to know that you're out of a job and have been for some time. You need money. All right, all right. That may be true. But undercover agents, isn't that what you want us to be? If you like a spade called a spade, yes. Well, why us? We don't know anything about espionage. But you know a great deal about electronic equipment. And that's what's needed. That and two people to look after a big house. Well, all right, all right. Suppose you give us some details. First of all, if we decide to take this thing, how much? At the end of the summer, you'll receive $20,000 in cash. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's different, isn't it, Edgar? Well, it depends on what we have to do for it. To whom and for whom. I want to know who and what, Mr. Smith. You'll be working for... for aliens. Beings from another planet. From another galaxy, actually. Oh, come on. You wanted the truth. You have it. Oh, there aren't any such people. Oh, but there are. I've been in touch with them for some time. Our environment doesn't suit them. They come to Earth only in cases of extreme emergency. I... I don't believe you. It doesn't matter what you believe. The 20000 will be good, solid American dollars. Now, look. Whatever they want or don't want, it's clear that we'll be operating against somebody, and I'd like to know who. A single scientist who's working on a project my clients don't want to succeed. It would be against their best interests. All right. What's his name? We hope to rent the house to a Professor Dwight Addison. You may have heard the name. He's a very highly rated physicist. One of the top few. A physicist? Oh, if it's going to be bombs. No bombs. He's into something entirely different. All right. I've heard of Dwight Addison. What would you expect us to do, Mr. Smith? Edgar, if it isn't bombs and uh, it's uh, 20,000... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you want us to do, Mr. Smith? We're gone, Jane. I've cleaned out my desk, kissed my equipment goodbye, put my reactors to bed for their long summer hibernation. Professor Dwight Addison is on sabbatical. The summer is my personal property. We still have to look for a house, you know. Well, whoever heard of ointment without a fly in it. A house where the owners won't object to your converting a basement or a garage or something into a laboratory. Mm -hmm. We'll look into Mars time. Maybe we'll be lucky. Well, that's an excellent idea. Jane, I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> well, time to make the phone call, I guess. To the, uh, to them? That's right. The aliens themselves, Edgar? No, no. Smith said he'd be our control. Oh, where is he? Where do you have to call? Some place in New York. That's all I know. I wouldn't know that even, except for the area codes. All the same, even if it's not them, it makes me feel creepy. Twenty thousand dollars. That's something to keep in mm. mind, Pearl. The money. Okay, mm. here goes. I always wanted to go to Europe. Could we go afterwards or maybe take a cruise somewhere? Mm. Yes. Uh, this is... No names. No names ever. Have you carried out your instructions? To the letter. Everything as ordered. Very well. Now, let me hear your story again. Well, we've been through it a lot, Mr. Smith, and Once I really know... More, it... please. All right. The owner of the house is James Ellis. He's in Wall Street. He and his wife are taking the summer off and touring Europe. He's an amateur scientist. That's why he's got the lab set up. Pearl and I have worked for them for years and are almost like family... 
I assist him in the lab sometimes, and, uh, um, let me see, um... Your privacy. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's uh, been a rule for years that nobody ever comes into our wing of the house. That's like part of our pay. We have complete privacy. Don't forget it. All right. We'll put the ad in tomorrow morning's time. You should hear from the tenant sometime tomorrow. Try to make an appointment to show him the house for tomorrow afternoon. We're in a hurry. Well, what if somebody else sees the ad and calls first? No one else will see the advertisement. It will be placed only in the tenant's copy of the Times. Well, how can you do that? Just do as you're told. Don't worry about things that don't concern you. I don't like that man. $20,000, Edgar. It's going to be a strain at any price. Dwight? Hmm? Dwight, I found it. It's here. It sounds absolutely perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Sugar Heights, Pennsylvania, heart of the Poconos. Twelve-room Victorian home, recently restored, all in excellent condition. Housekeeper and chauffeur groundskeeper included or no deal. West wing occupied by health. East wing suitable for use as workshop, studio, or laboratory. What? Immediate occupancy for season only. Season ending on September 30th. <laughs> sort of big for us, but otherwise, doesn't it sound perfect, right? Yes. Yes, it does. Almost too perfect, don't you think? Oh, how can a thing be too perfect? Well, my work is classified, Jane. Most secret. I don't know. It almost sounds as though someone knew I wanted a place to work this summer and has made this one to order for me. Oh, now, really, Dwight. Well, that's the trouble, you know, with doing this sort of work. It makes you suspicious. All right, we... We won't worry about it. Shall we call and make an appointment to see the house? Well, there's no harm in looking. Maybe the roof leaks or something. Oh, what do you mean? Well, the way the ad reads, it just sounds too good to be true. Hello? I'm calling about your ad in the Times this morning. Has the house been taken yet? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, my husband and I would like to drive out and look at it. Uh, may I have the name, please? Uh, Professor and Mrs. Dwight Addison. We live in New York City and we're looking for a summer house. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Edgar Parker. My wife and I look after the place. I, I think the ad said something about that. Oh, yes, that part's fine. When may we see the house? Anytime, Mrs. Addison. This afternoon would be fine. This afternoon? Say around two? Very good, and I I'm sure you'll like the place, Mrs. Addison. Yes. My husband says it sounds made to order. Well, that's uh, just about everything, Mrs. Addison. You do like the place, don't you, Dwight? Oh, yes, yes, very much indeed. You're sure now that the owners won't mind my moving my own equipment into the lab? Oh, no, Mr. Ellis will be glad to have it used. As I told you, he's a kind of amateur at science himself. <laughs> Dabbling, he calls it. Matter of fact, I help him out sometimes, kind of like a lab assistant, you know. Yes, I see. If uh, if you wanted me to, I could help you out around the lab, too. You know, just wash up and keep everything straight, things like that. I always enjoy doing it for Mr. Ellis. Uh, no, thank you. That won't be necessary. It wouldn't be any trouble at all. Professor Addison never uses an assistant. He likes to work alone. Oh, well, well then. Shall we take it, right? I think it's just lovely. Yes, it's. Very suitable. All right, we'll take it. You'll have to report every night, Edgar. Yes, that's Smith's main reason for giving us a private wing in the house, so we can have our own telephone. Yes? Uh, they took the place. I guess you already know that. He doesn't use an assistant, though, so I can't All right. possibly... You'll have to get into the lab on your own. They're planning to move in tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow afternoon. All right, you stay there with them through dinner, then drive to Allentown, to Benny's Bar and Grill. I'll meet you there at 9.30 tomorrow evening. Look, if you just tell me now what I now should look for... Don't be a fool. This is a telephone we're talking on. I'll see you tomorrow, 9.30 p.m. <laughs> You have to admit that Pearl and Edgar were a big help. And the dinner was good, didn't you think? Well, I, I suppose it would be presumptuous to criticize him. Presumptuous to criticize Edgar? Edgar? 
Oh, no, no, no. Einstein. I didn't know we were talking about him. No, he might very well have decided not to go on. Except he didn't hold back on the other equation. If you're going to wander away, dear, try not to get lost. It's a strange house, you know? Well, was Mr. Big Shot Smith satisfied, Edgar? Oh, he wouldn't say so if he was. I have to meet him in Allentown tomorrow night. Oh, no. And leave me here alone? Well, that's what the man says. The bugs must be working. He seemed to know all about everything that's been going on in the house. They ought to work, the time you've spent on them. For $20,000, I do very good work, Pearl. You, uh, still don't believe about the aliens and all that, do you? To tell the truth, I don't care very much. Mm, the way he told it, though, it, it really sounded like... Shh, 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 be quiet. Oh, jeez. Um, you startled me. Uh, Professor Addison, please. This is our wing of the house. It's supposed to be private. Oh, I am sorry. I, My wife says I'm just a little absent-minded at times. I get preoccupied and... Oh. Well, I suppose I didn't pay much attention to where I was going. I do apologize. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's all right, Professor. I assure you it won't happen again. Okay, okay, that's okay. You think he heard what he was saying? I doubt it. He's in a real fog most of the time. Jane, we're going into the city tomorrow. Into the city? What on earth for? We just got here. Well, I have some errands to do that can't wait. What errands? Well, okay, you go as you have to. Well, I think I'll stay here. There are still a few little things I want to rearrange. Jane, I want you to come with me tomorrow. Please do as I say. Why, Dwight? And don't argue with me. Oh, well, of course, if you feel that strongly about I it. I do. I'm going into the lab now. I'll probably be working most of the night, so don't wait up for me. Are there actually creatures from another galaxy capable of exerting an influence on the people of our Earth? We have only a Mr. Smith's word for it. And if he has chosen to use an assumed name, as we suspect, then perhaps this more fantastic statement of his is also suspect. The doubt makes you a little uncomfortable, though, doesn't it? I'll return shortly with Act Two. One of man's distinctive characteristics, one of the traits that sets him apart from the beast, is his desire for privacy. He is a gregarious creature, true, but his business is his own. He resents having it pried into and will fight, if he must, to put a stop to the prying. It appears that Professor Dwight Addison's privacy is being invaded. He is not an ordinary man and should not be expected to take ordinary countermeasures. But that he will take action of some sort is quite certain. Dwight? Uh, yes, Jane? Oh, I'm sorry to bother you in the lab. You, you know I never do, but... Can oh, it's I... all right, it's all right, my dear. It's quite all right. I was going to bed, but I... I didn't think I could sleep. Are you angry with me, Dwight? Why, no, of course I'm not. Why should I be angry? Uh, about going into the city. You acted so... Well, not a bit like yourself. Oh. Well, you see, I, I got this idea for a new type of hearing aid, and I just wanted hearing to... Aid. Well, you're not having trouble with your hearing, are you? No, no, it's not for me. I just had an idea, I don't know where it came from, really, about a way to improve the quality of the sound reproduced in those small hearing aids they use nowadays, and... Well, you know how I am. <laughs> yes, I know how you are. I, I, I wanted to do it before I got back onto the other thing. Will you be long here? Another hour or so, I expect. Well, you get some sleep, dear. You'll need your rest for the trip into the city tomorrow. Do we really have to go, Dwight? I'm afraid so. There are a few things I must do, and I will need your help. I was detained. 
Your wife didn't come with you? I thought it would be better for one of us to stay at the house. Commendable. Thank you. You were going to tell me something about what this Professor Addison is up to? Yes. We have reason to believe that he's working on a method, uh, a mathematical concept, I should say, which may very well achieve the time bypass necessary for interstellar travel. I, um... I didn't quite get that. It's completely beyond either of us. Don't expect me to explain it to you. He's working on a way to travel between stars, between galaxies. You take it seriously? You believe it's possible? It's already been done, my friend. Where do you think the unidentified flying objects come from? Well, I've always thought they were optical illusions or something like that. A great many people do. It's a belief my clients have always encouraged. You and I know better. Hmm. I guess so. And you think Professor Addison can do it? I don't know anything about it myself. My clients seem to believe that he's very close. It's our job to help them find out how close. And then what? They want him stopped. That's all I know. Now, look, if they plan to uh, get rid of him somehow, I don't want any part of it at any price. And I still don't know what to look for if I get into his lab. Not if. When. Look for anything that he's jotted down. Every word, every number, everything. Here, I brought you this. Um, a cigarette lighter? It's made to look like one. Actually, it's a camera. And a very good one. Oh, no kidding. But, but... I'll show you how it li- works later. Does the professor have a good desk lamp? Well, it's three-way. I think it goes up to 150 watts. Pretty bright. Well, that's all you need. I want every scrap of paper you find in that lab photographed. It doesn't have to look important. You're not the one who decides. I don't have keys to his desk, you know. I'm not concerned with how you get at his papers. Just do it. Oh, okay, I'll think of something. Are the bugs working all right? You'd have heard about it if they weren't. You don't work very hard at making friends, do you, Mr. Smith? I don't make friends. I buy accomplices. My favorite breakfast. How did you know, Edgar? Mrs. Addison told Pearl that you like poached eggs. Mm, they look good, don't they? They are beautiful. Uh, Professor Addison. Yes, Edgar. Uh, Mrs. Addison told Pearl you were working in the lab pretty much all night. Uh, would you like me to go in and kind of uh, straighten up for you? Oh, no, 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 thank you. I wouldn't mind at all. I wouldn't mess with anything, of course. Just sort of put the place in order. Edgar, I don't like anybody in my lab, not anybody at all. Mm. Are you still planning to go into the city, Dwight? You hardly got any sleep at all. Oh, yes, we we really must. Will there be anything else right now, Professor? No, thank you, Edgar. Uh, I'll be sure to tell Pearl what you said about not going into the lab. We'd better get started, hadn't we? Started? Oh, oh, for the city. Well, there's no hurry, really. I'd like to test my hearing aid before we go. Test it? I'm curious about how it reacts to various acoustical situations. I want to put it in my ear and try out the sound in various rooms of the house and then outside. Well, why don't you come along? A little walk around the grounds. Sounds terribly baronial, doesn't it? Funny. I never knew you were interested in hearing aids. But the idea just hit me suddenly. They're out back now, Edgar. What are they doing? Well, she's uh, cutting some flowers, and well, he keeps wandering around listening to something. They're yeah, birds, I guess. He's trying out a hearing aid. Uh, look, do you want to help me here? Okay. One of the keys on this ring. I never saw a house with so many keys and locks. I think this is it. Is that what he's working on? A hearing aid? No, he got sidetracked, I guess. No. What are you going to do in the lab? I have to take pictures of any papers I can find. Now leave the door open so we can hear them if they come in. Take pictures? Just help me look for papers, will you? Any kind. Anything with something written on it. Well, he he must have emptied the waste paper basket himself. Mm. Oh, well, the desk is locked. I knew it would be. The filing cabinet's locked, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, here's some stuff. Under the desk blotter. Good, let me see. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Gibberish. I guess that's a good sign. A good sign? Listen, Pearl, go out and watch them through the window, will you? I've got to get pictures of this stuff. Now, just let me know if they start back toward the house. Well, why is it a good sign if there's just, well, you know, whatever you said, 
gibberish on the papers. Just watch, will you? I won't know what half these flowers are until they bloom. This one's an iris. I know that much. Uh, you'll have to speak up, Jane. I can't hear a thing you're saying. That's some hearing aid you made. It doesn't seem to be working very well. I might as well not be wearing it at all. Well, do you know what's wrong with it? Need some adjustment, I imagine. Dwight, do you really have a lot of secret stuff in the lab? Oh, yes, indeed. Practically everything in there. Top secret. Things Edgar and Pearl shouldn't see? Well, that's why I told them to stay out of the lab, Jane. I have papers in there that no one should see. Did you lock the door? To the lab? Well, of course. Aren't you afraid that telling them not to go into the lab will only make them all the more curious? Just serve as an added temptation? Oh, I don't think so. Surely we can trust Pearl and Edgar. You better get out of there, Edgar. They're coming back toward the house. Okay, okay, I've finished anyway. Just turn the light off and put these papers back under the blotter. Hurry up, will you? I'm all finished. All right, you better come away from that window. It's all right. It's supposed to be my kitchen. I'm just uh, stacking the breakfast dishes. Oh, Pearl, can you get me a vase to put these flowers in? Oh, sure, Mrs. Addison. My, they're pretty, aren't they? What are those little blue ones? Oh, grape hyacinths. I think you'd know as long as you've been working here. Oh, uh, well, uh, Edgar does all the gardening. Edgar and Mrs. Uh, uh, the Ellis. <laughs> Mrs. Ellis. Uh, go find a vase for Mrs. Addison Pearl. Uh, Mrs. Ellis, yes. I'm so bad with names. Sometimes I almost can't remember my own. Go get the vase, Pearl. I'll get that nice blue one Mrs. Ellis likes so much. Are you sure we're on the right road, Dwight? Well, I'm taking a slightly different route this time. I'd like us to enjoy the natural beauty of these mountains and... Somehow, four lanes with a minimum speed of 40 miles an hour doesn't give you much of a chance. You know, it's funny about Pearl. What's funny about her? Well, she's been living in that house for a long time. Years, the way they tell it. And she doesn't know a grape hyacinth when she sees one. That they're perennials, you know. They come up every spring, year after year. Well, she probably just doesn't have that much interest in flowers. Some people don't. Mm, maybe. And she couldn't remember Miss Ellis's name. Been working for her for years and couldn't remember her name. You're just too suspicious, Jane. Edgar and Pearl are fine people. We're lucky to have them. Well, either the professor got lost or Mr. Smith Almighty's unhappy about something again. Mm. Hello? In future, we'd prefer that Professor and Mrs. Addison not leave the house. Well, now, just how do you expect me to stop them? It may be necessary to tamper with their car. That is why I called, however. Then why did you? Impertinence doesn't become you. I called to suggest that you advise your wife not to be an idiot, if you can possibly avoid it. I don't know what you mean. The thing about the flowers. Well, Pearl didn't know what the flowers were. She wasn't thinking. Yes, that was obvious. Also, is it too much to ask that she remember the name of the woman she's been working for all these years? Well, she covered that up fine. They didn't suspect a thing. Mrs. Addison did. They've been monitoring them in the car. A good agent memorizes every detail of his cover. That's the first rule. Oh. Look, if you wanted spies, you should have hired spies. Yes. That has occurred to me, too. Sooner or later... I'm going to have to punch that guy in the nose. Well, maybe you're not lost, but I am. Oh, it's a beautiful spring day, dear. A day meant for wandering. Look. Uh, just, just look at that. <laughs> now what? Well, there's a path leading off into the woods. Don't you see it there? It would be sinful, downright sinful not to follow it. You mean get out and take that path into the wood? Well, we have to know where it leads, Jane. Don't you feel you just have to? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't feel the least bit that way. I bet there'd be snakes in there. Jane, please come with me. 
Why? Because I ask you to. Well, if you put it that way. Here, let me help you. Those aren't very good shoes for walking in the woods. Well, I thought I was going to the city. Takes me back to my childhood. Uh, watch those branches, dear. Let, let me hold them for you. Oh, it's muddy. No, no, no. That's that's leaf mold. It's quite a different thing. All right. I guess this is far enough. Far enough for what? Now, listen carefully, Jane. We can't stay out of the car too long. <laughs> Why not if we want to? That house is bugged. The lawn is bugged. Even our car is bugged. Bugged? Eavesdropping devices. Every word we've said since we moved into that house has been overheard. the man with the high IQ and the irresponsible behavior. He is not what he seems. He doesn't accept values blindly, but has a close look at each one as it is offered to him and decides for himself how much it is worth. Professor Addison is not an easy mark, clearly, and a battle has just been joined. We'll hear the outcome when I return shortly with Act Three. The creatures of an alien culture, beings from a galaxy light years removed from our Earth, had become interested in the researches of Professor Dwight Addison. They have caused to be planted in the house which he has rented for the summer a network of listening devices which keeps him and his wife, Jane, under constant surveillance. These two, Professor and Mrs. Addison, have eluded the eavesdroppers temporarily by leaving their car, in which a bug has been planted, and walking down a wooded path. But how can you be sure that everything is bugged the way you say? How can you be so sure? That little gadget I've been calling a hearing aid isn't a hearing aid at all, Jane. It's a device for detecting... Radio transmission. Radio transmission? The bugs they've planted in and around the house are tiny radio transmitters. I get a beep from the thing I had in my ear every time I get near one. They're all over the house, two or three in several of the rooms. And they've been placed around the grounds in such a way that there's not a spot anywhere where we could talk without being overheard. In the car, too? At least one in the car. Pearl and Edgar. Oh, yes. Earl and Edgar. They're very unlikely servants, haven't you noticed that? Would they be working for somebody else, or, or oh, are they... Oh, somebody else. Oh, they're only agents. As a matter of fact, I suspect strongly that they're in the employ of intelligent beings from another world. Oh, no, really, Dwight. The project I have in hand would interest such beings. It's not much of a secret anymore that this planet has been visited. Flying saucers? Well, there have been some very, very secret investigations. There's not much doubt about it among the people who have the facts. And your work is... They'd be interested. We shouldn't have left Pearl and Edgar alone in the house. What if they get into the lab? I'm sure they have a duplicate key. But there's nothing in there of any consequence. Well, you told me the place was full of secret material. Well, that was for the benefit of the eavesdroppers, whoever they are. No, no, no. I have it all in my head, Jane. I don't trust papers. Oh, I hate being spied on. I've I've given them something to think about, though. I left some papers under my desk pad for them, phony as three dollar bills. Phony? Utter nonsense. Jane, I have a plan. I'll need your help. You don't have to ask. Thank you, my dear. I'm going to turn you into a nagging wife. And when we get back to the car, I want you to start complaining. Over Y to the fourth power equals... And then he's got a question mark that he's gone over and over until the paper's almost cut through by the pen. You found nothing except the papers under his desk pad? Just these four sheets, yes. Is that all of it? 
Well, then he's got some scribbled notes at the bottom. He's written down the word heterodyne two or three times, like he was thinking on paper, you know, and then third voltage. On another line, he's written light, speed, plus, then crossed out the plus and printed it in again in capital letters. Light, speed, plus. That's interesting. Any more? Well, just some figures at the bottom. Now, wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. Okay. We've been out of touch with the Edisons for almost half an hour. They've returned to their car now. But this must not happen again. Well, what do you want me to do? There's something you do to a car's carburetor to put it out of commission. You know about that? Yes, yes, that's easy enough. Well, then do it as soon as they bring the car back. And try to do it right. Well, I hope you're satisfied. It was beautiful. But wasn't it beautiful? Back there in that jungle? It was crawly. But, Jane, I, I, I just felt like going into the woods. So we went. Twice. What did you want to do in the city? Well, just some errands. That's what I asked you. What errands? Things to do with a project I'm working on. I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to go into it. Not at liberty. You have to make a left turn at the next crossroad. Yeah, I know that. My work is very secret. I've told you that before. I'm not free to talk about it to anybody. Anybody at all. Well, it makes a woman feel unwanted. Oh, now, come on, Jane. You know better than that. One of these days, and maybe before too long, I'll just decide not to stay where I'm not wanted. Jane! If you can be trusted with a secret, why can't I? It's just that you don't want to tell me. Well, one of these days, maybe you'll be sorry after I've left you. Jane, you don't mean that. You'll find out. Or... Well, all right. I'll tell you. So tell me. Well, not now. I can't go into it while I'm driving. It's too distracting. I'll tell you when we get home. You missed a turn, you know. Don't tamper with the car. You understand me? Don't touch it unless you hear from me. Well, okay, but you said we the have car... have reason to believe that we're going to get some vital information as soon as the Addisons get home. They should be there very soon. Well, okay, then, then you don't, don't want me to... I don't want you to do anything until you're told to do something. Now, stay near your telephone for further instructions. We get 20,000. He gets a punch in the nose. Now, this is wrong. All wrong, Jane. I want your absolute promise that you will never... Dwight, ne if you're going to start that again... Oh, all right, all right. What I'm working on is a new kind of radio signal. A radio signal? Well, good heavens, what's so hush-hush about a radio but signal? this is quite different from the kind of radio signal you're thinking of. This is a sound that kills whoever hears it. Kills? Slowly and rather painfully, I'm afraid. <sighs> I haven't been able to work out a way to make it more humane. You, you mean you just turn your radio on and you get this sound or whatever it is and it kills you? Yes. Its effect is not unlike the effect of nerve gas. Yes, yes, it's it's quite deadly, quite awful, really. I don't see how that's possible. Just a, a noise that comes out of your radio. Well, there's a whole new mathematical concept involved. It it works, though. It works. I, I don't think you ought to do it. Is it... Are you close? Oh, the device itself is finished, ready to use. There's the problem, of course, of testing it without... Well, without... Killing anybody. Oh, I think it's absolutely dreadful. Oh, yes, it is, rather. I worked out one of the problems last night. A shield to protect the sender. Your hearing aid. Well, it wasn't a hearing aid at all, of course. Used in the sender's ears, both ears, of course. It neutralizes the effect of the signal. Oh, it, 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 it's worse than the atom bomb. In some ways, I suppose it is. There's no antidote. Once you've heard the signal, you're dead. There's no way to arrest it. As you say, it is rather dreadful. Uh, what, do you, what do you intend to do with it? Well, the first thing I must do is to make another of the shields tonight and make sure that they work. Make sure? How? I'll feed the sound through an amplifier, not broadcast it, of course, and wear the two shields. If I'm not affected, then I know the shield works. But, Dwight, you can. I can't think of another way. You'd better stay clear of the lab tonight. I'll, I'll have to warn Pearl and Edgar. Does it... 
Does it work on just any old radio? Any radio. Through any transmitter. Anything from your big commercial transmitter to one of those tiny little things they use as eavesdropping devices. Uh, bugs, I think they're called. I, I, I wish you wouldn't do that tonight, Dwight. Now, I'll be all right, my dear. The shields will work. And there aren't any radio transmitters nearby. After all, we're not bugged. I want all listening devices removed from the house and grounds. The car, too. Every bug you planted, I want out at once. Destroy them as you remove them. Make sure not one of them is left functional. Would you care to come with me for a walk around the grounds, Jane? All right, if you'd like to. It's a lovely afternoon. Edgar and Pearl have been out enjoying it. Oh, Edgar. Uh, yes, Professor? Before I forget it, I think it would be a good idea if you and Pearl stayed in your quarters this evening. I'm doing a rather special experiment, and I, I think it would be safer for you. Okay, uh, the whole evening? Until quite late, yes. It's a... It's a lovely day, isn't it? Mrs. Addison and I are going to take a little walk. Yes, yes, it's very nice out, and, uh... Oh, it's okay about tonight. We can talk now, Jane. You mean we're free of those things? Out here. They've removed all the bugs from the grounds. I've been watching them. Removed and dismantled them as they went. Afraid of your experiment tonight? Whoever's been listening must have given the orders. Oh, what a gorgeous day. Let's plan to stay out for at least an hour. That ought to give them time to clear the house of bugs. What are you doing, Edgar? I want to tell Smith all the bugs are out. I think maybe I ought to tell him what the professor said about a special experiment tonight, too. I expect he'd uh, want to know that. Well, I wonder why he wanted the bugs out. You think he'd tell me? Oh, come on, come on. Why doesn't he answer? The number you have reached is not in service at this time. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. This is a recording. Mr. Smith's run out on us. What do you mean? The phone's been disconnected. Oh, so that then how are we going to collect our money? We're not. This phone number is our only contact with them. A man named Smith? Even if it was his real name, and you know damn well it's not. Oh, but, but, but uh, uh, twenty thousand dollars. Oh, if I ever find him, I won't just punch him in the nose. I'll kill him. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to get out of this house right now. If they're scared, so am I. Come to the window, Jane. Oh, what's happening out there now? They're leaving. I watched them loading their car with luggage. We've seen the last of Pearl and Edgar. Maybe we should go, too. Why? We've paid our rent for the season. The bugs are gone. We'll have to run a big house without help for a while, of course, but... Uh... Oh, that's all right with me. Incidentally, how did you like my performance as the nagging wife? Uh, much too well, my dear. <laughs> I'll never cast you in a role like that again. Dwight. Yes, dear? You're not... Really working on that awful thing, are you? I mean, the radio signal that kills people? No. <laughs> no, nothing of the kind. Actually, what I'm working on is a time bypass that will make traveling between galaxies possible. Really make it possible? If it works. It looks good in theory. Of course, I know how to make the lethal radio signal. You do? Oh, yes. Yes, there's nothing to it, really, once you understand the mathematics. Oh, Dwight, you wouldn't. Oh, no, no, dear. That's one secret nobody's ever going to get out of me. Not even a nagging wife. Professor Addison has tricked the eavesdroppers into removing their listening devices from his home and his laboratory. But has he stopped them altogether? They seem to be a determined breed. And I'm sorry to say, there are always people around like Mr. Smith and Pearl and Edgar Parker who will sell out if the price is right. Perhaps we've heard the last of the eavesdroppers. And perhaps we haven't. I'll be back shortly.
At this meeting, interstellar travel has not been announced as feasible. But things move fast in this age. Don't be too surprised if you hear on a newscast that Professor Dwight Addison has found a way to make it feasible. And be with us, no matter what method of travel it requires, for our next look at some of the improbabilities that turn out to be, after all, possible. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Patricia Wheel, William Redford, Ralph Bell, and Joan Arliss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. American Broadcasting Company, Radio Network, presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy have been locked in a laboratory on the planet Venus. Outside the heavy door... The criminal mastermind, Ralph Boger, has shouted a weird threat. Commander, is Boger kidding us? Can he really throw a bottle of acid through that solid door? I don't know, but if he does, try to catch it. He could on the vibration field. There's the bottle that came right through the door. Smoking rockets, the lab is on fire! Hit that door, Hap. The fire's spreading, sir! Fumes! That door doesn't give pretty soon, we're finished! We'll be back in a moment with a thrilling story, The Invisible Enemy. The United States has seen many changes in the past dozen years, all pointing to a still better way of living. Millions more Americans are working, earning more, saving more. More young people are going to high school and college. More of us are enjoying the luxuries of life, sports, radio, television, the theater, concerts. Church attendance and membership has climbed steadily upward and, in addition to these material and spiritual changes, have come the miracles of jet propulsion, supersonic flight, antibiotics. The better you know America, the better the future looks. Write for the free booklet, The Future of America, Box 1776, Grand Central Station, New York 17. Now today's Space Patrol adventure, The Invisible Enemy. Somewhere in the solar system, there lurks a dangerous enemy. His name is Rolf Boger, and he holds control of an invention so revolutionary that the entire resources, enterprise, and courage of the Space Patrol are almost powerless to combat it. Commander Corey, in his first encounter with Boger and his criminal activities, succeeded in capturing Clayton Slake, Boger's accomplice and chief muscle man. As Buzz and Happy bring Slake aboard the Terra 5 at the Terra spaceport, the criminal smirks over his shoulder at the commander. Get in that compartment, Slake. Why the rush to take me to the Venus Rehabilitation Center? Are you afraid uh, Boger might rescue me? Is that it? Frankly, yes. We know that Boger has an electronic device that enables him to walk through solid matter, through walls of buildings. Sure, Boger can go anywhere he wants. He can help himself to anything he chooses. Money, government secrets, or... Um, Prisoners of the Space Patrol. We're going to be sure he won't get you, Slake. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. So long, boys. All right, Hap, up forward. Slake sure doesn't seem worried. No. That may be just an act. Or he may be too ignorant to realize the limits of Boja's device. Just what are the limits? If he can walk through solid matter as though it wasn't there, well, he can do just about anything. Boja's motive is greed, Happy. Sooner or later, he'll attempt something a machine can do, but 
But Boger himself can't survive. Then he'll destroy himself. That's likely. But he might take innocent people along with him. Let's blast off, Hap. Oh, we're cleared with space control, sir. We've got the green light for space lock number three. Okay. Close ports. Close ports. Fire jets. Fire jets. Up, shipping away. As the commander's ship blasts off from Terra and eases into its flight orbit to Venus, two men in another spaceship intently watch their viewscope screen. That's Corey's ship, Bodger. I guess I better get into my spacesuit. There is no hurry, Grog. I got to compute his exact vector and then set our own course to intersect it. Then we close in, midway between Terra and Venus, right? Yes. Here, put these on just before you get into your suit. What are they? Some kind of goggles? Well, they are electronic spectacles. For what? When we move in close to Cory's ship, all the matter in this ship will be vibrating at a very high frequency. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's what makes us invisible. Exactly. An ordinary matter will be invisible to us because it's on a lower spectrum, a lower plane. Uh, these electronic spectacles fix it so I can see to rescue Slake from Corey's ship, ain't it? That's right. How come Slake and I never used these goggles before? You have never been invisible before. You have walked through walls, but the field was at a low rate of vibration. You could be seen and you could see. You sure nothing will go wrong? I'll stay invisible? Just follow instructions. Uh, we'll go over it once more, just to make sure. Mm. Now, let's assume that this ship is now invisible and I pulled alongside Corey's ship. I had a signal from you. I stepped to the hull of this ship into the Terra Five. But first, turning your field control on your belt. Yeah, naturally. Inside the Terra Five, I search for Slake. I give him the extra space suit I brought along. Then we go after Corey. You got it. Mm. When you have finished, Corey, space phone me. Then come back aboard. All right, Grok, put your electronic spectacles in place. I'm going to make this entire ship invisible. All set. There. The ultra vibration field is on. Our ship is invisible, even to Corey's view. There's no way out of this compartment, that's sure. Hey, what's that? Something funny's going on. Where did you come from? To the hull of the ship. Benson Grock. Yeah, it's me. But calm down. Here, I brought you a space to put it on. Oh, sure, sure. But how did you get in the ship? From Boger's cruiser. It's right outside, waiting. How'd you pull alongside without Corey finding out? Well, Boger's ship's invisible. Just like you'll be when you turn up the field in your spacesuit belt. Invisible? Yeah. Boozer's using extra high frequencies this time. <laughs> Guess he's got a lot of tricks you and I don't know about. Here, let me help you with your suit. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, well, I'll sure be glad to get out of here. we got a job to do first. We've got to finish Corey. Well, I don't know about Boozer's we... orders. How many are aboard? Just Corey and the cadet. Uh, the two of us can handle him. We'll take him by surprise. Yeah? I tried that once. That's why I'm here. This time, there are two of us, and we'll be invisible. We can't attack Corey while we're invisible. We'll pass right through him like you would through a wall or the hull of a ship. Now, that's right. While we're invisible, we're as harmless as moonbeams. But we can sneak up on him. Then we cut off the field control. That makes us solid. Yeah, and then we take care of him. Fast and thorough. Come on, finish with that space suit. Oh, well, wait, I, uh, I forgot your electronic goggles. But which? These things. You'll need them to see with when you're invisible. I'll show you how they work. Well, Hap, we're past the halfway point to Venus and no trouble yet. Were you expecting any? Oh, I've been on the alert for spaceships. I thought Boger might make an attempt to rescue Slake. Yeah, I think it's too big a risk for Boger to take. Anyhow, we can pick up another gorilla like Slake without any trouble. Uh, say, Commander, I I've been thinking... Yes, Happy? Oh, uh, well, uh, it'll be about two hours before we reach Venus and... Uh... And by the time we hand over Slake to the rehabilitation camp, uh, well, that'll be another half an hour. Oh, you're hungry, is that it? Me? Oh, well, no, not, not especially, but I, I thought uh, I thought I'd go back to the galley and uh, get you something. Oh, good idea, Hap. Get three servings of 4J. Three servings? Yes, we've got a passenger aboard, you know. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, Slake, I forgot about him. Well, uh, how about the 5H pills for him? No, Hap. When the crew eats, the prisoner eats, and the same kind of chow we do. Oh. 
Sure, Commander. I'll see that Slake is taken care of. Watch him when you take the food into his compartment. Oh, I will, sir. In the small galley amidships, Happy scans a row of buttons, then presses one marked 4J three times in succession. Within a few seconds, the concealed robot mechanism is releasing the electronically cooked foods on a tray. Happy is so fascinated in watching the process that he does not notice an even more remarkable occurrence in the galley. Two figures in spacesuits suddenly materialize behind him. Each holds a ray gun. Get your hands up, cadet. Turn around. What? Not a yip out of you either, Buster. Flake, how did you get out of the compartment? And you, how did you get aboard? We'll go into that later. Where's the commander? Well, uh, I'll tell you. He was, uh, he was in a hurry to get where we're going, and it was so nice out. Well, uh, A decided to get out and walk. Listen, shorty, get cute with me, and I'll finish you right now. Now, let's have it. Where's Corey? Well, he could be almost any place in the ship. Uh, try the bowling alley on the lower deck. I've given you one more chance, space cadet. Cut it, Grock. Can't you see he's stalling? Corey's probably at the controls waiting for his lunch. If the cadet isn't up there pretty quick, Corey will come back here to investigate. Okay. Let's slug the comical cadet and go after Corey. Now, wait a minute. Look at that food. That's service for three. Who's the extra lunch for? It was for you, Slake. And I punched the button with my own little hands. Now, aren't you ashamed? Now, listen, Cadet. No more fooling. Take two trays and go up forward to the controls. Hey, Clark, listen. Quiet, Slake. Hey. I get this, Cadet. Don't try to warn the commander. We'll be invisible and right behind you. Invisible? Shut up. I'll pick up those trays and get moving. Well, there you are, Hap. I was beginning to get a little worried. Here, I'll take one of those trays. Over. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Mmm, that hot cocoa smells good. Have you fed Slake yet? No, not yet, sir. I think I'll give him his tray right now. Happy! What got into you? Why did you throw that tray of food? I thought they were right behind me. You thought what? Happy, what's the matter? Well, they're gone. I aimed it right where their heads should be, but they're gone. Who's gone? Oh, Slake. And that other fellow. They were in their spacesuits, and suddenly they, they vanished. I was, I was standing there in the galley, watching the food come out of the robo-server, and suddenly I seemed to hear a voice say... Put up your hands. And there stood... Come on, look. It, it's like... That's right. My pal Grok has you covered, too. You heave the tray right through us, cadet. Then you were here all the time. Right behind the cadet. But we're not hallucinations, Corey. We're real. And we're going to prove it to you. In the hard way. We'll be back to Space Patrol in a moment. A big part of Christmas, especially a big part of our Christmas cards and packages, are Christmas seals, the seals that fight tuberculosis. TB strikes one American every five minutes. But progress in the fight against TB since the first Christmas seal was sold has met a saving of more than seven million lives. The Christmas seals we use on our cards and packages help bring the greatest gift of all, the gift of good health, not only to our friends but to everyone. This year, use the new double Christmas seals. One red, one green. The colors of Christmas. Answer your Christmas seal letter. If you haven't received yours yet, mail your contribution to your Tuberculosis Association. They'll see that you get your Christmas seals. Remember, your contribution is the important one. Thank you. Now back to our Space Patrol adventure, The Invisible Enemy. Buzz and Happy aboard the Terra 5 are transporting the criminal Clayton Slake to Venus. Undetected by the space patrollers, Rolf Boger maneuvered his own spaceship alongside the Terra 5, making it completely invisible by means of a special electronic field. The field also made it possible for Boger's accomplice, Benton Grock, to step through the solid hulls of the ships and liberate Slake. Grock and Slake suddenly materialized in the control cabin, taking Buzz and Happy completely by surprise. The two criminals, weapons in hand, are advancing on the space patrollers. Just stand where you are, Corey. Till Slake and I figure out the easiest way to handle this. Who are you, and how did you get aboard? Not that the information is going to do you any good, but I'm Benton Grock. I got aboard from the ship that's alongside yours. So Bojer can make an entire spaceship invisible, even to view scope rays, huh? That's right. It's going to be a big mystery what happened to you, Corey. The space patrol will probably find your ship circling in space. Now, wonder how I escaped and how... Wait a minute, Slake. Uh, better check with Bozier. Yeah, maybe we'd better. Rock to Bozier. Come in. Bozier here. Did you get Corey? Yeah, we're holding our ray guns on Corey and the cadet now. 
How do you want to finish them? Well, put them to sleep with the ray gun. Then uh, smash their spacophone transmitter. And before you leave the terrify, open the outer airlock. When the air escapes, well, uh, that will take care of them. Okay, Bojo. Hey, Corey, move away from those controls. I don't want you hitting them when you fall. Come on, move. All right, Brock. I guess... I guess you win this one. <laughs> What's the matter, Corey? A little weak in the knees, huh? No, my foot slipped, that's all. I probably stepped in some of that food Happy tossed around. He's scared, Grock. The great Corey is scared. All right, have it your way. Hey, what's that? What's happening to the ship? Grock, sleep. What is wrong over there? I can't see the third of five. Grock, I'm blacking out. I don't know what's happening, Corey, but I, I'm going to get... Grab Slake, Happy. Grock's folded. Yes, sir. Slake's blacked out, too, Commander. Uh, I'll ease him under the deck. I guess you must have hit the star drive control with your elbow when you slipped. Yes, Hap, I must have. What a lucky accident. Hey, you did it on purpose. Hey, imagine knowing those controls so well you can work them with your back turn and make it look like an accident. Now that we're in hyperspace, Bojo can't find us. Yeah, we've got two of his men. Get those spacesuits off of them before they revive. I don't want to have to search this ship for invisible men. Yes, sir. I've got our hyperspace vector figured out, sir. We'll be cutting back into regular space in a few minutes. Good. I think Grok's coming around now. Grok, snap out of it. Grok, can you hear me? Uh, what happened? You're in hyperspace. We're as invisible to your pal Bolger as you were to us. Hyperspace? Star drive? He got away from Bolger by kicking into star drive. Where's Slake? He's locked up back out. Yeah. Instead of losing a crook, now we've got two. And we're going to have three, Grok. You're going to help us. Where is Bojer's hideout? I don't know. Don't give me that. If you've got the idea that Bojer can rescue you, just forget it. Now, where's his hideout? He's probably got several. I found this map in your pocket. It's a chart of a section of Venus. Now, uh, what does this mark here indicate? I don't know. You're carrying around a map of a desolate section of Venus, and you don't know what it is? Well, maybe I'm going prospecting someday. Oh? Well, I'm going to jump your claim. What do you mean? If this map had nothing to do with Bojo, you wouldn't be so evasive. Cap, we're coming out of Star Drive. When we pull out, set a vector for Venus. of several miles, Buzz scans the surface of the planet Venus as projected on the viewscope screen while Happy keeps an eye on Benton Grock. There's a structure down there between two rows of hills but no sign of any activity. How does it check with the mark on Grock's chart? Oh, it pinpoints it exactly. Grock, have you changed your mind about talking? What is that building down there? <laughs> You're smart, Corey. You figure it out. I have. Bojo knows that even if you don't willingly tell me what you know about him, I can get it with a brainograph. His first thought will be to rush to the most important hideout that you do know about. Yeah? Why? To wait for you to arrest him? No. <laughs> Not to destroy evidence and to pick up valuable equipment or money that he has hidden. That's it, isn't it? Oh. Now you're way off, Corey. Way off. We'll see. Happy lock rock up in another compartment. I'll land the ship and we'll search that building. With Grock and Slake securely locked up in the ship, Buzz and Happy land the Terra 5 a few hundred yards from the low, sprawling building in the Venus Hills. Now they stand before the heavy front door. Probably locked. It'll be a job to break it in. Strange. It's unlocked. Bojo must feel that isolation is all the protection he needs out here. Maybe. If it is Bojo's place, we'll find out in a few minutes. Come on. Hmm. Sure seems deserted, all right. Mm -hmm. Perhaps someone's in the next room. Easy now. Have your ray gun ready. We're moving in fast. Yes, sir. 
Well, it's empty. Just a bunch of filing cabinets. That's what we heard, a drawer closing. Whoever was here, went through that other door. Come on. Well, no one's in here either. Say, look, it, it's some sort of a lab. There's no other door. Whoever came into this room is still here. But, sir, there's no place to hide. Boja doesn't need a place to hide. Huh? Oh, the, the ultra-vibration field. Yeah, he can be invisible. Tap the door. We're too late. We're locked in. That's right. You walked into a trap, Corey. It's Boja, all right. He's on the other side of the door. And the safe from you is the five or a million deals away. Let's hit that door, Hap. Yes, sir. Listen to me, Corey. You are wasting your time. You can't break out of that lab. This door has to give some time. Yes, but you won't live that long. What do you mean? I have a bottle of acid in my hand. When I turn on the vibration field, I can hurt the bottle right through the wall into that room. Oh, tricks, huh? Yes, it's an amazing trick. Inside the room, the bottle will leave the vibration field and become solid again. It will crash and break. And then what? Just wait and see, Corey. Wait and see. He cut on the field. Oh, is Bojer kidding us? Can he really throw a bottle through a solid? I don't know, but if he does, try to catch it. There's the bottle. It came right through the door. Right through the door. <laughs> Smoke and rockets. The lab's on fire. Quick, Cap. We've got to break down that door. <coughs> Those fumes. Hit the door, Hap. <coughs> the fire's spreading, sir. If that door doesn't get pretty soon, we're <coughs> finished. It, it, it. Back aboard the Terra 5, Benton Grock sits on his bunk in the locked compartment, moodily contemplating his fate. At a strange sound, he raises his head, then leaps to his feet in amazement as a figure materializes just inside the bulkhead. Bojer. Surprised, Ra? Hey, Bojer, listen. Koya and the cadet are searching your hideout. Yes, I know. They came in while I was finishing up a few details. But you were here? Well, where's your ship? We didn't see it. Of course not. I left the field down. It's invisible. What about Corey? I expect he and the cadet are having a rather hot time right now. Where's our friend, Slade? Two compartments aft, I think. Mm, that's fine. Now, uh, stand close to me. I'm going to turn on the field up high enough to include both of us. All right, Grok. Through the bulkhead. We release Slake and then we get to my ship. In the burning laboratory, Buzz and Happy are exhausted from their efforts to break down the door. Nearly overcome by smoke from the flaming acid, they prepare for another effort. <coughs> I'm only good for one more smash at the door, sir. Yeah. From the smell of that smoke, that's pyronectic acid. If we can find a chemical to neutralize it, I wouldn't know it if I saw it. I'll start looking through these cabinets. Well, nothing here that's any good. Uh, no chemicals at all in this one. Just belts. Maybe we'd better take one last try at the door. Yeah. These belts, they're just like the one Grock was wearing. Put one on. They can get us out of here. Yeah, if Bocher hasn't cut off that field transmitter. We'd better work fast. I'm going to give my belt a trial. I'll turn the control knob until I can put my hand through this cabinet. Oh, you've got it, Commander. Turn yours number four, Hap. Yes, sir. Got it. Okay, come on. Walk through the door. Oh, we made it. Cut the vibration control. You get to the front door, be careful. Or you still may be around. Yes, sir. Okay, Hap, hold it. Looks clear, sir. Wait. Look over there toward our ship. It's them. Boger, Slake, and Grock. Keep back inside the door. Don't let them see you. Doesn't look like they're coming here. But where are they headed? Probably to Boger's ship. His ship? He sure must have landed a long way off. He's got the invisibility field on. That's why we didn't see it when they landed. Oh, sure. It's going to be tough to stop them before they get to the ship we can't see. Yeah, I know. And we don't want them to see us first. Hey, how about making ourselves invisible? Uh, we don't have those special electronic spectacles, Hap. Turning this bell control up a few notches would make us invisible, all right, but we'd be blind. How come? 
Probably because our optic nerves and the retinas of our eyes would be transparent to light. Without the goggles to rectify the light frequencies, we wouldn't gain anything by being invisible. Well, if we could uh, get behind them and sneak up... That's our only chance, Hap. Look, we're going to pass behind that thick clump of trees. If we can make it to the trees, we'll be fairly close. Yeah, provided they don't change their direction. Come on, Hap. Let's go. How far is it to the ship, Butcher? Oh, less than a hundred yards. It's just this side of the big Venus soap. <laughs> Imagine being that close to a spaceship and not being able to see it. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the oak right through the hull, Grug. One thing, sure, Butcher. You really took care of Corey. Look at the smoke and flames shooting up over that clump of trees. Yes, the laboratory is in an inferno by now. In a few minutes, the entire building will collapse in flames. I gotta hand it to you, Butcher. Corey sure met his match this time. There is nothing in our way anymore, gentlemen. Uh, incidentally, I will have to board the ship first and cut off the field transmitter. Why? Uh, to materialize the ship. Otherwise, you couldn't see to get aboard. And you would pass right through the hull. Oh, sure, I forgot about... Hold your... Look behind us. Why, it's Corey and the cadet. I thought you said you'd finish. Unless I'm happy. Yes, sir. Bolger, do something. Don't, don't let go of me, Corey. Bolger, help us. He's gone. Vanished. Hey, I'm through. Yeah. yeah. Hold it, Corey. I've had enough to... All right, get up. We'd have licked you, though. If Bolger hadn't run out on us... Hey, maybe he didn't run out. Maybe he... Shut up, Grock. Commander, did you hear what Grock said? Suppose he might have gone after weapons. And being invisible, he could pop up any place. Yeah, you better let us go, Corey. Bozier will be back with a blaster any minute. And it'll work just like that bottle of acid back in the lab. Yeah. Only this time he won't miss. He's probably aiming it at you right now, Corey. Point blank. What's that? It's your pal, Bozier. He's deserting you. Wow, an invisible spaceship blasting off. Well, that's the strangest sight I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, it's the strangest sight I never saw. I mean, I'll figure I... out later, Hap. Let's get these men back to the ship. Then we'll work out a plan to trap Bolger. Yes, sir. And the next time he shows up invisible, I mean, uh, if he's invisible the next time I see him, I mean, well, if I... Well, if I see him, I'll grab him. A preview of next week's Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. At this particular time in our history, millions of young men throughout the country are faced with military obligations. If you are a young man between 17 and 18 and a half, you can start fulfilling your military obligation right in your own hometown by joining the National Guard. You can go to school or hold down a job at the same time. You will go on active duty only if your outfit is needed in a national emergency. The Guard offers many advantages and opportunities for its recruits. These include extra income, Learning new skills, pilot training, retirement benefits, and sports and social activities. Get the facts about joining from your local National Guard Armory. Now a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in the Jupiter City Atmosphere plant, searching for a powerful bomb hidden by the criminal Boger. Commander, listen. Hear that? It's a timing device. We're close to it. Here, this way. There it is. Well, if I can figure out how to deactivate this thing. Ten seconds, Commander. It's getting ready to go off. If this isn't the right control, Jupiter City will be blown off the planet. Be with us next week for the thrilling Space Patrol story, The City of Hidden Doom. <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Helen Moser. Other players were Norm Jolly, Ken Mayer, and Bela Kovach. Lee Zimmer speaking. Don't forget to tune in next Saturday at the same time for exciting adventure on Space Patrol! This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. 
Metacom presents Arch Obler's Lights Out Everybody. It is later than you think. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you. These Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. The Immortal Gentleman. A melodrama about something every one of us has thought of at one time or another. If I could only live forever... Our star, Mr. Francho Tone, in Arch Obler's newest radio drama, The Immortal Gentleman. Beautiful that the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly remold again and ever again the face of the soiled world. Be frightened, John. Please, don't be. Yes, I know I screamed, but don't be afraid for me. I'm all right, really, I am. No, no, don't say anything. Just listen. The reason that I screamed, it made me happy. Oh, what a Oh, I know it sounds confused, but I can tell you freely now for the first time since I've known you. Tell me what? About what happened. Tell you about myself, and then you'll understand, and then we'll both be happy. Remember, you once said you never could be happy with me. Oh, please. No, please, don't say anything. If you do, I want to hold you in my arms. And I've got to talk this thing out first. Talk it out from the time before I knew you until a few moments ago when I screamed and frightened you. You know, you were right. I've been a coward. But not of men or things or living. Just of not living. You don't know what I mean, do you? Must I say it? Must I say the word? All right, I will. I've been afraid of death. Yes, believe me, Joan, all my life it was that way. Even as a boy, I couldn't be happy because of him. So one thought was in me all through life. If I could only live forever, if I wouldn't die, if I could only live forever. The thought chasing itself in a never-ending circle. So there was no happiness. And the fear in me was in my face and in my work, and you knew it, and everyone knew it, but they didn't know why. No! Tonight, the echo that is still in my ears, I cried out in fear in front of everyone. And I'm going to tell you why I cried out, and then you'll understand me. And why, I say, I'm free and happy for the first time in my life. And, Joan, if it's too strange to believe, just listen patiently. We were sitting in the auditorium, you and I, the politician up on the stage, talking, talking. In this coming election, I repeat again, the issue will be clear. An issue made clear by our glorious party. You young men and women... Sitting there, you next to me, I wasn't listening to him on the stage. I was thinking the same infernal thoughts I thought all my life whenever I was alone. Of him. Him. And then... Yes, to you. To every one of you here. A challenge that we must accept. Face and challenge in turn. Speaker's voice wasn't the same. I looked up. No, not the same. The other one, an old man, this one young. Couldn't quite see his face, so dark in the hall. Had something happened to the lights? I turned toward you, said, Joan, when did the lights... I stopped. You, you weren't there. Believe me, not there. Another woman. Did you speak to me? She said that. I said, where... where's Joan? Joan? Well, she was sitting right next to me. She... You have her chair. Where did she... I mean, the young lady who was sitting here, where did she go? I've been here for hours. But she was here. Here, I tell you. Quiet, quiet, the speaker. The time has passed for pleadings. The time has passed for petitions. We are representative of youth. And youth is the time for action. So we must act. The speaker, what did he matter? I sat there, couldn't figure it out. You, Joan, where had you gone? Could I have dozed off? You slipped out and this other woman taken your place? Yet, 
How strange you're leaving without a word. And then... Wind. Wind in the auditorium. I looked up. The sky. No roof. A single star and clouds. No roof. Sleep? No, awake. I got up to go. No, no, sit down. No one can leave. But my friend... You have sworn to stay. You must. I sat down. Sworn to stay. What in the world... I sat down. You know there can be no compromise. There will be no compromise. For if we compromise, we are doomed as they have always doomed us. Speaker, what did he matter? No roof on the place. Crazy. How could a roof disappear in a moment without... I said to the girl, where's the roof? What's happened to this place? Where are we? You know. No? no. What? Well, I'd get out of the place. I'd find you, Joan. Started to go again with the girl's hand tight on my wrist. No, don't. You swore to stay. Swore? You swore. They swore. He speaks the truth. But what? Listen. Listen. Good, then now, good friends, let us put an end to words. This meeting of ours was destined. For 500 years, destined. What was he saying for 500 years, destined? For what? None of us can say we have moved quickly. For in the meditation of these 500 years has come the essence of truth. A truth that burns bright in the hearts of all of us. What kind of a political speech was that? And so an end to words. In this meeting we have spoken words which none dare question. Now the time has come for action which none dare deny us. The girl leaned close and whispered. None dare deny us. Deny us? Deny what? Wanted to yell out just the way I did a few moments ago, but I couldn't. Something about the place, the speaker, people around me. I, I could only sit there, questions pounding in my head. Youth is action. Action is youth. We will act together and make ourselves a new world, a better world, our world. Meeting over, everyone getting up, the girl said... Come with me. Where? You know. I know. Crowd pressing around me, dark, strange faces, young, angry faces, none of my friends. My friends? Well, where were they? Joan, where were you? The auditorium in ruins. As she led me out, I saw that. It was madness. Yet a strangely intriguing madness, so I walked with it. Led me through a door. I could hear voices. She said... Stand here a moment. I want to talk to you. Tell me, why do you act so strangely? Don't you want to go through with it? Through with what? Fear. That's what I mean. You talk as if you don't know. I couldn't speak. Stood there. It's a glorious morning for all of us. We've waited 500 years, some of us, for this. 500 years? What was she... I said... Five hundred years? Well, perhaps not you, but I've waited three hundred and fifty myself. What? What did you say? Three hundred and fifty years, and now I can't wait another moment. The thought of another empty day suffocates me. Am I insane or you? Insane? I don't know the word. Out of your head. You or I? You are a strange one. And yet you came here. Why? Well, to hear a speech? So, to hear but not to act, eh? You will. You will. All of us will. And then... The moonlight... From under a cloud, and then her face. I saw her face clearly for the first time. Hers was a loveliness beyond the word. Sixteen, seventeen, she couldn't have been more. Freshness of the morning. And yet her eyes, old, bright, wise, so strange, her old eyes and that young face. I stood there, staring at her. I tell you this, if one of us fails, we all fail, and that can't happen. Remember that. Now come. They're waiting. Followed her. A room quite dark. Many people in it. Quiet, please. Quiet. There is little time to waste. We will now draw lots. Each of you take a paper as the box is passed. Most of the slips are blank. Only 24 are numbered. Whoever draws a numbered slip stays. The others go. Slips? Draw lots? What was this? Draw lots for what? Someone came close, held out a box. The girl said... Take a paper. I did. She did. The others did. She said... Look at the slip. I did. A number. Eleven. She said... Good. I too. Held out the paper in her hand. I saw the number twelve on it. You and I. You and I. She and I what? All those without numbers leave. All those without numbers leave. The push of bodies around me. And in a moment, there were only a few left. The girl at my side, motionless. Now we can risk lights. And in a moment, lights began to glow. I stood there, blinking, and then... 
I saw. Twenty-four people in that room, men and women. Twenty-four, I counted them, and all of them looked alike. Yes, alike, I tell you, men and women. And their faces as the girls. Twenty-four faces alike as copies of pictures strung along the wall. They, in turn, were staring at me. Who is he? The voice said. Who is he? Another said. I've never seen him before. Who is he? They came close around me. Not one of us. Who is he? Who is he? Not one of us. All those faces alike, staring, talking, staring, talking. The girl spoke. I knew it was she because her hand was on my arm. Leave him alone. He is an Atavar. An Atavar. Oh, an Atavar. Atavar. Atavar? What was an Atavar? I wanted to speak, but she spoke. He'll be all right. I'll see to that. But an Atavar is unpredictable. But I tell you, he'll be with me. He drew 11. I drew 12. He'll be with me. But they're undependable. You know that. Never can tell about an animal. But I'll take care Never of him. I'll take care of him. They stood there arguing about me, Joe. Yes, arguing about me. Whether I could, whether I would, whether I was reliable, unreliable. And always that word, Atabar. Atabar? Atabar? Mad dreams or mad adventure, whatever it was, I didn't know. Their argument stopped. Apparently, the girl had won. The leader said, All right, Atabar, you'll be with her. Now, all of you listen. This Atabar is with us, and with us he'll stay until it's ended. Ended? Ended? What had begun? What would end? One question, Atavar. What is your age? My age? You want to know my age? Well, didn't you hear, Atavar? What is your age? The girl said... Tell him. My... My age is 25. What did you say? 25. Do not joke. Tell us your age. I told you. 25. For a moment, no one spoke. They looked at each other, shook their heads slowly, shoulders shrugged. An Atavar. Just an Atavar. The girl said... Don't worry, any of you. I'll take care of him. He'll do as he's told. Do as he's told? Do what? Told it or what? I wanted to open my mouth. Then I didn't, because the leader said... All right. Our last word. There are 24 of you. Twelve pairs. Each pair will go out together. If one fails, the other will succeed. But when? Now, at once. We have waited long enough for them. I alone have waited 400 years. And I 200. 300. I 425. I understood. Like a blow on the head, I understood. These people, mad. <laughs> that was it. Talking of living hundreds of years, out of their heads all of them. Listening to them, I knew that. 340 years. I've waited 170 years. And that explained the likeness of their faces. Some sort of weird interbreeding of a family resulting in feeble-mindedness. Well, how did I come among them? Went outside. The girl with me, everyone going off in pairs, their faces tense, angry, going off to some strange madness. The girl said, Wait here. I'll get what we need, then we'll keep our appointment. Wait here. Joan, believe me, as she went off into the darkness, leaving me there alone, I swear my head was spinning as if it were on a pivot. And as it spun, the thoughts in my head spun with it. Madden, dream, madden, dream, madden, dream, madden, dream, madden, dream, madden, dream. dream, What was happening to me? And then a thought. Had what I'd feared all my life happened at last? Had I died? Dead. 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 John. I remember the wind Dead. suddenly was cold about me. Dead. But I was... Dead. Colder. Dead. Was I? And then someone was standing by me. Not the girl, but a man. Smooth, young, handsome face with those old, wise eyes looking at me. He said... You have not started yet, Atavar. No. No. Strange I've never seen you before. There are so few Atavars. You know, generally, they are not permitted to develop. And looking at him, I knew I was alive. Of course. And dream? This was no dream. Yes, there are so few Atavars. I said, Atavar? Atavars? What the devil are Atavars? You are a strange one. Well, tell me, what are Atavars? Why call me an Atavar? Well, because you are. You are not like us, you know. You are a throwback to the individualistic, unconditioned, embryonic development. Why? <laughs> but then, of course, you don't understand, do you? No, an Atavar wouldn't. Well, tell me. It is strange that they should have permitted you to develop and not to have explained to you the difference. What difference? What? 
once in every 2,000 births, and that means once in every 2,000 years, we don't have many new ones in this world, you know, something happens in the incubation process. And instead of one of us perfected ones, one of you develops. A throwback to ancient times, an imperfect creature out of the past. In other words, an atavism. Understand? An atavism. Atavism? Atavar? Atavism? What the devil's name was this? But he kept talking. He said, Yes, Atavar, though you are, life must be miserable for you as it is for the rest of us. Life? Miserable? Well, of course. Why else would you have joined with us? Oh, this is going to be a glorious night for us. But not for them. I... I don't understand exactly what <laughs> Of course not. Things would be confused for the out of our mind, wouldn't they? That's the infernal trouble with our minds. Things are much too clear and concise and understandable. And they bred all the confusion out of us a long time ago. Well, now they'll pay for it. Please, tell me... Just look at me. I've lived just a handful of years, 250. He said that, John. Just believe me, 250 years. And yet, believe me, Atavar, I'm weary unto the death we'll never know. Death we'll never know. What good is there in it for any of us living forever? Living forever. For the first 50 years of our lives, they condition us. All right. We come out with our brains filled with all knowledge of all time. Paragons all. Geniuses all. But what good does it do us? What good? Always they are in the way. They? Look, Adava, you can't be so completely a fool that they would never have let you out. They are the old ones. And what is interesting and exciting in the world, they do. They and no one else. And we who came after them, after they conditioned the world against sickness, illness, age, and death, we have nothing left to do. I see. They hold the key position. They. And we stand by and grind the weary years away in nothingness. A world of youth full of the want to do and there's nothing to do. And yet there are worlds out there where we might go, but again they stand in our way and say, no, it shouldn't be done. They. They, the old ones, all around us, holding us down, giving us everlasting life, and then giving us nothing to live for. This night will change it. You and I and the rest of us, 24. Well, here comes your partner and I must go with mine. Goodbye, Atavar. Good luck. He was gone. And then the girl at my side, under her arm, a small black box. All right, we can go now. She took my arm. We walked along. In almost a moment, we were in a straight, broad street. Straight, shiny, glistening, bright with a light I've never seen. Quiet, empty street, clean, bright, and strange, as if in a dream. A dream? This was no dream. And then she said... In here. We stepped upon a platform, part of the sidewalk that was moving, carrying us swiftly, swiftly down the street. An escalator, moving sidewalk, I don't know what. Faster, faster, things rushing by, strange towering buildings. And then I heard that she was talking to me. I saw you talking to Arlo. He has the easy one. We've a hard one. 250 years, he said. Arlo? Yes, that's true. Live 250 years? It isn't much, I know. You must be older. Or are you? Hard to tell with an Atavar. How old are you? I? 400. 400 years. But not of living. What do you mean? You know. They, with all their years. Before we were born, they took the work of the world. And what is left for us? To wander up and down. Pretty ornaments with empty lives. But they forgot one thing. They left ambition in us. And this night we'll find a place to use it. How? Adavar, you are a fool. You know and yet you don't know. How can we find a place for ourselves as long as they do as they please? In the very ancient world, men lived a few years and then died. And they thought that was horrible, but that was good. For when they died, there was a place for youth. Yes. One would fall in his place and a young one took his place. Sometimes he did better than the one who had gone before, so the world progressed. But now no one falls. No one dies. And so the old ones stay and stay and stay and we, the young ones, have no place. And when we want to make a place, the old ones say no. The thing we were riding climbed higher. Higher. And still she talks. We've seated in the petition and they do not listen. So tonight we act. You and I, Adafar, one of twenty-four. Act? By turning back the time to when men died and gave the younger ones their place. What? The wrong of each man died with him when he died in that old world. And so tonight we'll see that wrongs are given their belated rest. How? You and I, Adafar, we'll do our part up there. She was pointing up. I looked up to where the building ended. In a cloud. She sits up there. 
5,000 years she's lived every day since the day science got out there. 5,000 years, but tonight we begin to live. Here. Into my hand, she thrust the black container. I said, what? You do it. You. In a moment, we reach the fire. She'll come out all smiles and happiness. They can be happy, the old ones who have the work. Do it, then. You must. What? Throw it at her, and she'll be free of life, and we'll be free of life without living. You'll do it at her while you will. Throw it at her. Throw it? What? The thing in my hands? What did she mean, to free that person up there from life? The weight in my hands. Then, suddenly, I realized some kind of explosive. She expected me to throw it at that person up in the tower. Me to kill. You will. You will. No. No. The word tore through my head, and with it tore away confusion. I knew... I understood. This was the world of the future where science had doomed the death I feared. Men lived forever, and these young ones had no chance. And now they were out to kill and make their chance, and I was to kill for them, with them. You will. You will. You will. No. You I will. Not you will. Not you will. Mine. You will. Go back. You will. I'm saying that. You I will. will. There she is, the matriarch. Throw it. Throw it. I won't kill. Not I. I won't. Give it. Get me back! Get me! Go! I jumped. Falling. I was falling through the horrible space of that horrible future. Down and down and down. The glistening sides of the building rushing past me. Down. Twisting. Clawing at the air. Down and down. And then I remembered in my arms that explosive. I tried to throw it with my hands tight around it. I couldn't unlock them. The ground coming up. I screamed. And there I was. Sitting next to you in the hall where I'd been before. The politician upon the stage. My friends around me. You next to me frightened at my cry. <laughs> and the roof quite intact above me. So here it ends, Joan. Sitting there, I Stepped ahead in time until a day when men had conquered death. And so somehow I... I'm not afraid of him, the one at my shoulder anymore. Because I think it's good that men should live, then die, and so end the evil in them, and give their place to others. Tell me, Joan, do you agree? Beautiful that the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly remold again and ever again the face of this soiled world. presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you transcribed a story of a very ordinary family and what happens when a UFO lands in their backyard. We call it Heavens to Betsy. So now, starring True to Marson and High Aberback, here is tonight's suspense play, Heavens to Betsy. people might call what happened to the Doyles a fantasy, or an allegory, or mass hysteria, or just about anything. But it happened, no matter what you call it. And you couldn't convince the government, a half dozen army men, and the Doyles that it didn't. In particular, you couldn't convince Betsy Doyle. The day it started wasn't much different to any other day. It was about five o'clock in the evening, 
and there was a thunder and rainstorm hanging around the suburb where the Doyles lived. Henry Doyle was still at the bank, about to leave for home. Betsy Doyle was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and eight-year-old Dickie Doyle was listening to the radio. <laughs> so, Captain Spaceman, you are ready to tell us where you have hidden the galactic aster prism? Never, Pathos. With all your secret knowledge, if you're really so smart, you should be able to use your Vizio autoscope and find out for yourself. Unfortunately, while you put up such a tremendous, although useless, struggle against the royal soldiers of Gramic, the Vizio autoscope was smashed. It will take two days to repair it, and I cannot afford to wait. That's too bad, Pathoth. Then I am afraid I have no other alternative. Darn it. Are you all right, dear? Oh, sure, Mom, but the darn radio... Oh, it must radio. have been a thunderbolt. It was awfully close. I felt it. shook the house. Frightened me to death. Oh, Mom, it's an electrical storm, that's all. Well, that's all it is to you, but I don't like it. Hope your father gets home early. I hate him being out in this. Oh, radio. Well, maybe a tube's gone out. I'll take it. No, a you won't. Don't you touch that thing. You turn it off right now. But Captain Spade... I don't care. It's dangerous having the radio on in a storm like this. Oh, Mom, it's silly. Please. Please do as I ask you, Dickie. Makes me nervous. Okay. You can help me in the kitchen if you want. Oh, I guess I'll read a book or something. Why don't you bring it in the kitchen and read it? You can keep me company. I wish you would. Okay, Mom. Hello? Oh, hello, Bet. Uh, are you all right over there? Ella? Hi. Oh, sure, we're fine. Wasn't that something? I thought it was right on the house. Oh, I was scared, too. I, I, I looked out the window and I saw the flash. It uh, looked like it was in your backyard. Oh, thank heavens it wasn't. Uh, must have been on the other side of the tree. Oh, I guess so. Honey, I've got to get back to my dinner. I'll call you back. Oh, okay. That's how it started. The great flash, the explosion, and there was only static to speak for the radio. Dickie took his latest space science comic book to the kitchen and became lost in willowy women of the future and their comrades in bravery, super ray gun armed, invincible globe headed granite jawed heroes. His mother prosaically made dumplings for the stew. It was five minutes to six when the phone rang again. Will you get it, dear? My hand. Sure, Mom. Hello, Bets. This is Richard Doyle. Oh, well, Dickie, uh, th this is Mrs. Gilbert, dear. Is everything all right over there? Can I talk to your mother? Mom's making dumplings. She can't come to the phone. Oh. Well, ask her what that funny glow is over your way. Is there a fire in the woods? D did the thunderbolts hit fire to something? I don't see anything. No fire around here, Mrs. Gilbert. Besides, the rain would put out a fire. Well, there is something glowing, Dickie. I can see it from my window. I, I, I don't know why you can't. It, it's right out there near your house. Maybe it's out the back. I'll take a look, Miss Gilbert. All right, dear. Who is it, Dickie? Miss Gilbert, Mom. She says there's a, a, a glow around here somewhere. Glow? Yeah, she thought it was a fire. I'm going to take a look out back. Oh, no, you're not. It's pouring out there. You can pull up the shade and see out the window. Okay. I'll be glad when your father gets home. I don't like these storms. Dicky, will you... <gasps> What's that? I don't know, Mom. I... I guess it's what Mrs. Gilbert was talking about. Kind of a... a glow. Oh, it's in the backyard. It's on fire. No, no, it isn't. It's, it's just a... a something... Shining like... Pull down the shade. Pull down the shade. Hurry. Hurry. Oh, okay. Oh, my. Oh, don't you be scared. We've got to think. What would your father do? Maybe we'd better just... You better give your old man a kiss. Hi, oh, son. I didn't, yeah. darling. I didn't hear you come in. No, I guess you didn't. I'm so... Dear, there's something out there. Where? In the back. We saw it. No! Oh, you mustn't go out. I don't get it. What? Look. See, Dad? All shiny and glowy. Where'd that come from? I don't know. Ella called and said she saw it from her house, didn't she, Dickie? Yeah. Oh, hey, oh hey, all right. Quiet, son. We've, we've got to investigate this. Yeah, but... Son, Dad... there's something out there, all right. No question about that. 
Can't see too well. The shrubs are in the way. It's like neon lights, only all over. You going out there, Dad? Can I come with you? Son, this is one of those times I was telling you about. Fools rush in where brave men fear to tread. Do you remember me telling you that? Yes, Dad. Well, this is one of those times. Mr. Doyle turned back to the window and stood staring out into the wet night, softly radiant from the glow in his backyard. He was a man to whom the unusual rarely, if ever, happened. A man who in his teens dreamed of adventure and heroism, and his twenties dreamed of adventure and heroism, and now in his late thirties still dreamed of adventure. The heroism, at least, was tempered by knowledge of his own weaknesses. His life had been ordinary, and he could never completely forgive life for that. Now there was something out there in the night, and he knew that it was the beginning of a great moment. He thought, I don't know what it is, but it's different. I can feel it. I know it. I'm a little afraid to go out and see, but I want to. It's my chance, whatever it is. It's come to me, to Betsy. It might even... Dad? Dad, what do you think? What do you think it is? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes, son, I, I was looking at it. Uh, this is a time for caution. Betsy, go up and get my pistol, will you? No! No, I will not. You call the police, the fire department. It's not call... a fire. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing. Probably perfectly harmless, but I want to make sure. Oh, Henry, Dickie, please. get my pistol, will you? Oh, boy, sure, Dad. Be right there. I don't want you to go out. Henry, if you love me, you'll... I love you, and I'm going to find out what it is. Oh, here you are, Dad. Thank you, son. Well, if you're going, I'm going too. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Dickie, you get my raincoats in the hall. Okay, Mike. Honey. There's no use talking. I'm going. What... What do you think it is in the yard? I don't know. But I've got an idea. Oh, here, Mike. Can I come too, Dad? Can I? No, son. You stay here. Oh. All right, Henry. I'm ready. All right. Come on and stay behind me. You understand? I'll watch from the window. Yes, you do that, son. Well, we'll get a good look at it when we get past the shrubs. Henry! Look! You wanted to know what it is? I'll tell you. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world. I knew it would happen someday. It's a UFO, that's what it is. A flying saucer! Listening to Heavens to Betsy, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Driving tonight? CBS Radio hopes you're not taking any chances. It takes only a split second to turn a gambler into a corpse on today's highways. Keep in line when your vision ahead's obscured. Keep well back of the car in front of you. When you ride up on his tailpipe, you're assuming all his risks, too. Don't pass until you've got a clear lane for it with no opposing traffic in it for a safe distance and then some. Play it smart and survive. And now, we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, Trudem Arson and High Aberback, starring in tonight's production, Heavens to Betsy, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. That's what it was, all right. No longer an unidentified flying object, but a very real flying saucer. Henry Doyle believed in saucers, and this one had landed in their backyard and lay in the mud, glowing, a soft, rich, silvery glow. They were lost in excitement, and with it went their normal earth-like fear. Together they walked around it. 
Well, I figure uh, eight feet long and uh, three wide and uh, about two feet high. Wouldn't you say that, Bets? Mm, I guess so. There's no door, no windows or anything. How are the people going to get out? I don't know. I don't know. What's that? Hmm? Siren. Somebody else must have seen it. I'll bet it's the police. Yeah. Yeah, I w- wouldn't be surprised. Come on, let's get inside. What are you going to do? If they come here, you let me do the talking. I don't want you or Dickie to say a word. But Henry, I... want I, you to I, promise me this is the most important thing in our lives. I mean it, Bets. You promise? I've got into you, Henry. It's so funny, I... All I right, don't... all right, I, I'll tell you. Th- this thing, this saucer, it doesn't surprise me, see? I've known this was going to happen. I'm not like those people who laugh and make jokes about it. I knew it was coming. Up there, up up there on some planet, it's been planned for a long time, a a billion miles away. They didn't surprise Henry Doyle, though. No, no. This is big. Bigger than you can imagine. And maybe we're the first people in the world to know about it. That's why. From here on, on, no matter what happens, I want you to let me do the talking. Do you understand? Yes, Henry. Uh, is something wrong, officer? Well, that's what we want to find out. I got a call from a Mrs. Gilbert down the road. Said she called you a few minutes ago, and the kid answered, and then went away and didn't come back. Oh, gee, the phone. I forgot. Mom, Mrs. Gilbert. Well, what's it all about? Uh, what, what's what all about, officer? Well, Mrs. Gilbert says there's a light or a glow or something over here. Well, I don't know. You got a thing that glows here? I couldn't figure out what she was trying to say. Well, nothing wrong here, is there, Bats? No. No, nothing. Uh, it beats me. Well, Mrs. Gilbert is kind of nervous in storms. You know how it is. Dad, aren't you going to tell Son, you better get your hands washed for supper. Supper time, isn't it, dear? Heavens, yes, and everything will be ruined. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm sorry you had the trip for nothing, officer. Well, no, I'm glad everything's all right. Maybe we better take a look out back just to be on the safe side, huh? What? Why? I was just out there. It's fine. All the same. Can't take chances, you know. Uh, back door through here. N- now, listen. This is my house. A man's house is his castle. If anything were wrong, I wouldn't be telling you everything's okay, would I? Well, we'll just take a minute. Dinner's ready, dear. Well, you go ahead, folks. I'll take a... Oh. What's that? What? That. Well, I don't see anything. What do you got out there? Something on fire? Oh, that. Oh, nothing. J- just a lighting arrangement. C- kind of pretty, don't you think? Lighting? That's no Lighting. Both of you stay here. No funny business. I'm going to take a look. The officer took a look. Didn't believe what he saw. Took another look. And the secret was out. He put in a call for the riot squad and waited. Henry thought for a while. Then a slow anger grew in him. It was his flying saucer. Betsy's flying saucer. It belonged to the Doyles. More than that, he knew it was his one chance for fame to offset the dull obscurity of his daily life. Henry Doyle objected, and because she loved her husband, Betsy objected. You've no right to do this, officer. Ah. You're trespassing on my property, and you haven't got a warrant. Ah. There's no good saying, ah. My husband is right. That saucer is mine. It's on my land. My land is paid for. It belongs to me. Disturbing a piece. Disturbing you. It isn't disturbing us. It isn't disturbing anybody. It's just sitting. Well, there's enemies inside. Who said they were enemies? Well, it's a fake. You just said it was full of enemies. Now, look, lady. This thing's got me real upset. I I don't know what I'm saying. I'm scared if you want to know. But I'm a police officer and I got a job to do. And I'm staying here until I'm told otherwise. (laughs) The riot squad came, the sergeant, followed by the inspector, followed by the chief of police. Henry Doyle said, This is my house, my property, my flying saucer. You have no warrant. Get out of my house. Get off my property. Betsy agreed with every word. Then the FBI came, followed by some extremely important gentlemen in uniform. Henry was not impressed. I don't care what you say. In the morning, I'm going to see a lawyer. No, no, I'm going to get the federal district attorney. A man's house is his castle. You're all trespassing. Uh, Now, listen, Mr. Doyle. No, you listen, General. Uh, Sure. I know you're real interested in my saucer. 
course, when a few other fellows like me were trying to convince you they existed, you laughed at us. Well, now I'm laughing. Ha ha. My wife's laughing, too. It's in our backyard. It stays there. But have you any idea what kind of beings are in it? Did you ever stop to consider that they may be hostile to the earth? Well, that's my tough luck, not yours. It's my bit of earth. You're not going to touch that saucer. Right. A man's home is his castle. Right. Castle. The next morning, Henry Doyle proved it. He conferred with the U.S. District Attorney, who in turn conferred with Washington. And the upshot of all this was... The object now resting in the backyard of Mr. Henry Doyle is, until proved a menace to public welfare, or hostile to these United States, his property, and shall remain inviolate. The Army didn't agree. Neither did the police or any other law enforcement agency. A battery of heavy guns, eight tanks, a machine gun unit, two flamethrowers, as well as a picked company of commandos were brought to the scene. The road was blocked off, and the siege of the Doyle's residence began. Five days later, the saucer lay, still glowing quietly, and Mr. and Mrs. Doyle stood by the incinerator watching it. Betsy surmised... If they're afraid of us, you'd think they'd try and get away. Well, uh, maybe they're biding their time. Must all be as strange to them as it is to us. <laughs> Fine welcome they must think they're getting. That is, if they've got some kind of instrument inside that can see what's out on the road. You know, I still can't understand how the people inside the saucer get out. It's funny. I've been over the thing a dozen times. There isn't even a seam I can see. Do you think maybe we ought to let those scientists take a look at it? They can't hurt oh, us. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, don't you start. This is ours. You let one of those fellows get a hand on it, and the next thing you'll know, we won't have our flying saucer anymore. No, no. Dad? No, what is it, son? There's about 40 men at the front door. They're from newspapers. They want to talk to you. Oh. All right. Uh, tell them to wait. I'll be there in a minute. Okay, Dad. Oh, Henry. It is wonderful, isn't it? Nothing like this has ever happened to us. I never thought it would. <laughs> You know, old catacomb at the bank called me yesterday. Offered me the vice presidency. No! Yeah. I didn't tell you because that's nothing to what offers we'll get. Honey, this is our big moment. It's our big moment in history. History bets. I'm not going to let this get away from us. I've waited all my life for it. What are you going to tell the newspaper men? Whatever they want to know. Uh, come on. We'll see them together. Gentlemen, the gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Now, 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 gentlemen, you, uh, you've asked my opinion of the object. Uh, do I think it is a ship from out of space? But, so, gentlemen, uh, my answer is yes. In due time, as soon as the government and I come to terms and that ridiculous show of force outside my house is withdrawn, uh, you will be allowed to see the thing and uh, to take your picture. Well, gentlemen, that's, uh, that's all I can say for the moment. I, I know you'll excuse me. There are many things to attend to. Oh, Henry. Henry, you're wonderful. You sounded just like a senator. Even a president. Oh, no, no. I'm still plain old Henry Doyle, your loving husband, whose home is his castle. A senatorial committee came to investigate. Henry was polite, allowed them to see his saucer but no more. And the word spread until there wasn't a corner of the globe that didn't know about Henry Doyle and his flying saucer. A week later, the Supreme Court was in session debating the district attorney's decision. The country was divided. Half said the saucer belonged to Henry. The other half thought it was a shame. They never quite made clear what the shame was, but it was. The Doyles never budged. But it was the small Doyle, Dickie, who one evening, three weeks after the thing had landed, noticed what was taking place in the backyard. Dad? Mom? The saucer? What about it? Something's happening to it. What? The light's going out. Oh, that's silly. It could It is. He's right. 
It's not as bright as it was. You can almost see it getting dimmer. What do you think's happening? I don't know. Maybe they're going to come out now. I don't know. Henry. I'm afraid. Oh, no. No, you don't have to be. Something's wrong with it. I can feel it. Oh, no, that's silly. It's the people inside I'm worried about. Maybe it's the power supply or their own special air... I'm afraid. It's It's getting dark awful quickly, Dad. We've got to do something. What? Maybe the scientists. Yeah, that's it. The scientists. You go and call them. They're at the Grand Hotel. All of them. Hurry, Betsy. The scientists came. Brave and wise, they rapped on the thing, listened with super stethoscopes, took readings on wonderful electronic devices, and shook their heads. That night, at exactly 11.04 p.m., the glow went out. And as it did so, the saucer began to shrivel, grew smaller and smaller. The group watched silently. Can somebody help? It's just melting away. What can you do? It's dying. Henry, it's dying. We've got to help. I don't know. If we could get a sample of the substance, but we can't make a oh, difference. Oh, I won't have you banging on it like that when it's dying. Stop it. Stop it. Honey, Bets. I mean it. Let it alone. It's no use anyway. It'll be gone soon. You can stop. It isn't any good. It was alive, Henry. It was alive. Honey, no. No. There were people in it. People from another planet. They couldn't live on Earth, that's all. No, no, air... no, you're wrong. I feel as if I've lost... Oh, I don't know, like losing Dickie. I tell you, it was alive. There wasn't anyone inside. That's it. That thing is all of it. You're tired, Mrs. Doyle. Why don't you go inside? Oh, you're fault. A woman knows. It was an animal, or, or maybe like us, only made differently. It was alive. And now it's dying. <laughs> It's almost gone. Yes. It's too bad we couldn't have examined it earlier. Dad, listen. It's gone. Yes. Did you hear that sound? Yes. Almost like a voice sighing. I wonder. I wonder. On the spot where the thing had rested, there was nothing, not a fragment. And although they didn't know why, the scientists and Henry Doyle stood for five minutes, just looking. Nobody spoke a word. And there was a great quiet, a sadness in the air. I feel sad. Strange. I I do, too. Dad, why are you crying? Am I? That's funny. Mom was crying, too. What's happened? They all went away, silently. The scientists, the guns and tanks the soldiers and police. And finally, only the Doyles were left in their house, which was their castle. Do you really think it was alive? Yes. I think it was hurt and fell down. and We didn't understand. If I hadn't been so selfish, wanting to keep it to myself, we might have saved it. No. No, it's probably better this way. You know, everybody felt what you felt. Sad. Even the general. And the scientists. I wonder what it was. Where it came from. Somewhere up there. Perhaps one day, another will come.
Suspense. In which Truda Marson and High Everback starred in tonight's presentation of Heavens to Betsy. Be sure to be listening for next week's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and transcribed by Anthony Ellis, who wrote tonight's script. The music was composed by Rennie Garrigan and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Victor Perrin, Byron Kane, Richard Beals, Virginia Eiler, Barney Phillips, and Howard McNear. Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. flying lost and alone over the empty wastes of the Pacific, while the fury of a typhoon is tearing your plane to pieces, and on a desolate island ahead of you awaits the strangest adventure in the knowledge of man. Listen now as Escape brings you Nelson Bond's famous story, Conqueror's Isle. to believe this. I know it sounds impossible. It, it, it sounds crazy. But you've got to believe it. That's why I'm here. It's the truth and you've got to believe it. You've got to, sir. That's the way he started almost as soon as I'd walked into his hospital room. He wasn't violent, you understand. There was no need for restraint. But his every action, every gesture was evidence of a psychotic condition to be extremely charitable, battle fatigue. It was an odd case. I was already well acquainted, of course, with the history. Graduate of Annapolis, lieutenant in the fleet air arm, excellent records, citations for bravery, and so forth. Toward the end of the war, he and his bomber crew disappeared over the South China Sea. Search failed to turn them up. They were, of course, presumed to be lost. Then a month ago, almost seven years later, Lieutenant Brady was found by a Brazilian freighter alone, drifting, and nearly dead in a tiny life raft. Curiously enough, his position was not far from that last reported by his radio operator seven years earlier. And when he was asked where he had been, he gave a story so fantastic, so completely unbelievable. It's the truth, and you've got to believe it. You've got to, sir. At ease, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, sir. I'm here to consult with you as a physician, not ordering you anything. Suppose we forget the braid while you tell me about it. Yes, sir. Where should I begin? Well, it's your story. You know what it is you want me to believe. Somebody's got to do something, Doctor. It's getting later, and every day that passes, they grow stronger. I, I, I've got to make people understand. I've got to make you understand. At the beginning? Suppose you start with that last flight at the end of the war. Yes, sir. I, I, I get a... Well, it was this way. We, we'd finished our mission, and we were starting for home. Over the South China Sea, between the Philippines and Indochina, roughly off Palawan, and everything was peaches and cream. The Arden Alice was purring along like a dream, and I was sitting here chewing up a pack of gum, thinking about how good that can of cold beer was going to taste, when the intercom cracked off in my ear. Lieutenant, Jap Freighter, 10 o'clock. Huh? Yeah, you're right. Looks like a tramp. That's what I figure. Have we still got Bertha? Yes, sir. Okay, maybe we can have some fun. Red 4 to Mac. Red 4 to Mac. Go ahead, Red 4. Jeff Freighter, 10 o'clock. Check. We're carrying a Bertha. How about it? Why not? It's your party. Go ahead. And good luck. Roger and out.
back, and that Jap ship went up like a Roman candle. Hey, hey, nice going, Lieutenant. Right on the button. That's one, Jap, we won't have to worry about anymore. Lieutenant, we're hit. Huh? piece of that Jap must have come up and hit us. We're spraying gas all over the Pacific, out of the left wing tank. Yeah, I see it. Well, guys, get ready for a bath. We'll never make it back. I object. It ain't Saturday night. Never mind. I always did want to take a ride on one of them little rubber boats. Maybe you'll be out to get us before we have a chance to get thirsty. Red four to Mac. Red four to Mac. Nice going, fella. Yeah, only it was a two-way deal. We're hit, Mac. Losing gas fast. Think you can make it? No, it's a soft bath for us. Sorry, fellas. Keep your radio on. Give your last position to base before you ditch. They'll have a rescue party out in an hour. We'll call. See you tonight. Good luck. Over. Roger and out. See, there was nothing to it. Happened every day. The ships all over the Pacific, they'd have a destroyer sitting here when we came down almost. But a half hour later, when our gas was down to a few cupfuls and the rest of the squadron was long out of sight, an amazing thing happened. One minute, the sky was clear and cloudless. The next minute, we were surrounded by thunderheads and a typhoon hit us. Holy cow, Lieutenant, where'd this come from? I don't know, but it's a Lulu. Fast your safety belt, there's no telling what this will do to us. a granddaddy typhoon, all right, but it lasted only a few minutes, and then we were out of it as miraculously as we'd come into it. And then something else happened. I guess we all saw it about the same time. Well, what do you know? Take a look at that sight for sore eyes. Man, oh man, it looks mighty fine to me. What island is it, Lieutenant? I don't know. At the way we got tossed around back there, I haven't any idea of our position. We could be anywhere from the coast of China to the Philippines. Who knows? Who cares? It's dry land. Just in time. We're out of gas. Take a bearing and radio our position, Jack. We're going down. We landed safely on a little strip of sandy beach, and only after we climbed out of the plane did we begin to have any misgivings. What do you think, Skipper? Well, it doesn't look like much, but... I don't see anybody. Not a sign of life. I got a good look from topside coming down. There weren't any houses, nothing. Still, you can't tell. There could be Japs. Or worse. Headhunters, maybe? We'd better stick together, stay close to the plane. It shouldn't be more than a few hours before... Yeah, we... except that I... Hello! Hey, what told it? Hello there! It's a white man. Hey, what is this? Keep your eyes open. It might be a trap. Yeah, but he's a white man. He speaks English. And he's not armed. No, I don't see any guns. It's the same. Watch it. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. I saw you land, so I hurried out to see if I could be of any assistance. May I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Grove. I'm Lieutenant Brady, uh, Radio Man Kavanaugh, my gunner, Sergeant Golick. It's a pleasure, gentlemen. Any of you in need of medical assistance? No, thanks. We're all okay. Just a little surprised to find anyone here. <laughs> yes, of course. That can be explained to you later, but uh, now you'll be wanting food and rest. Hey, a little chow wouldn't be bad, huh? But first, we have to get in touch with our base, give my position. Of course, but such things take some time in these primitive areas. Oh, no, we have a radio in the plane. I did have, Skipper. I was starting to tell you. Went out just before we sighted the island. Must have got wanged up in the storm. But you can fix it. I guess so, if it's nothing serious. I'll tell you better after I get a chance to go over it. Of course, but in the meantime, I hope you'll accept our humble hospitality. Now, if you will follow me. How about it, Skipper? Sure, why not? After the last half hour, we could all use a little relaxation. <laughs> Very good. Right this way, please. We should have smelled it right then. There was something strange about the whole thing. There were a lot of questions in my mind, but I didn't ask them. Instead, we walked down the jungle path behind Dr. Grove like lambs to the slaughter. Tom Golan must have had the same misgivings because he whispered in my ear. I don't get it, Skipper. Don't get what, Tom? Where'd this guy come from? Where's he hang out? When we were coming in, I took a good look at this island. There were no houses, no nothing. I don't know. I guess we'll find out soon enough. Yeah. Holy cow! Will you look at that. The rock. Here we are, gentlemen. She will be good enough to enter. Enter what? That? Oh, 
Don't be alarmed. It's only an elevator. The entrance is from the ground floor. An elevator? In this jungle? I don't get it. You mean to tell me you live underground? My dear lieutenant, I'll be glad to explain everything later. It's all very simple, but first I must insist in Insist? Suppose we prefer not to get into your elevator. Then what? Then I should be compelled most regretfully to enforce my request. Yes, again, pal. We've got guns. Three guns. Lieutenant, would you be kind enough to fire your gun? If you have qualms about killing a man in cold blood, you might fire it in the air. Wait a minute. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Perhaps you'd care to stop me, Lieutenant. I'm warning you. I'll... What? Try again, Lieutenant. I'm afraid you're going to find that your guns will not work on this island. The skipper is right. Mine won't work either. Neither will mine. And now perhaps you will be kind enough to step into the shaft. Look, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't want any part of it. Come on, gang, let's get out of here. Just a minute. I'm sorry, you, you forced me to use harsh measures. Believe me, I do so reluctantly. What's that you got there? Just a small tube, but a very potent weapon, I must warn you. Yeah? Well, then you better use it fast. I made a desperate lunge for him, and suddenly... a tiny shaft of light flicked out from the tube and touched me, and I stopped. Frozen in my tracks... Conscious, my eyes open, seeing him, hearing him. But try as I would, I couldn't move a muscle. I seemed to be turned to stone. Paralyzed, you understand? Completely paralyzed, Dr. Gorham. I had all my senses. I, I could see and hear and feel, but I couldn't move a muscle, not even turn my eyes. And you say this happened because of some kind of light beam? Well, not exactly a beam. Perhaps not exactly a light, just a kind of, of radiance. Uh, and then? And then some other men came out of the elevator. They picked us up and carried us. I could feel their hands very softly as if they were far away from my body, as if there were layers of rubber between them and me. And I could hear Dr. Grove talking. Place them in the shaft. See him bending Bend over me, me into my line of vision. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I sincerely regret having to inconvenience you. But you see, just as we have the means of hampering your primitive mechanical devices, your guns, your radio, so do we have the means to enforce our requests. Requests which are... I assure you they're only reasonable and necessary under the circumstances. Very well. Take us down. My head was reeling. And fear was growing in me. Who were these men to talk of radio as a primitive device? What kind of men were they? Where were they taking the three of us? What, they were, what were they going to do with us? As if he'd read my thoughts, Dr. Grove leaned over me again. There is no need to be alarmed, Lieutenant. No need at all. Well, Freighter? I'm sorry, Freighter Dorden. It was necessary. They would not come willingly. I see. Few of them do. Oh, well, put them in sleeping chambers until they recover. And uh, be gentle. They're frightened. Poor things. Poor things. Poor things, he'd said. Not as if we were human beings at all, but animals. Some weak, dumb animals with whom they must be gentle. It was then that I began to know real fear. We were in a great underground city. But I could see little of it. Nothing except what passed in front of my rigid eyes. And then I, w I was carried into a room, deposited upon a soft couch and left alone. I couldn't close my eyes, but gradually the light began to fade, melt away. I was in deep blackness, and I slept. whether the return of the light awakened me or whether it came on automatically when I woke up. But the room was bright and I could move again. 
The room was a small cell with metal walls and ceiling, a kind of metal I'd never seen before. There was a couch, a desk, and a chair, nothing else. But the really amazing thing was the light. I searched the entire room carefully. But there were no fixtures, no indirect lighting arrangements. The light came out of the walls, the ceiling, the floor, evenly, filling the room, casting no shadows. Suddenly, I wanted to see Kavanaugh and Golder. I yelled, yelled at the top of my lungs. Kavanaugh! Golder! Kavanaugh! Golder! But the walls simply absorbed the sound into utter silence. I thought for a moment I was going mad. I heard someone's voice shouting, and I was surprised to find it was mine. Was I to be left here to die? Would no one ever hear my calls? I went to the door, banged on it. And as I leaned there with fear cold in my stomach, I heard a faint sound of footstep behind me. I whirled around just in time to see Dr. Grove stepping through the wall. You... you said he stepped through the wall, Lieutenant? Of course you mean through the door. Through the wall. Through the wall, sir. The door was in front of me. But Dr. Grove stepped into my cell through the solid metal wall. You realize that what you are saying is impossible. To us, it is. To them, nothing is impossible. Nothing. That's why we've got to do something now before it's too late. You must believe me, sir. This is man's last chance, all of us. We'll see. Uh, perhaps you'd better go on. This Dr. Grove stepped through the wall. Yes. Dr. Grove stepped into my cell through the wall, and at the sight of him, my panic ended. For some reason, he gave me a sense of peace. Perhaps it was awe. I don't know. And we talked, not as man to man, but as man to a lesser creature. You must not be frightened. You don't understand how I passed through the wall, which to you seems solid, and not understanding you feared. Yet, there's nothing supernatural or fearful about what I did. Any of us can do it. We simply make a necessary mental adjustment and walk where we will. It's an ability as basic to us as breathing to a person like you. What kind of men are you? You know the facts of evolution. You know how man has progressed through various stages from primitive savagery. Well, obviously, this process can and will continue. To suppose that evolution of man is complete with you is a mistake of conceit. You mean you are the next stage? Exactly. We are the next stage, infinitely superior to our parents and to our fellow men. Your most difficult physics and mathematics are our ABCs, our studies far beyond your understanding. Are there many of you? Oh, very many. You see, the process has been going on for many years. Hundreds, thousands more come here to us every year from all over the world where we need isolation to study, learn, build, and prepare ourselves. Prepare for what? For the task ahead. Obviously, when we are ready, when we are numerous enough to fill all the necessary positions, our superior intelligence must shape a new world. Take over the world? Obviously. And you'll destroy man? <gasps> How little you understand us. Do you destroy the animals of the field because they're not your intellectual peers? Our obligation is to keep and to protect you, to act as your friendly guardians in a world which will be strange to you and, and, and frightening, as my walking through the wall was frightening to you. Yes, I see. What do you plan to do with us, then? Oh, rather say, what does nature plan to do? And the answer to that... Well, that lies in history. What became of the anthropoids and the cavemen? They died out. Civilization passed them by. They, they, they fell before the onrush of higher forms of life. Even so. Even so. But I give you our pledge that we will be kind. We will be kind. <laughs> took me out into that great underground city through its corridors and great halls and laboratories and shops. Took me among the thousands of his fellow men. 
And there I saw marvels of which I could talk for hours. And then I met others like us. Some 200 captive chaps. People who'd stumbled onto this island as I had. There were famous names among them. A famous author whose ship disappeared in the Pacific years ago. A big game hunter, a famous aviatrix for whom a dozen fleets had sought in vain. All of us, prisoners. We were treated with great kindness. Made comfortable and relatively happy. We were their pets, you see. Their dumb animal pets. <laughs> For seven years I stayed there. After a while I ceased to struggle, even in my mind. I was defeated. And so I succumbed to the peaceful, bucolic existence that was my fate. At least that's what I thought. And then came that last day. Dr. Grove had made me his special pet. I was allowed to follow him about at his work, to talk to him at length. And on this day, he confided in me even more than usual. Well, Lieutenant, it's been a pleasant day. Yes, Doctor. You know, I shall miss having you with me when I'm gone. Gone? You're going away, sir? Oh, yes, very soon. But where? But out into the world, where you once lived. Why? Oh, there are many, very many of us there already. In strategic places, of course. An important politician here, an industrial magnate there, a famous author whose words are gospel to his readers. I will have my place, an important one. But I didn't know... Then it's already begun, this taking over. Oh, yes, definitely. The hour is close at hand. And then all of us, the, the whole world... Lieutenant, you know us now. You know that we will be kind. Kind. Yes, kind. <laughs> Suddenly, all the anger that was in me welled up. I didn't want to be a dumb animal, a pet for some superior being to be kind to. I didn't want that for my loved ones, my friends, my fellow men. That night at dinner, when they fed the prisoners in the big communal hall, I got a chance to talk to Tom Golder, my old gunner. He listened and then shrugged hopelessly. You'll succeed, Joe. You know that. No, Tom, no. Not if the world can be warned. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't make any difference. Besides, how could they be warned? If somebody could get away from here. Escape? That's impossible. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought. But listen, I got an idea. There's one flaw in their perfection. What? Their gentleness. Their kindness. They can't bear to hurt anyone. None of their weapons kill, but only paralyze temporarily. And they simply can't conceive of treachery from us. What are you driving at? I'm going to play on Dr. Grove's liking for me, his kindness. And I'm going to trick him. How? Tomorrow I'll ask him to take me up back to the plane to get pictures of my father and sister. Tell him I'm lonesome, suffering. He'll do it. I'm sure he will. <laughs> It's kind of you, Dr. Grove, to do this for me. Not at all, Lieutenant. I understand your feeling, but... With you leaving, I'd have no one... no one close. The pictures will make me feel a lot better. Oh, so I hope in the map your compartment. Sake. Oh, well, I hope for your sake they're still there. <laughs> Dr. Grove, look, over there. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I hope I didn't kill him. He had been kind, but I hit him hard. And then I broke out a life raft from the plane. I was almost afraid to look at it. But it was okay, even complete with supplies. It should have been rotted, but it wasn't. Maybe he had control over that, too. I don't know. I ripped the valve and threw it in the water. In five minutes, I was out beyond the breakers. I don't know how many days or weeks it was before they picked me up. But it was a long time. And I was more dead than alive. It was quite an experience for you, wasn't it? But you see, it doesn't matter with me. It's the other, the... You don't believe me either, do you? Well, Lieutenant, I... I'm glad now I heard your story. I'll make a report to my superiors. 
please be patient and try not to worry. Try not to worry. Good day, Lieutenant. Oh, get out. Get out, sir. Well, Commander Gorham, you talk to him. What's the verdict? What do you think? Clear case of persecution mania. An amazing form. I never heard a tale more complete and logical. Yes, I, I know what you mean. Do what you can for him. I'm afraid he's going to be here for a long time. Perhaps for as long as he lives. Turned loose, he might be dangerous. Uh, that's too bad. Nice boy, too. Floating four weeks on a life raft. That sometimes does things to a man's mind. Well, Doctor, how about lunch? No, thanks. I've got to run along. I have to turn in my report and recommendation on this case. Yeah, of course. See you later. I watched the man disappear down the hall. I stood there for a moment, lost in thought, seeing the face of that boy in there. It was hard to know how best to be kind to a boy like that. But I roused myself. I had much to do, so much. And if I went down through the lobby of the hospital, some fool would surely delay me, get me into a long-winded discussion. And there was nothing to discuss anymore. My report on the Brady case was closed. There'd be no more trouble from that source. And now there was no one in sight in the corridor. I wanted to get out of this place. So I turned and walked quietly through the wall. Building the space station. At the headquarters of the Commonwealth Space Project, Woomera, Captain Bob Britton, Mac and Hickey are asked to fly back to the components of the Orbiter X space station where Max Kramer, the leader of Unity, believes they are still waiting for him. When he returns, they are to plant a miniature radio beacon aboard his ship so that its movements can be traced from the ground. They are also to help him with the assembly of the space station. And, on its completion, they will send a signal to Woomera and make their getaway aboard a space chariot. The station is then to be taken over by a task force directed by Colonel Kent. Bob and the team agree to undertake their mission, and they are flown out to Orbiter X in a CSP ship which is screened by experimental deflectors. Shortly after they've been put aboard the workshop rocket at an altitude of a thousand miles, Kramer's ship ranges alongside, and they fear he may have seen them arrive. Their fears increase, as speaking over the intercom, he orders them to join him without delay. You have had your instructions. Carry them out. I want to hear it once, because you have quite a lot of explaining to do. Right, Mac. Right, Higgy. Well, this looks like it. Yeah, we must have been spotted. Yes, but we've still got a job to do. And if we cross to his ship, Unity 5, we can at least carry out the first part of it. We can plant the beacon. Yes, and you know, I ought to be the one to do it. Because you two will have to do most of the talking. Yeah, he's got something there, Bob. You see, yes. while you're trying to explain that we really haven't been away from here at all, and Kramer must have been seeing a mirage, I'll have chance to hide the beacon. Okay, Hickey, here it is. 
Slip it into your pocket. Thanks, Bob. And don't forget to switch it on when you plant it in Kramer's cabin. Try and hide it somewhere behind the panelling. Okay. Captain Britton, we are waiting for you. I ordered you to come over immediately. Why the delay? Quiet, chaps. I'm switching on my helmet transmitter. Hello, Dr. Kramer. After leaving us in zero gravity so long, you can hardly expect us to move quickly. We've checked our pressure suits. We're preparing to enter the airlock now. Then hurry up. All right, fellas. I've cut the transmitter again. We can talk freely. Uh, Grab your jet pistols and we'll cross over. Okay. Uh, one point, Bob. Yes? What shall we do with the portable deflector set? Well, it's as safe here as anywhere. It looks like a standard toolbox. And the unit is not likely to start taking it to pieces. No, I, I suppose not. Right. Close helmets and turn on intercom. And remember, from now on, Kramer will be able to hear us. So be careful what you say. Okay. Uh, uh, let's go then. Okay, Bob. The ship is pretty close, so we probably won't need to use our jet pistols to get across. Hello, Captain Britton. Yes, Kramer. You will not require jet pistols. You will leave them behind in the airlock. Very well, if you say so. Our pressure zero, Mac. Right. The hatch of our airlock is open and ready for you. So I see. Oh, look at the earth down there. The sun's just coming up over the coast of Africa. Never mind Africa, Hickey. Just concentrate on that open hatch. Are you ready? Yes, ready. Then, over we go. Oh. All aboard Unity 5. Into the airlock. Close up. Remember the first time we went through this routine, Bob? Yes, I say I do. A lot's happened since then. Yes, it has. Pressure normal. Helmets off. Okay, Mac, open the hatch. So, you are here at last. Yes, Kramer. And to begin with... I think you owe us an explanation. What was the idea of leaving us stranded for a week? There was trouble with our interference transmitter. We had to get back to Earth headquarters quickly. Well, you could have told us, couldn't you? We didn't consider it necessary at the time, did we, Gelbin? No, we had more urgent matters to think about. I see. Well, what sort of explanations do you expect from me? Can't you guess? No. My dear Britain, you're not really stupid. You know perfectly well what we want to talk to you about. I haven't the least idea. Then why do you think we are here? Look at the vision screen. What do you see? The component rockets of Orbiter X. Well? Well? We want a description of their contents and the method of assembly. The oh. assembly? <laughs> you find that amusing, McClelland? Uh, no. Zero G's got me, don't worry. You had better control yourself. Go on, Gilbin. Now then, Britain. If you look at the tracking screen, you will see we are not alone. We are, in fact, being joined by six more Unity ships. Yeah, yeah yes, yes, I see them. They are carrying the assembly crews who will work with you on the space station. At the moment, they are forming up alongside us. When they are in position, you will give us all a general idea of the assembly program. Yes, all right. Now, what we say will be broadcast on restricted transmission to our other ships. So I want you to be brief and to the point. Okay. Um, how many men are there on each assembly crew? Six or seven. And as far as possible, we shall keep them together in teams. Yes, we can do that, all right. But with all these ships of yours so close to the Earth, well, surely they're bound to be seen. I know about your electronic screens, but what about visual observation, Kramer? There is no cause for alarm, Captain Britton. You see, our deflectors serve a dual purpose. To a limited extent, they affect radar reflections, and we use them in conjunction with the interference transmissions. But they also deflect light waves. Ah, so that's it. Yes. The effect is not apparent at close quarters, but I assure you that our ships are quite invisible from the Earth. Here, wait a minute. What about the Orbiter X component? 
When we start moving them around, won't the people down there see that something's going on? No. The components will be fitted with deflectors, and as they are moved, their present positions will be taken by substitutes made of thin metal foil. Ah, so even when the station's assembled, it won't be seen from the ground? No. Your ground forces will have no idea that it has been assembled. Hello, Unity 5. This is Escort Commander calling Unity 5. The formation is now in position. Thank you, Escort Commander. Stand by for instructions. Right. Captain Britton, you can start by giving us a general picture of Orbiter X as it will look when it's assembled. That's all right. Well, it'll take the form of a wheel 200 feet across. Yes. The hub in the middle will be joined to the rim by two spokes. And the inside of the rim, which will be about 25 feet across, will contain our laboratories, workshops, living accommodation, and so on. The main entrance will be in the hub, of course. Yes, the crew will go in through an airlock in the hub, and lifts will then carry them along inside the spokes and through to the different departments in the rim. I take it there's some provision for artificial gravity? Well, the people who are actually inside the rim will have the full benefit of that, because the whole station will revolve steadily around the hub. Yes, and while we're on the subject of movement, Britain, as the station is set in a near-polar orbit, it will continue to circle the Earth in slightly less than two hours, correct? Yes, that's true. And because the Earth itself is spinning, every part of its surface will be visible from the station every day, yes? Yes, as a matter of fact, our main telescope will be able to pick out objects no more than a foot apart from one another. Which shows just how important the station will be as an observation platform. Its assembly is, in fact, a vital step towards establishing our unity world government. Now, Britain, a preliminary word about the assembly. Well, at the moment, we're more or less in the middle of the cluster of rockets which contain the station components. Mm -hmm. Our job is to open them up, fit them together into the complete unit. And uh, where do we start? Well, as you see, each rocket has a number on it. Hmm. Number one, which is alongside us, houses the central workshops. Yeah. We should actually start on numbers two and three, because they make up the central hub of the station. Right. Escort commander, do you understand? Our first two teams will work on the hub. We understand, sir. At the same time, the other teams can work on the next four rockets, which make up the spokes. Good. After the hub and the spokes have been assembled, our entire working force should then concentrate on the next, um, 20 rockets. Right. They're carrying the plastic self-seeding material, which has to be blown up to form the rim of the wheel. Mm -hmm. It's rather like the inner tube of a motor car tire. Yeah, and the tread on the tire is made from the rockets themselves. They form a bumper against meteorites. Mm. Yes, that's right. And to complete the picture, the remaining rockets in the cluster are carrying the solar generators, scientific equipment, and most of the gear that's needed for the research center and the space terminal. Excellent. There's just one other point. Yes? The men will travel between the rockets on small transporters, which we call space chariots. I see. But they'll actually steer the components into position with their ordinary jet pistols. Yes, I think that's about all. Thank you. The assembly crews will now leave their ships and report to the central workshops for more detailed instructions. Are there any questions? No, sir. We shall report to workshops immediately. Ah, yes, and don't forget, bring your own oxygen. <laughs> Hello, Hickey. <laughs> you seem very pleased with yourself, Hicks. Eh? Well, as an ex-petty officer, I'm uh, rather looking forward to getting down to work. You are, are you? Yes, on the assembly teams. Ah, they don't know they've been born yet. <laughs> They're going to work harder and faster than they've ever worked in their lives. That's if you'll give me a free hand with them. What do you say, Dr. Kramer? We seem to have overlooked one of our friend's outstanding qualities. Yes, Hicks. Within reason, you have a free hand. But remember, we shall be watching you. Aye, aye. But if you float around too much, I'll have you on the job as well. That's enough. Get into the airlock, all of you, and go back to the workshops. We shall follow. All right, chaps. Into the lock. Have you done the job, Hickey? Yes, I've planted the beacon. Oh, good man. <laughs> that was a piece of cake. I only hope they'll hear the signals at Woomera. <laughs> right. 
Report from number one landing platform, Colonel Kent. Yes? Captain Knight's coming straight along to the control room. Well, was his mission successful? Well, he told the platform officer he thinks it was. Well, doesn't he know? Apparently, he put Captain Britton and the others off close to Orbiter X, but he had to get away quickly. If anything's gone wrong, Sir Charles, I won't forgive myself for sending those fellows back. No. Perhaps we should have followed a more orthodox line of attack. But if we came out into the open, this man Kramer would certainly be driven to action. Yes, he'd start his campaign right away. What are the latest observatory reports on Orbiter X? Negative, sir. There's no signs of any intruders out there. And yet the interference transmissions are going on? Yeah, they are. So these Unity people are obviously screening some monkey business. Sir Charles, if Britain has put the beacon aboard Kramer's ship, and if we're able to track the signals back to the Earth and find the location of the Unity headquarters, what then? Well, the headquarters must be in somebody's country, so officially we should bring the matter to the attention of the United Nations. Ah, oh, dear. And again, Kramer would be in action. He'd be launching missiles on the world before the first debate even started. I rather imagine he would. Well, so what's the answer, uh, unofficially? We have missiles of our own, of course. Uh, that's what I was thinking. But a small, mobile force of experienced troops could be dropped into the headquarters, and they might be more effective in destroying the Unity organization. You see, they could probably find a list of the members. Members who are working in different parts of the world, perhaps. From Russia to America and, and the Commonwealth itself. That's true, yes. Colonel Kent, the beacon signals are coming through. Uh, what? Uh, yes, listen. This is magnificent. Yes. Get the direction finders onto them right away. So Captain Britain's really pulled it off. Yes, and he hasn't wasted much time. According to DF, Colonel, the signals are coming from Orbiter X. But there's nothing to be seen out there. That means the Unity ships have got visual screens. Yes, and it explains why Captain Knight had to come back fast. He could only just have got to the space station ahead of Kramer. Well, it proves a most important point, Kent. Our deflectors really work. Yes, they do. If they weren't 100% effective, Kramer would have spotted Knight's ship and it wouldn't be back here now. We wouldn't be hearing these signals, oh, either. Right you are. So when our whole fleet is fitted out with them, we really shall be able to go into action. And for the first time, the element of surprise will be on our side. Look, worried. What's wrong? Uh, plenty. Is anybody else here in the workshop? No, just the three of us. Good. Gelbin has just told me that Kramer and his ship are going to stay put right here until Orbiter X is complete. Oh, no. So the beacon will go on using up its batteries and sending out DF signals that won't get our ground boys anywhere. By the time Kramer does fly back to his headquarters, batteries will be exhausted. Well, can't we think of some excuse for getting him to go back now? Yeah, there must be something we can do. Well, yes, I think there is. We've got to get the beacon out of Unity 5 and transfer it to one of the other ships. Ah, yes. That's... You see, they seem to take it in turn to go back to their headquarters and collect supplies. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'm almost certain Unity 7 is probably the next one to make the trip. And when it does, it's going to take the beacon with it. So I've got to get aboard Kramer's ship and pick it up, right? Yes. Now, you know where you left it? Yeah, sure. I lodged it behind the panelling in one of the lockers. Good. Uh, can you get it out fairly easily? I don't know. I'll try. Okay, now I'll tell you what we'll do. I want to move fast because Kramer's alone on the ship at the moment. I'll come over with you, Hickey. Uh -huh. We can make the excuse that we want to give him a progress report on Orbiter X. Yes. I'll give him some guff about the way the components are being moved around. Now, while I'm holding his attention, it's up to you to do your stuff. All right. I'll have a go. Good. But well, whatever you do, don't let him catch you out. If that happens, you'll cotton on to the whole plan. You might even launch an attack on Woomera. You understand? Yes, I say I do. Can I come with you, Bob? No, I think two of us is enough, Mac. If we all go, Kramer might be suspicious. We don't want to strain his confidence too far. As it is, Hickey and I might just about get away with it. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Captain Britton. But in future, you will make proper arrangements before boarding my ship. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Kramer. And come alone next time. Uh, yes. I only brought Hicks along because he's so much in contact with the assembly teams. Yes, that's right. I'm afraid they're getting a bit careless. Oh? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, the, the thing is, um, if the components are moved into position too fast, you can't always stop them at the right moment. 
It's the old business of inertia, you know. Go on. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, the, the truth is, you see, the, the men have been pushing the stuff around much too fast. And the central hub of the station has taken some very hefty knocks from the spokes before they were locked into position. Was there any damage? Uh, no, not a lot, but if this sort of thing goes on... All right, no... all right, I'll speak to the teams myself. Uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, if you could just uh, come over here and look at the central monitor now, you you'll see two teams bringing a couple of sections of the rim together. You may see the sort of thing that happens. Yes, 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 quite. I understand. Oh, of course, it's... Well, well, it's pretty uncomfortable working inside pressure suits, you know. I mean, for hours on end. So, so I, I can't altogether blame the men when they when they do misjudge their, their speed and distances. Hmm. They are taking things steadily enough at the moment. Yes. Yeah, yes, I, I'm glad to see they are. We'll watch them care. What's happening? Uh, it's all right, don't worry. Hicks, what are you doing at that locker? Uh, the door was open, I just brushed against... Come it. away! What have you got in your hands? Yeah, turn it up. Here, Hickey, what is it? Let me see. Pigeon, stand aside. Now, Hicks, show me what you've got there. What are you getting at, Kramer? Do you think I'm a thief? Now, no, take it easy, Hickey. Get out of the way, Captain Britton. Hicks, I order you to let me see your hands. Now, look here, I don't like being accused. Do as I say. All right. There you are. I've got nothing. Hmm? I hope you're satisfied. I shall examine the locker. Oh, go ahead. If you think there's anything missing, you're wrong. Very well. Everything seems to be there. Of course it is. Now get out! Okay. And you, Britain, you can come back with your report. And come back alone. All right, I'll do that. I better get into the airlock, Hickey. Okay, Bob. Oh, you nearly gave me a heart failure, chum. Did you get the thing? Yes, but the case sprang open and I had to let it go. It slipped behind the panelling. There isn't a hope of getting it now. No. Anyway, I'm afraid the beacon's probably busted. Come in. Forgive me bursting in on you like Mr. Charles, but I've got some unpleasant news for you. Oh? Well... Oh. What is it, Kent? Well, I'm sorry to say the beacon transmissions have finally stopped. Oh, that's bad. I suppose the batteries have run out. Well, they shouldn't have yet. No, I I think the gadget must have developed a fault. It could have been knocked. Uh, anything could have happened. You don't think Cromer may have discovered it, do you? No, we would almost certainly have been in serious trouble. Cromer's no fool. If he'd found the beacon, he would very quickly have put two and two together. He'd have realized that we were after him. I've no doubt at all he would have taken violent countermeasures right away. Yes, I'm sure he would. So we can assume that Bob Britton and his chaps are still safe? Yes, I think so. I hope you're right. And assuming you are, all we can do now is to wait until they send the signal that the space station is complete. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You know, things have a habit of going wrong. Mm -hmm. We hoped that the beacon would give us the location of a Unity headquarters, but Kramer has obviously stayed with Orbiter X. Now... In the same way, there might be a hold-up in the next part of our plan. We might uh, never get the signal from Bob. So, you'd like to fly out to Orbiter X and see what's going on, is that it? Why, uh, yes. Uh, how did you know? <laughs> I, uh, I do have ideas of my own occasionally, and this one had occurred to me. Well, what do you say? My ship will be perfectly screened by the deflectors, and I shall be able to see exactly what's going on up there. With a bit of luck, I might even manage to shadow one of the Unity ships back to its headquarters. It's a nice idea, Kent, but far too risky. You said yourself that things have a habit of going wrong. And if the Unity spotted you, we really would be in trouble. But, uh, no, uh, we are not sending up any ships until the whole fleet has been fitted out. Not only with deflectors, but with armaments as well. How's the work going, by the way? Well, it should be finished within a week. Well, there you are. After that, we can put a complete task force into space. It could go up, destroy any Unity ships in its way, and take over the station. The trouble is, of course, a plan like this might be disastrous for Bob Britton and his team. Yes, it might well be. But I think we shall be hearing from them fairly soon. Although we can't see anything going on out there, I'm ready to take a bet that the station's almost complete. Well... There must be some very clever camouflage. Yes, and behind that camouflage, Orbiter X is growing. We must give our chaps time to let us know when it's finished, and time for them to get aboard that chariot and cross to Orbiter 1. Then we'll pick them up as arranged, and after that we can get busy on Mr. Kramer. But what if we don't get the signal from Britain? 
You know, there are times when you depress me, Kent. All right, we'll give him another week. If we haven't heard from him by then, I shall have to seek permission to launch the attack. Well, chaps, what do you think of our space station now? It's more or less complete. Oh, I can't say I feel very happy about it, Bob. Neither can I. It's me a funny sort of feeling standing here quietly in the control room, right inside the rim of Orbiter X. It's a bit lonely, isn't it? Yes, I know. This is going to be quite an occasion when the job was completed. Yes, quite a victory day celebration with worldwide radio and television hookups and ships coming and going with VIPs. Yeah, those that could stand the jump. <laughs> That's true <laughs> enough. Uh, think of the headlines. The completion of Orbiter X. Man's first step to the stars. The Commonwealth Space Station opens its airlocks to the astronauts of the world. I don't think. Uh, still, I suppose we mustn't be depressed. Our boys aren't going to let the Unity people stay here. You can bet your life on that. Ah, uh, sure. Tell me, Bob, when are you going to switch on that pocket transmitter of yours and let the boys at home know that the station's all ready to be taken over? Well, all in good time, Mac. Hold on. Orbiter X Control, Britain speaking. Hello, Britain. This is Commander Gilvin. Yes, Gilvin. You'll be pleased to know that Dr. Kramer is interested in that little matter we discussed. We shall be moving very shortly. You know what to do? Yes, OK. Thank you. Well, what's that all about? Yes, what have you been talking to Gelbin about, Bob? Oh, don't worry. It simply means that the time has come for us to get out of here. You've got a chariot standing by outside the station airlock, haven't you? Yeah, and I've worked out the navigation. Orbiter One's course is converging with ours right now. If we can get away on the chariot quickly, the crossing shouldn't be too bad. Ah, oh, that's fine. Uh, but what's this business you've got with Gelbin? I, I don't understand it. Ah, you will. Come on, let's step on the lift and make that daring little trip up the spoke to the central hub. Come on. Ah, here we go, then. Yeah. All aboard for the tunnel of love. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, I must say, this would be a riot at Blackpool. <laughs> you feel as if you're falling, don't you? Yeah, that's because the artificial gravity decreases as we move further away from the rim. When we arrive at the hub, we'll be weightless again. So switch on your magnet. OK. Right, chaps. Prepare to get into the airlock. Now, have you got everything you need? Uh, no, not quite, no. I hid the deflector set away with some stores here. Now, it must be somewhere around. Let's see. You got it? Ah, yes. Good. Now, you know what to do. You board the chariot and start collecting some of the debris left over from the assembly work. The unitists will think you're doing your normal job, but all the time you'll be moving further away. Then, when you think it's safe, you switch on the deflector and head out for Orbiter 1 as fast as you can. Yeah, but what about the signal getting back to Woomera? Ah, don't you worry. I'll see to that, all right. But you're talking as if you weren't coming with us. Well, as a matter of fact, chaps, I'm not. What? Are you serious, Bob? Absolutely. You see, I've got... Listen. Kramer and Gelbin are coming up on the other lift. Now, I've got to talk fast. I must get my transmitter onto their ship. When I do, it'll act as another beacon. And Woomera should be able to locate Unity headquarters at last. Yeah, but how the dickens are you going to get it aboard the ship? At any moment, Kramer and Gelbin will be leaving for their headquarters. They are. They're going right now. And believe it or not, Mac, they've agreed to take me with them. That ends the 12th episode of Orbiter X, an adventure in the conquest of space by B.D. Chapman. It was produced for the BBC by Charles Maxwell. step into the incredible, amazing future as we go exploring tomorrow.
And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr. There's the old saying, you'll do it and like it. And, uh, of course, a man can, by physical force, make you do it. Uh, how would you like to have it so that you wouldn't like it, too? There are two basic ways that you can be happy in this world. One, of course, is to have everything you want in just the way you want it and never have any difficulties or troubles. This method is uh, ideal, perhaps, but not very probable. Only one person in the world could have that, I guess. The other method uh, for absolute, complete happiness would be to like anything that you got no matter what it was. The first approach is the one that makes sense, of course. That's the one we work for. We earn it. The other seems so much easier. Stop barking! Stop barking! Stop barking! Oh, uh, barking. Oh, no, 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 that, that's all right, doggy. You bark as much as you want. <laughs> oh, how I wish I could get mad. In the old days, I'd have gone up that dog and told him to shut up, and that'd have been that, but no more. Just as soon as I start to get good and sore about something, my mind kind of all creams up in the happiness effect, and I'm not sore anymore. And everybody here in Baton, I guess most everybody in the country is just like me. We've all had our brains written on, and we're all happy. Here I am, chief of police of Baton, and never a crime to speak of, unless it's overtime air parking, and what kind of crime you call that. Henry, Henry! Oh, here he comes. Our own Doc Royd, the man responsible for all our happiness. He's supposed to be just about the best brain rider this side of the Mississippi. Henry, Henry! Slavo, that's what I call him. Old wet lips always do good and always grinning. But behind that grin, believe me, ice. If you need an enemy, just have Doc Royden for a friend. Henry, Henry, didn't you hear me calling to you? Oh, sorry, Doc. I guess I just kind of stand here thinking. Uh, happy thoughts, I hope. Oh, sure, happy thoughts, sure, sure. Uh, what can I do for you, Doc? Uh, a fellow just came into town, suspicious, uh, painting pictures out at Willow Hollow. There's law against painting pictures at Willow Hollow? Now, Henry, you know I got to keep my eyes on things. Wasn't for us brain matters, there'd be all kinds of irresponsibles roaming around. And these artists, they're the worst kind, you know that. You remember there was a day when you were headed for that kind of trouble? Yeah, I remember. I was a pretty good baritone, too. You sure brain wrote me out of that notion. And aren't you better for it? You're a responsible citizen, happily married, well-adjusted, doing a job that's socially useful. Yeah. What about this fellow I'm supposed to investigate? The name of Arnold Vivian. And he's been painting up at Willow Hollow? That's right. Doesn't do anything all day long but paint. Single? No wife, no children, no nothing. He just paints. Well, remember, as long as he just paints, that's legal. Now, Henry. Now, don't Henry me, Doc. I'll look into it. That's all I can promise. Right. That's all I ask. Goodbye, Henry. Yeah, that's mighty pretty landscape you're painting. Why, thank you. <laughs> Willow Hollow makes a mighty pretty landscape to paint. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's all right. I never mind a little talk when I'm painting. What uh, can I do for you? Your name Arnold Vivian? That's right. I'm Henry Horner, Chief of Police. Nice to meet you. Chief of... What, uh, what seems to be the trouble? No, no trouble. i just out here to give you a kind of friendly warning. About what? Now, this town of Benton you're in needs new young men, Arnold. If you should happen to get in any trouble here, we got a real fast brain rider who likes to straighten people out. I don't get into trouble. Well, just keep in mind, we need workers these days. Like our brain rider would say, who needs pictures on canvas? Who needs pictures on canvas? Why, Mr. Policeman, me. Maybe someday a few others will agree with me. Well, maybe. I used to be a sort of artistic fellow myself. Baritone uh, concert style. Yeah, I'll bet you're good on a police whistle, too. Don't worry about me, Mr. Horner. Just go back and tell your brain writer, here's one traveling man he won't ever get to use his scalpel on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Every Saturday night, Benton has a dance. I usually don't want to hear it myself because since the rain writing, everybody's pretty well adjusted and ain't any police-type trouble. This Saturday night, though, I dropped in toward the middle of the evening. Hi, Mr. Horner. Hi, hello, Arnold. Having a good time? Heck yes. I've been dancing with all the girls. They love me and I love them. Staying out of trouble? The only trouble I ever have is with pictures on canvas. Well, don't go getting drunk and sign a job contract with Big Fellum at the Brickyard or with Tom Hart or you'll forget pictures. I'm immune to job contracts. Also, it may interest you to know that both Mr. Hart and Mr. Fellum each bought a painting for me tonight, paid cash on the barrel head. Well, that's a surprise. Well, I wonder what they're up to. Why should they be up to anything? They just like my pictures. <laughs> I guess they like me, too. They invited me to play poker with them after the dance tonight. You turned them down, of course. Heck no. I like taking money from people at poker. Well, they're more likely to do the taking. And once you're broke, you'll just have to go to work. Mr. Horner, when are you going to stop worrying about me? I told you, I can take care of myself. <laughs> And he could, too. When the poker game broke up about 3 a.m., he was the winner. Everybody was griping, all except Doc Royden, who sat there, his close-set eyes glittering behind thick spectacles. Imagine him taking me for 30 bucks. Imagine. You know, he knows people, he knows cars, he knows women. You're not gonna brain right that boy. You wanna bet, Henry? You just wanna make a little bet. <laughs> Whether it's a crowded highway or a narrow street, a smooth, even flow of traffic is one of the essentials of safe driving. Speeding is an obvious hazard, but it can also be suicide. Slowpoke driving is dangerous too, because it causes rear-end collisions and tempts other motorists into taking deadly chances in passing. The eccentric behavior of the lane switcher, the driver who weaves in and out, often is the cause behind frightful smash-ups. So don't be a cause, and don't be a victim. Arrive alive. There are two difficulties with the happiness idea. One of them is that actually we need to earn happiness to enjoy it, but we don't really want to work for it. The drug addict has happiness uh, that he doesn't have to work for, really. The other difficulty is uh, happiness in whose terms? Many times, you know, the other fellow figures that you ought to be happy with what he's giving you. Uh, uh, that's right. Henry, wake up and scoot over to Tony Holland's shack on the edge of the holler. What's the matter, Doc? There's been a crime. Get over here as fast as you can. Somebody's got to keep an eye on our citizens at the police force. Now, now wait a minute. Well, it's a good thing I was out this way. Where's Tony? I gave him a sleep injection. The poor fellow, he was bashed on the head and all his savings were stolen. Three hundred and two dollars. Well, can't you wake him up so he can tell me himself? No need. I got all the information you want. Who does he think did it? He doesn't know, but I've got a good idea. Yeah, like who? Well, let's eliminate it. Couldn't have been a passing tramp. Since brainwriting, there aren't any. And if you can't say it was anyone in town... They're all adjusted and wouldn't commit no crimes. So? Might be somebody around who wanders in the hollow in the daytime, poking around and pretending to be what he ain't. Well, it wasn't Arnold Vivian. How do you know? Because he's not that stupid. He knows he'd be the most likely suspect. Maybe you'd just better check up on him, Henry. Doc, you're the brain writer. They call you in after the maladjusted guy's been caught, but I'm the cop. I run my investigations the way I want, and I'm not going to build a case against Arnold Vivian. What are you going to do? You write on brains. Try reading one. <laughs> So you figure Doc Royden's trying to frame me, huh? Looks that way. Well, that's ridiculous. I just took you people at poker for enough money to live for three weeks. Why should I take a chance on getting my head written on? Have you missed any of your stuff? Oh, just my pen and pencil set that I lost jumping around at the dance last night. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That'd make a fine clue, wouldn't it, at the scene of the crime? It sure would. Well, was it found over there? Not yet, but it will be. That's not important, though. What is important is this. Tony Holland has one peculiarity, marks $20 bills. Figures he can follow how the money goes around town that way. 
Now, you don't draw any money from the local bank or in salary, so you'd just better not have any local $20 bills marked by Tony. Hey, whose side are you on? I used to sing baritone, remember? <laughs> Police, I like you. Artist, I kind of like you, too. Henry, look what we found at Tony's. Look here. Yeah, I know. You found a clue, a pen or a pencil or both. We know all about it, Doc. Arnold, I better run you in, at least until we can investigate further. It'll look better. Why, certainly. No trouble at all, Mr. Horner. Glad to come along. I pressed for a hearing right away, figuring that Arnold could be cleared and then leave town. He figured the same, that it wasn't healthy to hang around a place that needed new talent so bad. The hearing went real fine. From the start, I testified that Arnold had been fast asleep at the time the crime was committed, and I swore that the pen and pencil had been planted in Tony's house. Then suddenly they were talking about Mark $20 bills. Well, I couldn't I couldn't possibly have any 20s, Judge. I just told you, I, I, there's absolutely no way that I could have... Unless... Uh, no. No. Let me out of here! Let me out of here! It's a frame-up! It's a frame-up, I tell you! It's... There is no tool that is either good or evil. There's nothing that in itself is good or bad. It's the way it's used. Logic is a wonderful thing, of great value to man and his progress. But in this uh, trial here... You've seen what can be done with logic when someone is out to prove what he wants to prove and is not in the slightest interested in getting the truth. Just one thing I want to say. I've seen a lot of raw deals, but the way you have it here with the singing cop to set it up is the slickest I ever saw. You win. <laughs> As chief of police, I had to be present at the brain writing. Doc's nurse gave Arnold the needle jab in the back of the neck, and after that, he sat there like a stone man, able to hear, but paralyzed. Now, now, Henry, there we are. Yes, yes, the clay model is ready to take the impressions from Arnold's brain, so we'll have an exact duplicate. Now we put this cap on Arnold's head, so the electronic fingers in it can do the measuring. That's a good boy. It won't take long now. Attach these wires to the automatic computer that we put above the clay model. And there we are. An exact model of Arnold's brain. All right, let's take a look. Oh, me. Oh, my. There's a brain that needs writing. All right, all right, all right. Look here, you see that? Decayed memory spots. Artistic imagination, decayed sensory impressions, quite useless in an adjusted society. Now, we just take the scalpel and start doing away with these six synapses in the brain model, substituting good ones. Isn't that what we do, Henry? Yeah, that's what we do, all right. You erase the bad ones and carve some good ones, and then when his own brain gets the impression, the guy's adjusted from then on. Everybody does what they should, and they don't need no religion, no morals, no psychology, nothing. Just brain ripening, and the world's work gets done. Now, Henry, you always miss the most important part. After I get rid of the illogical synapses, I do one special cut with my stylus. There, there, I'm doing it now. And that's the happiness effect. Then your adjusted man not only does what he ought to, he's happy about it. <laughs> There we are. Oh, that looks beautiful. Oh, that looks almost like the master brain. Let me get it and show it to you, Henry. It's real interesting. I'll be back in a second. You know, Arnold, I sure wish I could help you. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I came. I'm going to try to put back some of those synopses he cut out. Here's a scalpel. Yeah, well, there's one he did. There's another. Maybe I can help you keep some of your artistic talent, Arnold. Yeah, here's a final one. That one day, 
Henry will be able to duplicate this master brain in everyone. It's brilliant. Take a look at it while I prepare for the transference from the clay model to Arnold's brain. It sure is fine looking, this master brain. Yes, yes, yes. Now we're ready to go. Now, Henry, Henry, when I close this switch, the new brain shape will flash the signal to the cap on Arnold's head. The electronic fingers will dig in, and he'll have a new brain. Oh, I tell you, Henry, this is the real moment of birth. Most people are born wrong for this world. This is where they get right. All right, here we go. It's going to hurt a little. <laughs> well, Henry, we did it. We created a useful citizen. <laughs> so six months went by and it looked as if Doc was right. Arnold took a job, settled down, got himself married, and then... Henry, Henry, have you seen that picture exhibition up at the town hall? Picture exhibition? No, Doc. What's it about? Arnold, Vivian, the sneak. Pictures of me holding me up to ridicule. I'll be the laughing stock of this town. You've got to stop it. Well, there's nothing illegal about pictures, Doc, but come on, let's take a look. <laughs> We went to the town hall, and there was the neatest collection of pictures you ever saw. Arnold dated Doc Royden more than 50 times, and in each picture he cut the basic evil of the man. Doc was shown at the council meeting, at church, at the dance, his face revealing every grimace of deceit, power, lust, conniving. Every picture was titled The Happiness Effect, and every one was marked sold already. I knew then and there that Doc Royden was finished in battle. Henry, please, I'm too old to start over in another town. I've got to stay in Benton. Please, Henry, get rid of those pictures. Why, Doc, it sounds to me like you're maladjusted to your environment. You ought to be brain-ridden. to the happy. <laughs> Henry! Henry! Henry, man, I've been looking all over for you. I wanted to tell you thanks for using Doc's scalpel to save a piece of my talent. Why, it was a pleasure, Arnold. Thanks to you for giving us back a little human dignity. A lot of people tend to think that happiness is something you have. But I think it isn't. I think it's more in the nature of something you do. You know, the founders of our country were no fools. And in the Declaration of Independence, they said that men had certain inalienable rights, among which were the pursuit of happiness. No man has ever declared that happiness itself is a right of man. The pursuit of happiness is. It's worth working for. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight were Mason Adams, Charlie Holmes, and Lawson Zerby. Script was taken from a story by Raymond Banks. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Bill Maher speaking. We pause now for station identification. Look, Colonel Schlag, I understand the need for some secrecy. But for more than three weeks, an astronaut has been missing. I'm tired of all the official double talk. Now, either I get a straight story, or I'll go on the air tonight with everything I know. Once again, Colonel Schlag, what has happened to astronaut Ted Shaw? Theater 5 presents Odyssey of Number 14. This 
This is your radio correspondent, Ray Boudreau. I'm with a press corps assembled here on Cocoa Beach. Looking north, I can see the gantry row of Cape Kennedy. We've been barred by military order from the Pad 14 press site, barred from the Cape itself. The shroud of complete secrecy has been dropped over this launch. The gantry is pulling back. I can see a capsule sitting atop the stack. The capsule is similar in shape and size of those that have been used in previous manned orbital space flights. The rocket has stopped launching. That happened 17 days ago. Our space agency continues to refuse to answer any questions. Our correspondents checked each astronaut and found one missing. Astronaut Ted Shaw, the old man of the group. At the agency, our questions met a brick wall. Major Shaw is away on a secret mission and will return in two weeks. Last Saturday night, a Cape technician told us that when the capsule was launched, Major Ted Shaw was aboard. It was an eyewitness report. The Monday morning meeting of our news chiefs. The story was stamped top priority. Orders would try to get an angle from Shaw's wife. But Mrs. Roberta Bobby Shaw was away from her Houston home. The neighbors reported that Bobby Shaw was on a vacation. But actual whereabouts, unknown. Then I had a call from our permanent Cape correspondent. Hello? Oh, Frank, yeah. What? She's been down on Cocoa Beach all this time? Well, that supports the story that he was aboard the capsule. Yes, yes, I know her. Keep a tight watch in that house. I'll be down on the next plane. This morning, I stationed myself in the dunes just south of the beach house. At two minutes to five, Bobby Shaw left the house and walked along the water's edge toward me. I let her pass and then walked up behind her. Bobby. Bobby Shaw. Uh, Why, Ray Boudreau. Bobby. What are you doing here? Bobby, tell me where's Ted. I don't know, Ray. You'll have to get the story from the agency. How long since you've seen him? Twenty-four days. You don't know where he is? Honestly, Ray, I don't. It's all hush-hush. What are you doing in this place? (laughs) Ted thought that there might be a lot of reporters buzzing around. So... To avoid the questions, he sent me here. Are you under any special security instructions? No, but then I don't know anything. Only that he's on a secret mission. But you haven't seen him for 24 days. Aren't you worried? I wasn't at first. But last week I began to worry when he didn't remember our day of beginning. Your what? Day of beginning. It's something very special to us. Ray, did you know that when Ted came back from Korea, he couldn't walk? No. No. No, I didn't. I guess it's something he'd rather keep out of the biography. Well, I was his physiotherapist at Walter Reed. That's where we met. Ted had been in this crash, and I'd exercise him trying to get him to walk. He was a quiet one. You know how quiet he can be. Yes. But he'd talk to me all about Korea, the missions there, a lot about the men under him who were hurt or killed. He never said so, but I knew he blamed himself for anything that went wrong. And then one day, after one of those talks, he took his first step. And it was then he said he was going to marry me. He called it the day of the beginning. Every year since then, he sent me some remembrance of it, a gold charm, something. But last week, for the first time, nothing. He would have made some arrangement for it if he didn't expect to be back. And then... Two days ago, this terrible letter came. I've been carrying it around with me ever since. I've been unfaithful. Divorce me. Is this his handwriting? I'm not sure. Now, Bobby. Do you think he was in that capsule 17 days ago? Yes. Why? He called me about 3 o'clock that morning. He said he wanted me to be on the beach at 7 o'clock. So when I saw the shot, I knew it was his. Bobby, you must have done some guessing. What do you think was Ted's mission? The only thing that's come to my mind is that it has something to do with the Pliskin muck. 
Ted and I discussed it, even joked about it. That was until the Project X secrecy. Then Ted stopped talking about it, and I got... Pliskin muffler, Pliskin Pliskin radiation field, is an electromagnetic field that is located and concentrated over the northern regions of the Soviet Union. It was nicknamed after its discoverer, the Russian scientist, Dr. I.K. Pliskin. I knew of its existence because I attended an international scientific conference in Stockholm last year and interviewed Dr. Pliskin after he defected to the West. In fact, we recorded a tape interview. Bobby, that, uh, that letter from Ted, where was it postmarked? Houston. Bobby, there's an explanation for it. And I think the explanation is in Houston. I'm going there this morning, and I think you should be on the flight with me. Yes. Yes, I want to come. Before I left Florida, I called my news desk in New York and told them what I had learned on Cocoa Beach. Also, I asked them to fly the Pliskin tape to me in Houston. When Bobby and I arrived, I didn't want her to go to her home. I didn't want her to talk to anyone, at least for the rest of the day. So she agreed to register in a Houston motel under a fictitious name. I picked the Pliskin tape off the New York flight and then called Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Schlag, the Space Agency Chief of Astronautical Operations. Colonel Schlag speaking. Colonel, this is Ray Boudreau. Oh, yes, Boudreau. Colonel, where is Major Ted Shaw? Astronaut Shaw is on a secret mission. He'll be involved with it for the next several weeks. Now, that's all I can tell you, so... Colonel Schlag, I have an eyewitness report that puts Ted Shaw aboard the capsule that was launched 17 days ago. I also have a recording of Roberta Shaw, who was a very worried girl because of a letter she received from him two days ago. A letter to Shaw's wife? I thought she was on vacation. No longer. She's with me. A letter? Then, Colonel, I have a tape of a Dr. I.K. Pliskin... What does he have to do with this? A great deal. I'd like to come in and play this tape for you. I don't think that's necessary. All right, Colonel. But I'm going on the air tonight with everything I've got, including the Pliskin tape. But first, I'd like to talk to you about the implications of such a broadcast. All right. Come in if you like. I'll see you at 3.30. Goodbye. Three hours later, I played the tape I'd made last spring of Dr. I.K. Pliskin for Colonel Schlag. Here is that tape. Dr. Pliskin, we have rumors that a Russian cosmonaut has been lost in space. Is this true? Yes. The orbital paths of Russian flights were different from yours. One Russian flight went through a radiation field of such a destructive nature that the cosmonaut was unable to return to Earth. Oh, what happened to I can tell you no more now. I must talk to your agency officials first. I understand they are planning flights through my radiation field. It is very dangerous there, and they must be warned. Well, that's the tape, Colonel Schlag. First, let me say, Mr. Boudreau, that I've been authorized to answer all of your questions. But let me also emphasize that this is classified a secret... We expect you to keep it so. Now, that's a cute way of gagging me. Then Major Ted Shaw was in that capsule. Yes. Did the Pliskin muck hurt him? Yes. How? Seventeen days ago, after having been exposed to the strange effects of the Pliskin radiation field, astronaut Ted Shaw... Well, to put it in non-technical language, he went insane. This is your correspondent, Ray Boudreau. A few minutes ago, here at the Space Agency in Houston, Colonel Thomas Schlag revealed to me that 17 days ago, astronaut Ted Shaw was launched into space. His mission? To test the effect of the Pliskin radiation field. According to Colonel Schlag, this mission caused astronaut Shaw to go insane. At this point, Colonel Schlag changed the course of our conversation. He asked about the letter received two days ago by Major Shaw's wife and signed by the Major. Do you have that letter with you? Hmm. Here. 
Not a very good facsimile of his handwriting, is it? Hmm. Miss Lerner, please get to Colonel Jackson. Have him come to my office as soon as possible. Now, Mr. Boudreau, it's my turn to play a tape for you. It's a recording of Major Shaw while he was in orbit. At the time of this recording, Ted was in communication with our ground station at Varkos, Finland, and was some 12 minutes away from the Pliskin Muck. This is Odyssey 14. Ted, have you switched to automatic mode yet? Say again. Odyssey 14. Go to auto mode now. Okay, switching now. Lock. 14. Read you on auto mode. Good. We have loss of signal in approximately one minute. At this point, he was some 11 minutes away from the Pliskin Muck. Here are Ted's last words received at Varkos, Finland. You're cutting out. Say again. Losing signal here. We will pick you up on the other side. After you go through it. Good luck, 14. Good luck. I don't need luck. Everything's fine here. But what does the Pliskin Muck do to a man? Come in. Oh, hello, Colonel. Howdy. Mr. Bedreau, this is Colonel Jackson, who is the chief surgeon of the Odyssey mission. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Why don't you ask the colonel that question? Very well. What effect does the Pliskin radiation have on an astronaut? Well, after they've had a taste of it, or perhaps I should say the sound of it, they just don't want to come down. I don't understand. Well, the simplest way I could describe it would be as an acute case of audio hypnosis. You see, when the capsule entered the Pliskin field, the radiation there created a sound phenomenon within the capsule. For lack of a better term, we label it space singing. Once a man is exposed to this space singing, he evidently goes into a deep hypnotic state and will do anything to stay in it. The siren song of space. Is that it? Well, the Russian cosmonaut wanted to stay in that world so desperately that he sabotaged all efforts to bring him down. The purpose of our mission was to send the kind of man who, by our most scientific judgment, was able to resist the field's hypnotic attraction. We thought the cosmonaut's breakdown might be an individual personal thing. We gave all the astronauts a battery of psychological tests, and Shaw measured strongest in resisting hypnotic influence. Yes. He certainly believed he could do better than any Russian cosmonaut. After talking with Dr. Pliskin, he was so convinced that it wouldn't happen to him that I must confess he had me believing him. So what happened? I'll play you the tape made after Major Shaw had gone through the Pliskin muck. We were in communication with the capsule through our tracking station on Okashiri Island, Japan. Odyssey 14. How do you read? Odyssey 14. Four corners to my bed. Four angels round my head. One to watch. One to pray. And two... (laughs) Two to bear my soul away. Fourteen. I'll count down retro sequence fire. Three, two, one, zero. We read number one fired. For every evil under the sun. Number two fired. There is a remedy or there is none. Number three fired. If there be one, try and find it. If there be none, never mind it. Fourteen. We show that you have armed the escape hatch. Old woman, said I, wither so high to sweep the cobwebs off the sky and I'll be with you by and by. Fourteen, we show that you have blown the hatch. Come when you're called, do what you're bid. Shut the door after you and never be chid. And may we light the clock, keep a face clean and bright with hands ever ready do what is right. Phew. Why, if I understand the tape, he made it impossible for you to bring him down. Yes. Put the capsule into a position that would have made it skip back into space when it hit the atmosphere. And did he have control? No. 
He didn't know it, but we'd rigged it so that once he went automatic before his entry into the Pliskin muck, all control belonged to us on the ground, and he could never again take it back again. Then he couldn't blow the hatch. That's right. Each button he pushed gave us a readout in our control. That had no effect on the capsule. Then you got him down all right? Yes. He gave us quite a fight, but we got him down. But where has he been these last two weeks? In our hospital here in Houston. He's been in a state of complete withdrawal. He does not speak, nor does he respond to any communication. Oh, that explains the note to his wife. What he really meant was being unfaithful to his own strict code of conduct. Yes. For a man like Shaw, it's a shattering experience to think he's failed. Well, then, what's our next step? I think it's time we brought Mrs. Shaw into it. I called Bobby Shaw at the motel and asked her to meet us in the observation room of the hospital. There, she was completely briefed. Colonel Schlag even played the tapes for her. When it was done, Bobby Shaw had only one thought. I want to see my husband. Just go through that door. We shall observe you through this one-way glass window. Colonel Jackson pulled back the curtain. And we could see astronaut Ted Shaw sitting in a chair, staring into empty space. Colonel Jackson turned on the room's microphone. Ted? When she spoke, I thought I saw him flinch slightly. But it did not alter his dazed condition. Ted, when you came back from Korea, I helped teach you how to walk. Now, now we have to work on the speech. So, let's start the therapy. Remember the last time we kept count during the coordination exercises by saying nursery rhymes? All right. This time, I'm going to say them. And I want you to move your mouth. Let's start. The man in the moon came down too soon. She Not worked with him with firmness, Make patience, words. with you love. Are. She kept Adam to move the his mouth and in time to make some grunting noise in tempo with the verse. Ted. Finally, now, after more than an hour of work. Sound in time with the words. If there is a remedy or there is none, if there be one, try and find it. Now, Ted, say the last line yourself. If there be none. Ted, say it. If there be one, try and find it. If there be none. M never mind it. Good. Good, Ted. She did it. Yes, she did it. She brought him back. You're going to be all right, Ted. You're home again. You're home. Presented Odyssey of Number 14, written by Bruce Bassett and directed by Harry Nelson. In the cast, John Thomas, Lenka Peterson, Lon Clark, Cliff Carpenter, and Jay Barney. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Thank you.